auf Strasbourg, ja? Strasbourg. Ja, Strasbourg, ja. Ja, das ist das Traveling. Oh, correct. Ich hatte eine wirklich enjoyable Zeit mit der UN. Aber wir versuchen uns zurück nach Hause zu bevor die Feuer uns finish us off. Ja, es ist terrible. Ja, es ist terrible, was wir sehen. Ja, es ist wirklich bad. Ein honorable Montreux, der muss sein Feuer-Department in place. Ja, true, true. Yeah. No, see you. Mamuka Kaza? Mamuka Kaza? Manyamza? Any apologies? Morning, Che. Morning, Che. Good morning. Unja, Nisha. Siapi Ilanoga Kondo, Unja, and good? Siapi Ilanoga Kondo. Che, good morning, members uh, from my side, Che. I've got the apology from Uche, uh, Ms. Isaacs, where ARC is attending professional commitments. So who vice chairperson, who Dr. Mashaba will be the one who's going to lead the delegation today. And then Chair, another apology from a minister, a minister together with Minister Nwesi are leading the negotiations with Transnet workers, the representatives today. So she will not be able to attend the meeting. Another apology is from the chairperson of the OPP, Umis Kinosi, requesting that she, she be excused at 12 to attend an urgent matter, but she, she also requested that she be, OPP should um, present first so that she can be able to interact before she leaves at, 10, at 12. Another one Chair, is from Tadutabe Kulu. Kulu is attending PC on public service and administration. Uma Muchwete mm -hmm. is having doctor's appointment at 12, so she will leave the meeting at half past 11 and rejoin it later again. Uta Tukuruka mm -hmm. is attending PC on small business, and Mamu Mashat is attending PC on higher education. That's all from my side. Thank you, Chair. All right. Manyamza. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members, and good morning, good morning. colleagues. <laughs> The apology that I have, apart from Albertina's, is from the minister's office. The minister is accompanying Minister Nwesi to negotiations for, with uh, public service workers, transnet workers check. Thank you. Okay. And the deputy minister is in attendance? Uti M Kapache is on, on the platform. Perfect. Moloed Mam Kapa. Okay, maybe not yet. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, honorable members. Moloedi, Koyamore. Let me take this opportunity to greet uh, all uh, in the ministry, the deputy minister, as well as uh, the uh, DG and the officials of the department with uh, the leadership of all the entities uh, that uh, will appear before us today. Uh, honorable members, I greet you Recording with in the progress. greetings of peace and welcome you to this morning session of our Portfolio Committee on Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. We have been engaging with the annual reports of uh, the department, as well as that uh, of uh, the commissioner yesterday. And uh, today we will be proceeding with the uh, other respective entities. This is an important, and critical role for us as parliamentarians, as it's an extension of our policy and oversight function and responsibility. In addition, annual reports serve two primary purposes. First, they help to generate ideas and take investment actions. And second, they help identify red flags and early signs of trouble when everything seems to be going well. To summarize annual reports, 
acts like an anchor, an anchor to investment decisions and shareholder interests. It is therefore, honorable members, critical for the portfolio committee to have the confidence that the department has thoroughly and adequately engaged with these annual reports and presentations from its entities and hence enhance the quality and input and engagement. I have honorable members on a previous occasion spoken about the value of the ARC and the valuable role of research to further grow and develop development of our agricultural sector. I have also reflected on the world-class products and services that the under biological products being OBP are renowned for and the importance of protecting the valuable resources for our country, region, and the continent. I wanted honorable members to briefly reflect on the importance of marketing of our sector and its value in attaining the goals outlined in the NDP, as well as by the president, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, the sonar of 2022, his remarks on the immense potential of the agricultural sector and its role in stimulating rural development. Honorable members, South Africa's agricultural food and beverages exports for 2021 at a record of uh, 12.4 billion US dollars. The top exportable products include wine, maize, citrus, nuts, berries, grapes, wool, fruit juice, and apples and pears. Food drives the world apart from clean water. Access to adequate food is the primary concern for most people on the planet Earth. This makes agriculture one of the largest and most significant industries in the world. Agricultural productivity is important not only for a country's balance of trade, but the security and health of its population as well. It therefore goes without saying, honorable members, that much greater attention needs to be given to further enhancing South Africa's agricultural marketing capacity in order to grow our share of the agricultural output. We only need to consider that agriculture employs over 60% of the African workforce and accounts for roughly a third of the continent's GDP. But Africa is the most food insecure region in the world with more than 232 million undernourished people or approximately one in four. This tells us that there is a huge potential for expansion of the agricultural sector and export of our available produce. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, and the leadership of all the entities, I invite you today to listen to and engage with the annual reports before us in this morning session, as well as our afternoon session which a uh, special focus on the National Agricultural Marketing Council, that being NEMEC and the wonderful work that they do to place our agricultural sector on the map. Allow me therefore, honorable members, without any further delay, to invite the OBP to present their annual report. I thank you. Good morning, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members um, and colleagues. Um, Chair, if I can just uh, ask them to flight our presentation, please. We have the uh, presentation uh, brought up onto the screens.
Banyamza. Mabukakaza. Can we assist? Can we assist with flighting the presentation? The rights have been given to Mr. Sent Van der Sent Chair from OPP. Okay, Mr. Van der Sent. Thank you. Are you able to share the presentation? Menier Fandesant, are you able to share the presentation? We're waiting to get started. Thank you, sir. I beg your indulgence just for a couple of, of seconds more. I'll be with you shortly. Thank you. Chair, would it be in order if I if I just gave my highlights and and management uh, will then present once the presentation is up? Please go ahead, Makinosi. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Chair, uh, the 2021-22 um, financial statements of of um, the OBP, I think firstly, I'd like to thank my, my man, the minister um, and, and the department for their support and, and our management team. Our management team. Sorry, it's echoing now. It's echoing now. Having, having, worked team on, on. having worked on. Sorry, there's feedback Sorry, and I'm feedback sure. and I'm not sure why. why. <laughs> Can we ask can everyone, we ask to, everyone mute your to mute your microphone? Because I can hear the echo, echo, echo even, on my, even on my side. Yeah, I'm, I'm alone. Yeah, I'm, I'm alone. I'm not sure, chair, sure, chair, where it's coming. Chair, where it's coming. Can I proceed? Can I proceed? Yes, please proceed. Yes, please proceed. Sure. Um, chair, sure. Um, chair in... Um, um, are your mics on? Are your mics on? No, Chairperson, I can confirm that we, we are on mute. Okay, thank you, because I'm on my own. Because I'm on my own. But it's echoing, so it's I'm not echoing, sure. So I'm not sure what all right, Chair. Um, well, our net, um, our net after the year after 170 million, 170 million, and nine million in the prior year, million in the prior year. Um, in term, um, our, in term, I'd our, like to put the second and like to put the second and fourth together. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Chair. No need for a point no of need order, for a point of Bama. order, Mamba um, Bama. The um, IT, the, uh, IT uh, sector, please, sector assist us, please assist us as an OCO. As an OCO. Uh, we are uh, unable, we are to, follow unable to follow the proceedings. proceedings. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Manyamza. 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 Can we get uh, can someone we get, from uh, IT someone to, from assist IT to assist us with this echo? With this echo? Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. There are members, there are on, the members on the platform who are, who are not unmuted. Not so unmuted. I will unmute, so unmute, unmute myself, unmute. Chair. Myself, chair. Please get, uh, please get, uh, uh, 
the IT to the meet IT everyone, to meet on, everyone the system, on the system. And I'd appeal to and I'd everyone appeal that is on to the everyone that is on the to please mute your microphones. Please mute your microphones. Make no see you may proceed. Make no see, see you may proceed. Let's see what. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm, um, I'm, so I'm from 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 decrease uh, from decrease from 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 to 170 to 170 million sorry making us still picking, still up, the picking up the echo um, um perhaps can we get i can to get i look into to this look into this Um, Kakas, um, Kakas, are we able to get our any able assistance? To get any assistance? Mom, Yama is attending. Yama is attending to it. Seems, seems. We have uh, we have uh, gone gone here on our side here on our I side. I don't think the echo is I there don't think anymore. The echo is there anymore. Uh, it's still it's still uh, it's still echoing. it's still echoing. It's still echoing. It's still echoing. Okay. Let's okay. Uh, see. Let's uh, get assistance see from IT. Get assistance from IT. And please check if it's the same. Please check if it's the same. Exclusive level. All people's problem. Perhaps take another. We can perhaps take uh, another presentation. Uh, presentation before the OBP. Before the OBP. Is it uh, fixed? Are we sorted? No echo, chair. So I think no we'll echo. It should be. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Mekinosi, you may proceed. You seem to have won the fight. <laughs> Thanks very much, chair. Um, if if I can just then uh, start with our exec summary. Um, Chair, our net revenues uh, for 2022 has decreased uh, to 170 million compared to 209 million in the prior year. Of course, that can be accredited to the OBP challenges in the last financial year, the unavailability of stock due to the equipment breakdowns, etc. Um, our we had how only achieved 48 percent of our. Um, agreed upon targets um, compared to 50% in the prior year. However, one of the targets uh, we, we want to highlight is the issue of, of the development of farmers that had increased by um, almost 400%. Our target was 550 and we achieved 2,198 um, uh, uh, farmers trained during emerging farmers trained during that period. Um, we have um, uh, received, uh, received um, recertification of our ISO 9001, um, which again um, is, is of course important for the OBP and its operations. In terms of the Auditor General uh, Audited Annual Financial Statements, we have achieved an unqualified audit opinion with um, no emphasis of matter. Um, I must just highlight here that our findings were on 
on the performance information and not on the financial statements. So we had no findings on the financial statements itself. Of course, uh, the management letter would have identified findings that management is currently implementing. We had also achieved a 95% reduction in our irregular expenditure from 9.4 million to only 423,000 in the last financial year and no fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Um, in the period under review, there would have been um, board initiated um, investigations chair. The one in particular, of course, had led to, to some dismissals. Um, the board um, has mandated that management implements all the recommendations from that report. Um, we're currently in the CCMA on, on the CEO matter and um, all disciplinary action has um, been taken against all staff who were found to have transgressed um, our policies, processes and, and um, procedures in the, in the OBP in, in that particular investigation and um, our legal team uh, will work on the recoveries um, just as soon as the CCMA matters have been finalized. There have been some, um, it, it, it has been a, a decision that that would only happen at, at that point. Um, and in the meantime, we've also had to update our policies and procedures to ensure that our, um, the weaknesses identified from, from those investigations are, are not recurred in the future. With that, Chair, I'd like to hand over to the team to go through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. They can proceed. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, uh, Chair, I'm just going to take uh, the committee uh, and the honorable members quickly on the on on the on the slides that followed the presentation. Uh, we 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 presenting, Chair. I think uh, the, the next slide becomes. Uh, the next slide becomes the- You're taking the us through the presentation being who? Don't know who's presenting. My, my, my apologies, uh, Honorable Chair. My name is Luvuya Mabomo, the interim CEO of, uh, of OBP. I, I'm gonna take the, 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 the Honorable uh, Chair and the committee through the slides that follow. Uh, the next slide, Chair, it's, uh, it's just a structure of our presentation that you're gonna make. Uh, which starts with uh, with what OBP is all about. Uh, with, uh, as, as the honorable members know, uh, a, a state entity that manufactures vaccines. Uh, just on top line, uh, Chair, we manufacture 14 types of viral vaccines, uh, bacterial about 28, and uh, par parasitic vaccines about six, uh, uh, with the diagnostic agents as we do. Uh, our business model chair uh, is based on uh, on on the development of of, of, of produce uh, for biological solutions uh, we overlay on top of that uh, digital solutions for the animal health which is what we believe in uh, in, in, in the for, in, in, in the fourth generation uh, phase chair and uh, managing the distribution services we've got four strategic outcomes chair that we we have developed for ourselves financial growth, business processes, uh, focus on customer service, and uh, uh, ethical and developmental uh, leadership as an organization. Uh, five values that we believe in people first, uh, respect, integrity, dedication to our customers, and, uh, and excellence. Uh, that organization is supported by. Uh, uh, men and and women, 212 of them. Uh, uh, the, the, we, we demonstrate the, the, the nature of our workforce. Chair. Our governance uh, structure chair is made up of a board with four committees, audit, risk, and IT committee, remuneration and social and ethics uh, committee, research and development, and operations sales and uh, committee chair. 
that just gives a picture chair of, of the teams. Uh, Uh, that, that, that runs this organization at the executive level. Just some highlights on performance share and around the strategic outcome of, of, of financial sustainability and, and growth. Uh, two of the, uh, as, the, as the chair of the, of the board had indicated that uh, we achieved, uh, we underachieved on the turnover that we had uh, budgeted by by 3.2 million being a function of the unavailability of the of the of, of products as a function of uh, of the breakdown in, in, in our equipment we've introduced uh, uh, overachieved on the number of pro of, of, of dossiers that we've submitted to the regulator at 36 uh, that regulates the registration of of of, of the vaccines that uh, that uh, that we produce We've increased our earnings before tax interest uh, chair by 86% uh, overachieved. And the sales uh, as a function of course of availability of product chair uh, in terms of vaccine doses uh, decreased by 31% to the target that, that we had set ourselves for. On improving business processes chair, uh, efficiencies uh, we've overachieved in that respect, the, the only area chair that uh, we've underperformed with respect, uh, there's actually uh, two areas that we underachieved. Uh, the first one being the, the GMP project uh, that uh, we're currently uh, in a litigation process uh, on. Uh, and secondly, the process is related to that, uh, to that project. Uh, and customer service chair, uh, customer satisfaction, uh, because of the unavailability of product, we didn't achieve 22% uh, 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 underachieved in respect to that. Uh, we've managed to maintain uh, the and honorable members, uh, our top 20 customers and overachieved with respect to that in, uh, in, in that area. And uh, as, the, uh, in, as the chair of the board had indicated in an overview chair that uh, with respect to development in particular, support to, to emerging farmers. Uh, we've trained uh, more than what we had uh, intended to, to, to do, Chair. On governance, uh, Chair, uh, because of the capacity of our, of our uh, support services, in particular human resource uh, uh, function, uh, we have not been in a position to uh, update all the policies that we had undertaken to do chair and uh, and we are now in the process of recatching on that uh, under achievement chair and we are confident that by the time we we will report on the third quarter performance will be in a much better position with respect to you know, to, to to that uh, spot the second uh, point uh, that uh, because of the capacity of course of our human resources that the implementation of our works Work, workplace skills uh, plan uh, what, what was underachieved. Just the highlights on, on, the, on the financial performance, uh, net revenue uh, uh, underachieved uh, in uh, 210, so 170 million instead of 209 uh, that we had uh, undertaken to do. Uh, there was a main decrease in, in, in the it's attributed uh, as we always indicate to the availability of of uh, of vaccines as a function of uh, of the breakdown in our equipment the next slide chair is just the breakdown of the income statement uh, uh, 173 on the top line and we managed to to ma make a profit share for the year of 5.3 million uh, overall chair. Uh, we present our balance sheet in the next slide. The next slide is the cash flow statement. Uh, the next slide chair, we just highlight what our risks are as a business. Uh, uh, and we've identified 10, uh, 10 top risks on the research and development output. Our intellectual property chair is constantly being under threat. Uh, with, uh, with with competitors uh, intending to 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 walk away with our with our with our intellectual property, 
uh, regulatory compliance, we think it's very critical to our business. Uh, execution of strategy, improving on our business processes. Uh, our business model chair has always, because of running a business, has always been an efficient business model. Uh, business continuity chair is, is very critical to this business because we're working on the basis of, uh, of, uh, of, of intellectual property that we, 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 we've developed over many years. Uh, reputation management is critical and a comprehensive uh, a, a human resource strategy chair because we're building skills, not only for ourselves, for, but for the country as a whole. Just some, some update chair, uh, to, the, to, the, to the honorable chair and the committee uh, with respect to GMP, which is a, a, a reportable item that we have spoken uh, to earlier on. Uh, uh, we have now uh, terminated the contract which was uh, uh, we was irregularly awarded to a principal consultant, and our our our, our lawyers are, are working on that. Uh, we've already sent uh, the lawyers requesting that uh, we settle the outstanding uh, uh, work uh, with respect to that. Uh, Chair, we've issued out a request for proposal for service provider that can be able to assist us with supporting us. On this on this project chair taking it forward because that's the decision we've taken and put it to, to the portfolio committee before uh, so we're in the process of 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 re re uh, fin finishing the the project we believe chair that uh, probably in 2025 2026 the project would have been finished and, and such plan recovery plans are are, are food chair just just in terms of our future chair uh, in accordance with the, the, the good uh, practices, uh, our environmental and social sustainability, the entity is collaborating with all its partners, Agricultural Research uh, Council in particular, uh, the, the, the university next door to us, Chair, so that we can be able uh, to, 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 to sustain ourselves. We, uh, there's an increase in the number of collaborations, Chair, because we are a research and science-based institution. So, Collaborations are very important for purposes of, of enhancing the access to our to our to our product chair. We've decided that e-commerce is the platform of tomorrow, and therefore we're working on projects to make sure that our e-platform e-platforms are, are actually and distribution network chair are actually reaching the, the client, which is the farmer. Uh, effective communication is a critical issue with, between internally within our organization and with our stakeholders. And of course, the, the, as a, at the center of all of that is enhancing uh, uh, good governance, risk management, and ensuring that the people, the people processes and technologies within the organization are properly aligned uh, for, for, for the success of this, of this organization. Uh, with, with those few quick slides, Chair, uh, I think the Chair for the opportunity, the Honorable Chair for the opportunity and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Honorable members of the committee for, for giving us the opportunity to present. Thank you, Chair. Magnosa, any further input? Thank you, Chair. Nothing further from me except to thank uh, the Honorable Chair and Honorable Members for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Magnosa and uh, the Interim CEO of OPP for the presentation and the input, Honorable Members. There's the presentation put uh, to the Portfolio Committee on Agricultural and Reform and Rural Development by the OPP. We'll now open up the session to questions of clarity or comments. Honorable Klappe. Good morning, Chair. Greetings to my colleagues and entities on the platform. 
for this one, please pass, Chair. I'm on the road. All right. Thank you, Honorable Tape, the Honorable Mamun Babama. Kageba. Mamun Babama. Chair. Yes, Honorable Tate Masipa. She's held up. She asked me to take the questions on her behalf. You may proceed. Okay. Chair, thanks very much. And uh, thank you to the CEO and the chairperson from OBP for the presentation. Chair, in terms of the Schedule 38, uh, according to the financial report, uh, this organization obviously states that food security and safety is met through the development, security, and availability of critical, um, um, sorry, the development, security, and availability of critical vaccines uh, reserves and the ability to manufacture, distribute, and sell vaccines. Uh, the question really, Chair, is that um, we have been there to, we were at uh, OBP to do uh, uh, oversight. Um, the question is, what is the capacity of producing vaccines at the moment since we left? Has there been a significant or notable changes to OPP and can they share with, with us uh, as to you know, the changes that has happened? What has been the impact of the ongoing strike, if it's still ongoing? I have uh, just received a notification that the, the, the OBP workers have been on strike, uh, if there uh, has been any uh, impact in that. Um, relations um, has been, um, relation with the animal sector remains strained, but measures have been put in place to enhance um, the same. This is uh, the statement uh, that I pick up on the report. Chair, the reality is that uh, we constantly received uh, concerns about the, the vaccines. Uh, I just want to hear from OBP in terms of uh, what are those measures that are in place to ensure that uh, the strained relationship is being taken care of. Um, on another point is that um, I really welcome the uh, point that uh, the um, Chair and the uh, CEO indicated about the GMP facility that um, the SIU has been asked to intervene to investigate all those matters. Chair, I just want to say well done, and I think uh, we shall wait for the report from the OPP in terms of that. Uh, Chair, I also had the opportunity to just go through the, the structure of the OBP. Uh, I note that they have got a CO, they've got a COO, legal and company secretary, BDO, uh, corporate services, CFO, and CSO, chief scientific, chief science of, officer. Uh, where does the HR lie? If uh, I can be just guided around where the HR, the human resource lie in this particular structure. The next uh, question, Chair, relates to the revenue. Uh, it is noted that uh, net revenue, uh, uh, call it, uh, moved from a total of 209 million uh, 2020 2021 Q4 to date to 170 million in 2021 2022 Q4 year to date. I just want some explanation around um, these dates of Q4 to Q4. Aren't we dealing with uh, the 2021-2022 year end? I just want uh, some clarity here in terms of this particular explanation because I'm not sure what uh, reporting are we talking about because the reporting that the CEO just done now, uh, it's reflected a different picture to what is uh, noted in the report. Um, the next uh, point, Chair, is um, is the inst institution on on track, obviously, to change the fall in performance or the downward trajectory, 
and if they can share with us in terms of um, uh, what are the trajectory looking like at the moment in terms of the financial performance uh, from the sales of vaccines. There is a point that is made that um, the OBP is looking at investing in research and development to develop new technologies uh, for solving animal health challenges. I'm just uh, worried, Chair, and I just want to pose this question. Is OBP not going to be duplicating what the um, ARC is doing at the moment in terms of the research and development? Or can they maybe just clarify as to you know, how, how are they going to differentiate themselves to the ARC in terms of this particular approach that they are looking at investing um, amount of money, which are the areas that the ARC is not doing that they're looking at filling those particular areas. Um, it's, um, uh, this is just a welcome note that you have managed to retain uh, the OBP ISO 901 and 2015 uh, accreditation, which is really welcomed. Chair, I received a letter on the 16th 2022 uh, which came from one of the horse farmer, uh, raising concern regarding the ability of uh, uh, OBP to produce vaccines. At the, in the letter, it is stated, uh, although you know OBP is producing these vaccines, but they are doing it at a, a slower rate and paying even more, more, more expensive. They were informed by wholesalers that they will not be releasing any more vaccines. And uh, obviously, the end of October is the D date for all the horses, um, the breeders to vaccinate their horses. Um, and uh, vaccinating after that will be very dangerous. Um, I just want to um, get feedback from the OPP with regards to this issue. Uh, how is it being addressed? Are the horse breeders being catered? Do we have enough vaccines to address this matter? Uh, the next point, Chair, uh, is um, in 2013-2014 period, uh, the Treasury injected about 492 uh, during the MTF 2013-2014 uh, 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 towards the GMP facility. Um, the question is how much of the 492 was spent and how much of this 492 that is uh, that was allocated um, can be really um, attributable to possible corruption and so forth? Um, what is uh, left of the 492 million uh, that was allocated to the project? If there were rollovers, um, uh, have there been rollovers or is there money that has been returned to treasury and how much is that? Uh, Chair, I noted that the entity indicate that the cash flow position has improved over the past five years due to cash injection by shareholder for the plant recapitalization. Um, I just want to know if this um, cash um, injection for for the planned recapitalization, are we talking of the 492 or which amount is this that they are talking about? Chair, uh, that's it from my side. Um, I must also just say we welcome the uh, clean audit, but however, we are not uh, quite satisfied with the uh, performance and uh, the entity not meeting the performance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Ntatema Sipa. The Honorable Ntatema Tiasa. Ntatema Tiasa. She was struggling to get on the platform earlier. Oh, I'm not sure if he's on. Okay, we'll move on. Honorable uh, Mahmoud Um, Thank you, Chair. Uh, and greetings to everyone that is in the meeting. Um, Chairperson, let me first welcome the presentation from OPP and also Chair 
commend the entity for obtaining um, uh, the unqualified opinion, audit opinion. Um, I would like to, I need a, mm -hmm. the OBP to, 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 to maybe share with us um, on their presentation, the, the, the training of staff has been reprioritized. Mm -hmm. How is this affecting the institution in terms of competency? And of course, um, Maybe chair, I'm 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 asking this because of course we are aware that there there, there was a strike, uh, maybe it's ongoing or not. Uh, I'm thinking chair if it's affecting them, is is part is is one of the the the, the matters that the, the workers are demanding or what? How is this affecting the institution in terms of competency? The second question, chair. Um, the, uh, the, the management appointed an independent quality surveyor to validate the GMP project piece, which is chair, uh, the actual uh, 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 amount, the outstanding payments, and the estimated completion fees of the project. Can the entity give detail, a detailed progress on this matter? Um, and lastly, Chair, is the issue of the former CEO. The former CEO has been dismissed, was dismissed in um, December 2021. And the entity is reporting to us that um, the matter is within with CCMA. Uh, what are the delays? What are the issues? Because Chair, there is a, a tendency of delaying uh, the consequence management uh, uh, systems, and which is costing the institutions, and which is a, a waste of taxpayers' money. Can the entity share with us that this matter has been with CCMA uh, for a couple of months now? What could be the delay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chwata. Uh, Honorable Dr. Uh, Montwedi. Madume. Madume. Eh, 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 I think First and foremost, it's important that we must appreciate uh, how OBP managed to handle the financial affairs of the entity. Uh, and we hope that this, they should be a good example to other entities and to the department as well, because uh, the department and other entities are dismally failing with regard to that aspect, which is a, a very important. The one issue that I want to raise, Chair, has been raised by Honorable Chwede uh, with regard to the issue of the CEO, uh, because OBP remains the only manufacturer of animal vaccines in the country. And uh, this uh, it's a mess now with instability at executive level. Uh, but I think Honorable uh, Chwede raised that issue of the CEO, where we should get a, a briefing as, with regard to what is actually the latest and how soon can that matter be a finalized check? My other question that I wanna take with the OBP is that uh, has there been any vaccine shortages in the country? Uh, and how have, they, how have they actually managed to deal with that in the previous year? And how do they plan dealing with any other vaccine shortage, shortages in, in future chair in the coming uh, yeah. My last issue, Chair, with the OBP is with regard to the modernization of the vaccine manufacturing plant, uh, which requires a, a good uh, manufacturing process, Chair. Uh, after almost 10 years, since a once-off allocation, I think that Thomas raised this thing, was made with OBP, 
for the modernization of uh, the vaccine manufacturing plant. There has been very little work shown uh, to show except some of these expensive equipment that are lying around and not functioning. Yet the industry continues to suffer from shortages of vaccine uh, when they are actually uh, needed at this point in time. Chair. So I really need uh, uh, the guys to really uh, deal with that issue uh, to say uh, by what time can the good manufacturing practice facility be completed uh, so that uh, there's this thing chair where they're saying some of the other machines they get to order them from overseas some are not in good working conditions but by what time can we actually find this modernization of the vaccine manufacturing plant chain from my side i think that is the only thing that i would want to raise with the 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 OB teacher thanks very much thank you honorable uh, dr Montuedi. The Honorable Member Shaw. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair, and good morning to you, Chair, my colleagues and our officials. Uh, I would also like to follow what other my, some of my colleagues said that um, we will uh, commend the entity for obtaining a clean audit, but also one would also like to add to say it's good also that they've obtained accreditation. Uh, my, my, my questions are, are with regard to the, the issue of, um, let me just see where I put them. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, 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 my, my, my questions are, 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 are are going to be uh, directed to the OB, OBP with regard to the issue of uh, uh, underspending. Why is the, the presentation showing us that you have underspend in some areas? If maybe they can uh, clarify that, it will be fine for me. And how is, how, how is it going to be possible for the OBP to carry on without some policies that were supposed to be uh, established, which they are saying they, are, they have not as yet established those policies. And the other thing, Chairperson, they said to us that uh, they, are, they are talking about uh, enhance, enhancement of good governance. At, at the last slide, they said that that talking about enhance of good good governance, you will not be able to enhance good governance if you, you don't have good, uh, all policies in place. Uh, they must tell us why the policies are not being reviewed or are, are not being implemented as a, one of the targets that were put in place for themselves. They also talked about training. Can the, 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 the entity show us the list of those that have been trained so that when we do our oversight, we can be able to, to know where to go? Uh, lastly, Chair, my belief or my opinion will be, is that um, if, if a, an institution does not have good policies in place in some areas, it's where you will find that we fail to implement certain things or it's where we will be able to fail to to exhaust the budget that we have in the but because some policies are not in place. And those things can damage the accreditation, can also damage the good governance that you are you are, you are, you are, you are, you are coming up with this. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Memarlo. Thank you, Voorzitter. Chairperson, I hope you can hear me and the noise from outside is not bothering too much. We can hear you clearly. Chairperson, thank you. Let me maybe start. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm missing um, Umar Mustain here today. Is to get back to, and I think um, the Honorable Montuedi mentioned it, is um, the role of, of, of the OBP mentioned um, certain research, certain policy developments they're doing. And, and I'm very glad to hear that we are at last, and you know, these entities are speaking to one another and having coordination. But I would like to ask the question, how do we ensure that we are not the whole time 
re-evaluate or, or um, um, her ontwerping, redesigning the wheel? How are we ensuring that um, the OBP is not doing research that the ARC has already done um, that NANAC has already experienced or, you know, done some work on how do we ensure that and is there a working relationship? How do they decide who does what type of, of researching? Because that is my fear that we are having a bunch of entities that are all, you know, in Afrikaans, you say, Alkin Situpila Aya Miswapi. Um, you're so focused on what your own doing, silo working, that that you're not getting the greater picture, and we can actually achieve so much more then. Then I would like to know, Chairperson, um, they are saying that we are overachieving on, um, tra on farmers trained. How are we measuring this? Are we having them write a test or are we just point blank going, um, we are dumping information on them and then we're saying, golden star, we have achieved that. Because my fear is that you will not, if there's not a measure, um, a way to measure how much they've trained, or we will not be able to see um, where we need to improve on. Then um, in terms of uh, one of the pages speaks of complaints by clients. Um, and I think only one of eight, if I remember correctly, of the complaints have been handled. I would like to find out what the nature of these complaints uh, is, um, what the nature is, how they actually resolve these complaints. And this one that they have achieved was the, the customer satisfied after that? And I think Honorable Masipa has also made great mention of that. We are seeing at a stage where we're almost, uh, you can't even name the word OBP to a farmer without him getting upset because of you know, client dissatisfaction um, with OBP at this stage. But I will get to the vaccines later. Um, then in terms of the GMP roadmap, I think once again, my colleagues have covered me. I think it is great that they have referred it. I think that needs to be done. I think we need to see more entities that do that. Um, then in terms of, of personnel, um, we are seeing that we are overachieving, uh, we are underachieving, sorry, in vaccines sold, in vaccine production. Um, I know um, when we were there in April of this year, they said they were in a bunch of disciplinary action taken against staff members. So I would like to know, and I see our great breakdown of how many females and um, how many males we have, but I would like to find out um, specifically to our, our filling our vacancies, what is our vacancy rate at this stage? Um, where, are, uh, where are critical positions that are vacant? And does our, our, our staff have an impact on, our, on the fact that we are underachieving on vaccines? Then chairperson, getting, getting to our vaccines, um, I have to say I am very worried. I am very worried in seeing that we, our revenue is decreasing, our, our um, number of vaccines um, you know, have sold, have decreased. And I think on Montwede has said it, we have this white elephant standing there. Um, we have state of the art, um, a uh, state of the art, uh, art um, machinery that we've brought in there. Um, and maybe just thinking of that, I'm interrupting myself, but to give us feedback on those, I remember the fridges were not working correctly and some of them were cracked and the one was in the process of being fixed but can only do certain vaccines. Um, I'm just quickly referring to that. If they can speak to what is the status quo of their apparatus, of the machinery currently, for example, that um, that uh, valve wash, that that dishwasher, is that up and running and working again? Are our fridges up and working again? And then, chairperson, they made mention that there was a shortage of an availability of AHS, S19, and blood vaccines. I would like to know, and I think maybe, chairperson, um, if you will uh, allow that we get this in writing, what is the current status of all the vaccines that the OBP produce? Blood vaccines, AHS, and the rest of them. Um, do we have in stock, um, yes or no, where are they in stock? Um, and then are we planning on when are they going into a new production cycle and actually have that? And then maybe lastly, Chairperson, what is the reason that we have a decrease in our uh, in uh, a decrease in vaccines sold? What is the reason? It is is it just because of production, or is it because people are finding other alternatives, other companies to actually have that? Chairperson, um, I will leave it at that. Thank you.
Thank you for your uh, the Honorable uh, Bob Kappa. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me also join my colleagues in appreciating the... Please lower your screen, yeah. Mbalasa. Slow it a bit. Thank Lower. you. That's perfect. Like this? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, the to appreciate the performance financially of the of the of OPP, which is highly appreciated. And further than that, I would ask them that they should never regress from this. Instead, they should try their best to improve even better. Uh, now, I also want to recommend that they should always highlight areas where they work with uh, ARC or where they work differently from ARC so that we should not have uh, to seek those clarities because I know that there are areas where they, get, they, they can work together. There are areas that, where they can work separately, which to me, there's nothing wrong in that, but it helps to get th that clarity. And always also this part of a uh, farmer training, also it would assist if they always have this evidence so that there should be no question of saying who are those farmers who have been trained, where are they, what are they doing? Even if that information is uh, just an annexure, but it will assist to strengthen uh, the understanding of their performance. As also, is there any institution or institutions that they work with or cooperate with in this field of research? Because I definitely, there are universities or institutions that will be always part of research. And therefore it would assist if uh, there's uh, a difficult of those institutions and that performance. And lastly, I would also ask the entity to do themselves favor and to do the department favor by uh, highlighting areas where they definitely saw that they are contributing to fighting unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And I'm sure it is possible to identify such areas uh, because if they don't do that, it will seem as if nothing is being done to fight those three evils. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, the Honorable Bonkapa. Um, if I saw correctly, Honorable Priet uh, is uh, sent a feather to the OPP saying that under their action step to increase revenue. So perhaps uh, the OPP can note that. Uh, honorable uh, members, is there any other honorable member who have not recognized who would wish to pose a question? So the question from uh, Honorable Brett is, oh, it wasn't a complete uh, 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 question. She writes the OBP under their action step to increase revenue says they will adhere to the 2022 sales forecast and production plan. Can we get that production plan and sales forecast? Uh, Honorable Ndate Masipa would like uh, to do a comeback. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, the, the question I have got is that um, in the report of uh, that I uh, skipped um, that I wanted to ask. In the report of the ARC, they indicate that they have produced in one of their highlights, they have produced 49,890 vaccines, blood vaccines for OBP. The question that I have got is that um, is um, 
ARC now producing vaccines for OBP? And if so, how much of OBP vaccines have been produced of, uh, in particular, the blood vaccines um, so far in this particular financial year? Thanks very much. Thank you, Honorable Dante Masipa. Honorable members, is there any other honorable member who wishes to pose a question? Member Shatsi. Not recognized, Member Shatsi. Honorable Member Shatsi. Chairperson, I think she said she was attending a PC on higher education. PC on higher education. Okay. Honorable members, if uh, there is no other questions, uh, I will take this opportunity to hand back to uh, the OBP for responses. Uh, Mekinosi and the interim CEO, you may proceed. I'll uh, hand over to Honorable Kapa to uh, chair from now on, but I'll remain on the platform as I'm heading to board now. Honorable Kappa, please steer the ship. Mekinosi, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd just like to respond to uh, some of the questions at, at a high level, and then um, the CEO and the management team can, can respond to the detail. I think firstly is the issue that um, to, to make members aware that um, the board had approved the procurement of the vector proof facility as well as the um, uh, additional freeze dryer. So that has been approved um, and, and um, is now with the uh, awarded service providers. Um, of course, as we had indicated previously, the timing between uh, the time of the placement of order and the production of, and sorry, and the commissioning of our equipment is approximately 24 months. In the meantime, Chair, we have also been in discussion with um, an alternate uh, service provider to, to assist in the production of some of our, our vaccines and, and management can, can talk to that. Um, with regards to um, the strike, I think um, the, there has been some um, uh, legal matters that, that have taken place. Uh, as far as I know, the strike is over. The, the employees are um, back at, at the, in their positions. Uh, but I think on average, it was probably about 10 employees that were involved um, with members of of uh, that particular union. Um, Chair, there was a question around, um, I think uh, just with, with regards to, to the GMP, um, again, uh, our legal representative can, can respond to, I think the GMP matters as well as the, the former CEO CCMA matter. Um, we that has taken a long time, um, but I think there have been challenges in in terms of of the other party, and I think even the the commissioner in at the CCMA has has tried to expedite that process uh, because it was just dragging on for too long. Our um, Stakeholder engagements have improved, um, and I know our team is constantly in discussion with um, various uh, parties um, and, and uh, stakeholders within the sector that's ongoing, um, not without challenges, of course, um, but there is regular interaction, especially around the shortages of our vaccines and, and the expectations out there. Um, with regards to the underspending, and the CFO will respond to the detail, but with regard to underspending, because we don't receive funding from the fiscus, uh, OBP is self-sufficient. So where we save money, where we don't spend on certain aspects, um, it would ultimately um, uh, reflect in the, in the net profit of the organization. But if we look at an area like like employee training as an example, where very little training was achieved in this past financial year. It is also because of the matching, the, the benchmarking, matching and placement exercise that is underway um, 
and and so in the new financial in this financial year probably in in the last two quarters we will see a rise in in the training expenditure because people would have been matched and placed in 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 their positions by then um, there was a question on the where does hr sit um uh, in the old structure hr was reporting to the CEO um, in the new approved structure, uh, we have um, defined the corporate services uh, element um, where, where HR will be a part of, of that division. Um, I think just on the uh, policies and procedures and, and the areas around how do we want to enhance good governance when our policies are outstanding. I think specifically, if I may refer to the HR policies where a service provider um, was appointed and is, is on, on um, uh, is, is busy with, the, with the, at least the HR policies for now. In the other divisions, um, the policies in those environments are being reviewed um, on an ongoing basis. Um, I think um, the policies have also been prioritized as to uh, which policies are done first and can serve at the uh, subcommittees and, and ultimately approval at the board. Uh, the filling of vacancies and um, and the impact on 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 the organization as a as a result of the matching and placement exercise, uh, we have only filled critical vacancies in in the last while, um, and of course the the rest is dependent on on where and how we we match and place individuals, and and then look at the vacancy gap thereafter. Um, with that, if I can perhaps hand over to to the CEO. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Chair of the Board. Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, maybe uh, I think that the, the Chair has covered some of the points that I, uh, I was going to make. But just to, to, to perhaps uh, uh, just, just take them in terms of the of, of, of the various category on governance, uh, chair. The policies that we're talking about that that uh, that we have not achieved, policies do exist, but they are dated. So what we had uh, taken upon ourselves to do was to ensure that the policies are updated and are are, are, are relevant in terms of the labor relations, uh, in terms of the labor relations act. Uh, those those are specifically HR uh, uh, HR uh, policies, uh, honourable members and honourable chair. From a skills uh, development point of view, uh, honourable members, uh, we 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 are we are saying that uh, we are reporting that uh, that our capacity at HR historically had been very a small capacity that we have. Uh, that resulted in some of the skills and uh, skills uh, development uh, work that we we do being uh, being not fulfilled to the fullest capacity. I must say, Chair, that uh, as we speak right now, the training program for our staff is is at is it is at a peak from ICT training general management training uh, as, as, as we will reflect when we report on the third quarter performance that our training is full in full speed. I must say, Chair, with having said that, that our capacity from a technical point of view to produce vaccines uh, cannot be matched, Chair. Any vaccines that you have in our 52 or so list of vaccines, we've got the technical capacity to produce those those vaccine chairs. So we, we are not we are not uh, running a shortage of skills gap. Uh, uh, our our technical skills uh, are, are quite are quite are quite at a level where, which is re required by the entity like ourselves. Chair, we we sitting uh, at at a very interesting uh, uh, RF as as it's called. On our right chair of our gate, we've got the university that uh, produces students uh, that have done uh, uh, veterinary sciences. 
Across on our left chair, we've got ARC, which produces, uh, which does research on, on animal health. And in the middle, we produce the vaccines. We have chair, as I speak, a memorandum of understanding and a steering committee that runs the, 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 the programs are, are, are against that memorandum of understanding between ourselves and the agricultural research councils. The chairs of the two entities meet a half yearly chair to make sure that there is progress. There are certain programs that we run together with the, uh, with the Agricultural Research Council, OVR in this instance. One of those projects chair that were in the at a conception uh, stage chair is to what extent can we share uh, any renewable energy uh, uh, program that assists both, uh, both entities because energy sustainability for both entities is very crucial. We've submitted a request to the department and the department has responded to us favorably. And now we're in the process of putting together a comprehensive energy sustainability program for the two campuses, Chair. We also do have, uh, so there's no duplication uh, in research, but my colleague, uh, our chief scientific officer will talk more to, to that. We also have a memorandum of understanding between ourselves and the, and the University of Pretoria, the veterinary campus, wherein we work together in certain projects where they are, they are, they are candidate uh, students for, for, for veterinary science. When they do their research, we can share what they pick up on the field so that we can be able to produce relevant vaccines for the future with respect, with respect to that. Chair, I, I think uh, Honorable Chair and the members, uh, the chair of the board has, 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 uh, has, has already spoken to the strike. Chair, I think just to put it mildly, a group of 16 employees tried to hold the organization to ransom. We took the matter to court. We've won the case at the labor court. So that strike uh, has, has been declared was declared by by the judge of the of the of the labor court as it was unlawful it didn't meet the rules of the picketing process and to the extent that the the the, the, the labor court had awarded costs against the union that was involved together with those members of staff that were involved chair in that process so we are in the process of recouping all our legal costs that are relating to 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 that uh, to to that structure. Uh, you, the, the chair has already spoken to to where HR currently resides, uh, with respect to the structure. K HR belongs to a, a division called Corporate Services, uh, a function which includes ICT, HR, and Security uh, Management. Uh, chair, I, I will now hand over to to my colleagues. I will start with my CFO that is going to talk to the numbers. I will hand over to our sales and business, the marketing sales and business development uh, executive to speak to the numbers around vaccine sold. Uh, our chief scientific officer to speak to the issue uh, around the partnership in research. And lastly, uh, perhaps uh, my, our, our head of legal to speak to the, to the, to the issues around uh, the litigation that we are currently uh, involved in. But on, 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 on the last point that I wanted to, to make, uh, uh, Chair, is just to say that we have developed a, a mitigating strategy around uh, our freeze drying process, because this is where our production fails. It's because we are dealing with a dated, uh, very old equipment. We are currently, we've currently put an order for a freeze dryer we're working with the Spanish and the French to, to, for their support in our current old uh, freeze dryer, but we have now in the, in the verge of, of getting into some contract manufacturing with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the company of our stature that will be able to freeze dry the product for us because our technology is very important. Therefore, the role that they are gonna play in our manufacturing process because we developed the vaccines, we've got the technical competence to do that. All that they are going to do in this uh, uh, 
a contract manufacturing strategy that we've put as a redundancy permanent strategy is to do the freeze drying for us, but the rest of the manufacturing process would be the function of, of under support biological products, uh, chain honorable members. Let, let me over, hand over to my support to take through the numbers. Uh, good morning, Honourable Chair. Good morning, Honourable Members. Uh, my name is Elspeth Governor, the CFO at uh, OBP. Uh, we respond to the financial questions that were posed by the Honourable Members. Uh, the first one would be the clarity on the numbers that were provided. In the presentation, we have given the net revenue. Um, if the if members could look at the annual report, uh, in note 16, we then explain uh, what that is composed of. We have made a gross revenue in, uh, in the year 486 million. We've then granted a discount of 16 million, which then gives us the figure of 170 million that we speak to. So uh, the presentation only speaks to our net uh, revenue. That is a clarity around the revenue. The second item that was spoken to was the cash flow. We do allude that we were given capital expenditure assistance from the department of 492 million. That did assist in terms of capital expenditure. However, cash flow has improved operationally. If you will note in the prior year, our operating uh, cash flow has, uh, was 6 million. In the current financial year or the financial year that we're reporting, we increased our operational cash flow to 41 million, meaning that uh, we have, although we have reduced the revenue we've made, we've in turn put in cost management strategies that have reduced expenditure. So we've spent in line with what we've made to come up with a, 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 a cash, additional cash of 41 million which we are going to utilize to invest in uh, the purchase of the new freeze dryer, which the CEO will speak to as well. In terms of underspending, the honorable members did speak to this. Uh, our business model is slightly different. Uh, for OBP, we do not get uh, operational grant. So we have to spend what we make. Uh, and in noting that we have moved from a revenue of 209 million we then had to uh, also then reduce our expenditure in line. So last year we moved from 214 million and a profit for the year of 1.4. In the financial year, we then had a revenue of 173 million. We had to reduce our cost of sales by 28 million. We had to reduce our operating expenditure by 25 million. And in turn, we actually then had a comprehensive uh, income or profit of 5.3, so an increase in our income through the cost management strategy. So slightly different model in that we, we do chase our budgets, but they have to be in line with what we make. Uh, in terms of uh, employment, I, I will speak to direct and indirect initiatives. So direct initiatives we have is paid internships, um, and other initiatives HRO will then speak to or the CSC, my apologies. However, we also have a supply chain management uh, uh, department where we have a bigger spend that we can then invest in. We are looking at enterprise development programs. We are focusing on our immediate community. We're focusing on empowering uh, the black community, disabled and women therefore growing employment uh, through those indirect initiatives with the SCM. Uh, in terms of increase in revenue is a concern. What are the initiatives we have in place? The BDO business development executive will speak to this, but just to note that uh, according to amended budget, we are noting that we have to increase revenue, uh, but also sensitive to pricing. So we are going to increase our revenue to 205 for the current financial year and then 230. So the increases are, are significant from where we are now. So we've taken cognizance that we still need to increase our revenue and it will be in line with obviously the initiatives we've put in place for a purchase of the freeze dryer that uh, uh, works with our viral vaccines uh, and also a, a 
planned maintenance that uh, program that we're putting in place. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable chair. Thank you, honorable members. I will then uh, allow the BDO. Uh, uh, good morning, Honourable Chair. My name, my name is Jogo Mudumo. Uh, Honourable Thank members, you, uh, uh, the Chair of the uh, Board, CEO. While you are, can you please also police. note that we are... Uh, uh, first, there are right. about several questions that I need to, to answer. One of them is Farmers Day, no sickness availability, and our performance with regard to doses while they're dropping and, and the way forward, our sales forecast and also customer complaint Handling those, and I'll try to group them in that fashion. First, the question was on the farmers' days: um, where are they being held, and whether we, they are quantifiable? The answer is yes, Chair. We are in the sector of livestock industry, and it is obvious that we 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 have a targeted approach on on our farmers' days. Uh, our main target is uh, uh, livestock farmers. That includes both cattle and sheep. And we also have uh, an association with some of the uh, equine farmers, I mean equine uh, uh, host owners, whereby we engage with them with regard to products that are related to, uh, to that sector. Where are they being held? Uh, farmers, they are held uh, across the country, and, but our main focus based on the number of, of certain species you'll find our activities more in the Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, because that's where you'll find quite a lot of sheep farmers. And we have also activities in the uh, KZN, uh, Limpopo, and Pumala, and also the, the, the Northwest. So we make sure that at least where we have a high concentration of uh, livestock farmers, uh, OBP is there. Um, and we approach it differently. We have a joint, activities with some of our of our customers in this case joint activities with co-ops whereby we have a specific farmers day with co-ops because we have to bring business to them and at the same time we have joint activities with provincial department of culture whereby we promote usage of vaccines as part and parcel of uh, educating farmers with regard to their farm biosecurity and again, we have uh, joint activities with associations, such as the National Rural Growers Associations, uh, the RPO. Uh, we had several roadshows with all this organization as part and parcel of our, our training. And Chair, uh, one important thing is we do work very closely with the, with the ARC. In fact, in some of the ARC's kind of asset home project, OBP have been on several occasions being part and parcel of the project, and, and we are a team, and we have jointly been on the road show with regard to that project training, training in pharma. So uh, we can't do it alone. We have to do it with all the other stakeholders. And the question was, is that verifiable? The answer is yes. Uh, all the information that we're presenting to you, including number of farmers days, have been audited, Chad. so it's, it's, it's verifiable. And we have all the contact details of all the farmers who are there, the names and regions where they stay and where we can, so that by the time we are at, 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 at OBP, we're able to, to look at individual regions and if ever there is a client of interest, we're able to, to call them. With regard to the African North sickness, uh, there was some doubt with regard as whether we are producing African nose sickness. And I can assure you, Honorable Chair, that we do produce African nose sickness, even though we had some, some challenges. And let me just reassure you that, in fact, on the uh, African nose sickness control zone, which was the most sensitive area of interest, not only to OBP, but also to the equine industry, uh, we had engagement with the uh, the equine industry, and we made some assurance of which we we need to supply uh, more than 40,000 doses to that to make sure that at least uh, the export industry is not being affected by the unavailability of African nose sickness. In the last two weeks, plus or minus 40,000 doses of African nose sickness have been dispatched. Uh, even prior to that, we had a lot of doses being, being supplied to that region. So we never had any form of 
shortage of concern to, to that region. In fact, we started now even supplying some old African sickness to, to uh, big regions such as the Gauteng, where we have quite a lot of high concentration of host owners and also the, the KZN. So we're trying our level best to make sure that at least the industry is at ease with regard to control of the African host sickness. Um, well, with regard to the doses, uh, why they're dropping a chair in the opening statement of the, the chair of OBP, uh, as she has already outlined that yes, we had some equipment uh, a breakdown, which was unfortunate. Uh, they had a, 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 an impact in our, in our uh, production output capacity. However, that was not the only uh, challenge. Uh, uh, one thing that I think we need to uh, acknowledge is the impact of electricity outages uh, as we are part and parcel of production. So OBP, just like any other uh, manufacturing sector, uh, the availability of energy is the one that will have an impact on OBP. And we indicated even a year ago, if you can recall, how much OBP has lost with regard to a product that we had to dump because of the um, electricity outages. Yes, <clears throat> we have some challenges with regard to the equipment, it did have an impact with regard to our production output. In the, in, even in the current challenge, uh, quarter one of our uh, financial performance was very impressive chair. We did go far beyond our target with regard mm -hmm. to our sales revenue uh, target and also our doses sold. We were above more than plus or minus 20% above our, our target in quarter one. Uh, when we had serious challenges was in our quarter two, uh, we didn't reach our, our target. On the plan ahead, uh, we have reviewed on what we can, we can do with regard to what is available to us. And we have plans that within the next coming six months, um, looking at our other alternative as yes, already explained by the CEO and the uh, certain product of high value uh, we believe that we'll be able to, to break even come the end of the financial year. So it is not as bleak as it may seem. Uh, uh, plans are already available for us to make sure that we achieve our, our target. On the sales uh, okay. forecast... Just, and just leave it at that because we have run out of time. We cannot start uh, the any financial year without a budget. And budget Excuse is based me. on what we focused a, a year ahead. So we do have the same focus plan six Excuse months me. before the start of the financial year. So that information of sales focus is the one that informs the production plan and is the one that also informs the budget of, of the company. Please, so the speaker cannot, the speaker cannot hear me. Uh, indicated that they need that uh, in writing. Uh, it is available uh, as part and parcel of, of our practice, as part and parcel of planning can ahead. You, can someone please? Assist the speaker to hear me. Russian plan that is informed by the self forecast. Excuse me, um, the chairperson is speaking, sir. Mtate Kapa, we can hear you. Yes, I was, I was, I was saying to him that we have run out of time now. Uh, therefore, we have to leave it at that. Maybe I'll appeal to the members that all the remaining questions can be answered in writing probably before the end of the day on Friday. But now we have run out of time. Uh, I appreciate that there's a lot of information to be given, but we have run out of time. We have, go to, we have to go to the next presentation. I see Owner Marshall is having a hand up. Owner Marshall. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be asking a question that will be answered now. But the reason why I raised my hands up for follow-up is the issue of uh, OBB telling us about the, the matter of electricity. The question there is that, is there any other plans to look at the, the other avenues like a solar, solar usage or a backup system that will make them not to wait when electricity is not there? I, I don't need an answer now. They can tell us their plans with regard to the 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 the, the, the electricity issue. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable Honourable Noko. 
Um, uh, Chair, I just want to make 100% sure. Are we having the whole day with the, with the entities? Because I'm just worried that we are just going to cut and we're not going to get the answers. And uh, it has been really uh, in the past been a problem that we ask for written answers. We never get them at all. So if you cut them from really sharing with us, how are we going to really be doing oversight if we are not really getting fully the answers, Chair? I just want to ask maybe to, to indulge that we really indulge the department because we definitely need to do follow up as well. Thank you. But here, Honorable Nogo, the fact remains that we are having this of this session and afternoon session with all of them, because at the moment now we have only one. We still have two before before lunch, and in the afternoon we have one, two, three, four. Again, but now. My worry is that if we spend all the time, because as we have, it's supposed to be 20 minutes for presentation, 20 minutes for questions, and 20 minutes for uh, responses. It doesn't seem that we have the opportunity or chance to leave it uncontrolled. The best that can be done now when you go to the next one is that the time allocated um, the time allocated uh, should be used as it is i hope i'm answering you on Rep. very clear tim uh, chair i think you you've answered me but i think maybe um um allowing them to really do as um, fast as possible in terms of answering the questions but also, you know, reminding them of the time before they start the question, answering the questions, so that they allocate each other enough time to speak. Because uh, my concern is that uh, we are not answered um, on questions of very, very important importance. Mm. Thank you. Uh, May, I assist, May I assist, Chair, in terms of procedure? Maybe, Chair, we should remind the entities that the allocated time is 20 minutes. Um, now that everyone that is about to present, the allocated time is 20 minutes for presentation and then 20 minutes yeah. for clarity seeking questions and answers. Uh, moving forward, Chair. Um, that is known. I think this is not the first uh, time the entities are presenting to us and with that allocated time. So that, Chair, moving forward, whoever that might be presenting can allocate each other accordingly. So um, that is my proposal, Chair, and you've already uh, explained it uh, uh, properly earlier on. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Members. So if then we agree that these remaining questions will be answered in this way, but it only ends there. It's not, it must not going to be a tradition that all the presentations, the presentations that are coming now must be done within the allocated time so that it does not disadvantage the members on their oversight responsibility. I'm appealing to honorable members at the moment that because it is so, it so happened that uh, OBP had apparently uh, a lot of information to give it to us. And I'm not sure whether they were not aware that it's only 20 minutes, but now all presenters will be knowing that it's only 20 minutes for presentation, 20 minutes for responses. I thank you. Uh, can May I, I come in, Chief? May yes. I come in, Kandega? Yes. I just, wanted to, I, I just wanted to add on, Chair, if I may, and say yes. that uh, maybe we need the Secretariat to keep track of the questions so that we know which questions were answered and which were not, and not just leave it up to the entity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable. That is in order. I hope it is understood from the Secretariat. Thank you. Honorable uh, members, let me ask now from, from the Secretariat, who is coming next? Is it ARC? 
Mamka Kaza? Yes, it's ARC, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, ARC, over to you. This is your opportunity now. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. I'm Mono Mashaba. I'm the Deputy Chairperson of Council. And I'm again you know, apologizing for the Chairperson of Council. She cannot be here with us because of other commitments. And firstly, you know, I'd like to thank you, Chairperson and the Portfolio Committee members for giving us this opportunity to account for the execution of the mandate that you have given to us for 2021-2022. We are really grateful, Chairperson, for the support and guidance that you have provided as a committee throughout the year in the fulfillment of this objective. And we are also grateful for the support that has been provided by the department, the minister, deputy ministers, and also senior officials of the department, and also our, you know, our counterparts at the OBP and the NMC and the PPCP, who have also continued to work with us very, very closely to, to coordinate our functions and ensure that we don't go beyond what is expected of us. Uh, Chairperson, overall, in, in the, the performance of our organization, they'll load up the, the, the presentation. Uh, CEO, can you load the presentation? The performance of our organization will be presented to the committee. Uh, uh, we've made some progress but still a lot has to be to be done, Chairperson. We've again encountered the, the challenges of uh, obtaining a qualification, again, due to our property, plant, and equipment. It's for the sixth year going, uh, Chairperson, that we have actually faced uh, the AGSA on the issue of our asset management, given the, the vast nature of uh, the resources that are at our disposal, that we cannot account for properly in our asset register, the valuation of these assets, these properties, also the ownership of these properties, it remains something that is pulling us backwards as we try to move forward. And the CEO is going to, to make the presentation on, on behalf of the, uh, the entity, but I'll just like to indicate that Chairperson, we have been able to continue to push the ARC to perform, especially on our uh, the ending of external income. Uh, the private uh, research, private research institutions, academic institutions, they're encroaching in our space, uh, Chairperson. You know, we cannot take things for granted. I think the private sector have arrived also with other ways of doing things, much more efficient ways of doing things, and we seem to be losing ground. So in essence, I think with the new CEO, uh, the council have requested that there has to be agility in what we do as a LRC to be able to, to achieve the mandate. And we've also looked at the issue of the commercialization strategy that we are implementing. I think to turn around the ARC and be able to generate more funding. And the CEO will take you through the presentation and, and will take the committee through the presentation and then will then be able to respond afterwards. Thank you, Chair. CEO, you can come. Over to you, CEO. Uh, thank, thank you. Can someone help with that technical glitch? Chair, that happened when you have got budgets. I'm audible now, Chair. Okay, you are. Thank you. 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 Uh, can someone remove the repeated echo? Honorable Chair. Chair, that usually happens when um the the the, the, the person is logged in in in, in multiple uh, gadgets. Yeah. Maybe the CEO is logged into two. And Thank you. Uh, remove one. You got it, uh, CFO, Mr. McGinn. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I think we have resolved it now. Thank you. Proceed. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank, and thank you to the deputy chairperson for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, greetings to uh, the honorable members um, and uh, DG and uh, departmental exco uh, members and other heads of entities and board members present and colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very mindful of the time, uh, Chairperson, but I just want to make a few uh, comments uh, as we go into uh, talking about the performance of the previous financial year. Uh, from a leadership perspective, members are aware that uh, we are uh, transitioning. Um, I started at the ARC uh, on the first day of the current financial year. Uh, so uh, most of the work that we'll be talking about um, would be work that uh, was undertaken over the uh, course of the period that um, um, uh, I wasn't part of the ARC. However, uh, the CFO uh, and myself, and he is also uh, his third month now, uh, participated in uh, finalizing um, some of the audit elements and, and the preparation of the of the annual report uh, and, and how we respond to some of the challenges that were picked up uh, during the course of, um, of the previous financial year. Um, I don't see the, uh, I hope, thought my COSEC was showing the slides, please, because um, the host has disabled my screen sharing on my site. Advocate Matsane, can you please continue with the sharing? Okay, okay, Chairperson, CEO, I'll do so. Can you share the screen, Advocate? Yes. I'm Thank you. Uh, advocate is stealing from your time, so you feel. Yeah, please. But, but maybe let me proceed while she's loading the screen, Chairperson. Um, okay. uh, a few things that um, I, I want to touch on, uh, being mindful of the time. Um, I think members are familiar with the mandate of the ARC, which is to conduct uh, research and development, uh, as well as drive technology transfer. Uh, from, from, from those activities uh, for sustainable food and nutrition security. Of course, we have to do this uh, sustainably, uh, in other words, uh, while conserving our natural resource base. Um, Chairperson, I will skip some of the slides. And when you come on uh, advocate, uh, I'm now, Uh, talking about uh, on slide five. Are you still struggling? Yes, I'm struggling. Mecca Kaza, can you give the, the, the sharing screening rights to Dr. Vegotin, please? Apologies, or, uh, honorable members, I'm unable to share. Or, or, or to me, to my second device. I, I think you do have uh, uh, the sharing. Mr. Okay, it, it still yes. shows- You're a host. host. You're a host now. It's still showing host disabled participant screen sharing. Can this be solved? We're, we're losing time. I still can't share. Okay, it's, it's, it looks like it's coming now. Go straight to slide five, uh, advocate. We've lost a bit of time.
it's becoming a lot of time. Yes, thank you. Just put it on slide mode. Uh, and, and thank you for understanding chairperson and honorable members. Um, put it on slideshow. This is the presenter's view, so you need to put it on. Um, Chairperson, um, the slide that is on the screen may not be too visible because it's not big enough, but um, let me just quickly talk to it while uh, Cossack is trying to figure this out. Um, the only thing I would like to say on this slide, Chairperson, just to remind the members, we are a scientific research organization uh, whose work uh, drives agricultural development, which is what you see on the right. Um, this slide shows the scientific input and the outcomes uh, that we are expected to contribute to on, on the right-hand side. Uh, as a science council, uh, we conduct research, develop intellectual property, uh, and transfer technologies for food and nutrition security, as well as promote uh, uh, competitiveness in the sector. We're expected to produce tangible outputs uh, that lead to a set of desirable outcomes. And we get uh, audited based on uh, those predetermined objectives uh, that cover uh, the consolidated outcomes that uh, you will then see in the next slide, which is slide six. Go to the next slide, Kosek. So in the next slide, uh, Chairperson, can you please move to the uh, next slide? In the next slide, we, not that one, next. We are just showing in the next slide um, the, uh, that our, what I've just described, that our performance is tracked through a set of uh, five targeted outcomes and associated interventions. And in terms of how we report our performance over the period um, is, is then um, looking at how we have performed against those targets associated with each of, of these outcomes and uh, from, from um, expressing the targets uh, linked to the associated interventions. Uh, linked to each of the outcomes. Um, in the next slide, uh, Chair, um, we then <coughs> share at a high level the summary of performance in the previous financial year. Um, we had 83 uh, performance indicators um, and we had a uh, commendable 64% uh, uh, overall performance. Um, where targets were met uh, and uh, or exceeded. And when you zoom in, um, we are on the previous slide, Madam. And when you zoom in, um, in, in terms of the R&D performance targets, um, the performance um, is um, about 78%. And a big part of this uh, comes, Kosa, can you please move to the previous slide? Yes, that one, thank you. Um, a big part of, the, uh, of this 78% uh, of the R&D performance targets comes from um, our scientific publications, which where we achieved uh, 479, uh, which is the second highest, uh, that's an error where it says the highest, second highest uh, that the organization has ever achieved. Uh, and we believe that uh, coming out of the COVID era, our scientists, um, had more time during that period due to the restricted travel to mine the data. Uh, but it also demonstrates that we still carry a lot of potential to learn uh, from existing work and to develop other knowledge products as we move forward. Uh, there were also some um, uh, quite interesting discoveries during the period. Um, and, and I will share some highlights on each of these in the next slides, uh, of course, being mindful of the time. Um, the, uh, our expenditure for the year remained um, within budget, 
Um, we are going to spend a bit of time uh, towards the end of our allocated time, Chair. Uh, I will allow the CFO to, uh, to talk on the finances um, and, and also provide a bit of additional information uh, on the audit outcome, uh, which um, the Deputy Chairperson uh, already mentioned in his introduction as well. Thank you, CEO. We know. Yes, sir. You, you, you want to... Are you not hand over, handing over to Karim? No, no, Chair. I don't know what happened to the presentation. It's falling off the screen. Mamuka Kaza, can you please uh, uh, give me uh, co-hosting uh, rights on the Mr. second? Mr. McLinga, you are a co-host. You are yes. even a, a host. You are not even a co-host. You are a host. Yeah. So can you see the second device with my name? No, I can't see. I'm not sure which one are you using. Why, why do you have to use two devices in one meeting? Yeah, because the other one has my speaking notes and I'm projecting on this one. Through you, Chair, may I ask Mem Kakaza to give the rights to Mr. Dr. Vergerton because he's normally the one who normally presents with the CEO. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, I, I understand. I was understanding that she said the right is already there. But if not, uh, Albertina, can you give that right? Who is presenting the slides now? Is it advocate or CEO? It's Mr. McGinn, Chair. Proceed, Mr. McGinn. Mr. McGinn, are you able to see your slides? Can members now see my screen? Yes, yes. Sir, you can. Thank you, thank you yes, very much. Can. Now let's let's see if I can pick up a bit of uh, pace. And and apologies for uh, for the delay, chairperson. Um, and and um, I had just said that the CFO will talk a little bit on the finances before we um, we we hand over to him, and he will also spend a little bit of uh, time on the. Uh, on the audit outcome, because we have uh, prepared um, some information for this uh, committee to uh, highlight uh, those areas that gave us uh, the qualification once again. Um, in this uh, slide quickly, Chair, um, this just shows a performance trend that's been steadily improving over the years. Um, while new cultivar registrations have not kept up, we have a solid pipeline that's awaiting registration with the department. And we are also working closely towards improving the efficiency of the process. Um, we, uh, of course, have uh, other challenges that we are dealing with as an organization uh, for which we have um, begun um, uh, uh, developing some solutions internally uh, to meet these challenges. And we are making some investments uh, in some technology areas. Uh, to help us turn around towards uh, more efficiency. Uh, and I'm now going to spend um, just a bit of time on some R&D highlights. Um, uh, uh, as, as indicated earlier, we express our work through these uh, uh, predetermined outcomes. The first one being on increased agricultural producti production and productivity. And uh, what I would like to share uh, very briefly here, Chair, 
um, over the last uh, period is, is the development of a, um, a, a mini A-frame vertical hydroponic system for household uh, urban farming. Um, and this has been developed with, um, of course, with partnerships, which is the model for which the ARC in any case uh, does its work. Um, uh, these technologies, um, which uh, are usually referred to as controlled environment uh, agriculture can be considered also uh, as we, as we uh, observe chain areas that have been damaged by uh, recent um, flood disasters, et cetera, and can provide food and nutrition security at household level, uh, even though they also have a very, very high potential for, for large scale production. We've also developed uh, some production uh, and identification guidelines, about 30 of them for a variety of crops, uh, and we have more in the pipeline. And I've already spoken uh, on, the, uh, on the cultivars. Uh, the second outcome is on sustainable ecosystems uh, and natural resources. And over this period, uh, Chairperson, um, we have developed a, a diagnostic uh, services package uh, which is called your soil, um, which is offered through um, um, our um, uh, plant health and protection as well as natural resources uh, and engineering uh, campuses, uh, which gives farmers um, an opportunity to test soil health throughout the year, uh, looking at the production uh, schedule for different crops um, within the country. And it can, um, as we have observed, contribute to uh, towards long-term soil monitoring, um, towards uh, uh, improved management uh, of our of our soils and and soil uh, where uh, production takes place. Understanding the impact of climate change, Chairperson, um, uh, is important, um, and that's why uh, we have um, a number of projects. Uh, that are uh, targeted at, uh, at climate change issues. Um, and one of them is mentioned here, uh, which is a project uh, that has been looking at um, uh, ecosystem resilience uh, in, um, uh, applied in, in some wetlands in selected areas uh, and others that um, we will be able to touch on if there is a little bit of time uh, left when we finish uh, our presentation. The next outcome I would like to touch on in the uh, limited available time is the one on uh, nutritional value, quality, and safety of uh, agricultural products. And I would like to just say here, um, Chairperson, that some members uh, may be familiar with uh, electrolyzed water as a um, as a, uh, a, a, a eco-friendly and effective technique for. Uh, microbial de decontamination. However, uh, the work that was done during this period has actually um, uh, um, uh, shed uh, light and, and the potential on uh, other uh, potential benefits uh, of uh, using electrolyzed water uh, to actually improve the quality uh, of the fruit and, and some of uh, and, and its life. Um, uh, and, and the study was conducted on nectarines. And the importance of this is, of course, that the outcome of this study provides guidelines for uh, stone fruit pack houses and other industry role players on the, on the potential of um, this uh, well-known technology. Um, the, the next outcome is uh, the one on skills development uh, across the agricultural sector. And um, we work, uh, Chairperson, with all the provincial departments, and we also partner with uh, organized agriculture for uh, various capacity development initiatives. We also conduct uh, some of the research and cultivar evaluation trials with farmers as part of the capacity development initiative and supporting the dissemination uh, of technology. We have highlighted some of that work. Uh, uh, in this presentation from selected locations. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into that. We have uh, two slides, um, uh, Chairperson, where we have listed, as members will see, uh, specific areas where the ARC has uh, conducted some of its work 
to orientate members on, on some of the areas where uh, projects of the ARC are taking place. We also continue um, as part of this exercise of uh, supporting farmers with some readily available um, knowledge and, and techniques uh, to use some readily available plant material to develop uh, therapeutics for uh, certain diseases. Um, our vegetable industrial and medicinal plant um, research group does most of this work. Um, another important aspect of this uh, work is of course to develop some uh, viable businesses working with some of our communities. Um, and our agro-processing uh, laboratory has developed uh, some of the uh, products that can be uh, manufactured with simple technologies uh, to actually assist uh, our, our communities. And Chairperson, I think um, maybe I can um, just go to uh, uh, this slide, um, continuing on the um, capacity development theme, um, there is a, an understanding that genomics and bioinformatics are scarce and critical skills, not only in South Africa, but across the region. And so there is um, a concerted effort from our side uh, to, uh, to develop uh, this uh, skill um, and, 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 and work with uh, students, scientists, and others uh, in order to, um, to make sure that uh, uh, we provide access to, um, to our communities uh, and, the, and all the information that uh, can be generated um, with this kind of skill, uh, which remains in short supply. Um, and this, this work, uh, of course, is led by our biotechnology platform, uh, Chairperson, which has done a good job. Um, the next outcome, uh, very briefly, again, is uh, enhancing resilience of agriculture and goes to a little bit of uh, uh, detail of, around some of our um, uh, climate monitoring activities uh, in order to assist uh, our farming communities. We have done some work with um, um, the United Nations Environment Program uh, to look at um, um, uh, addressing some of the effects of cli climate change in some selected areas. Um, and this is ongoing work, uh, Chairperson. Uh, we also use uh, our uh, uh, national uh, uh, collections uh, under our National Public Goods Assets Program uh, to be able to understand some of um, uh, the developments around um, uh, management of pests and diseases, uh, which allows us to uh, participate with partners and, and lead um, the, the resilience of the sector and the response of the country uh, to, uh, to the development of some of these uh, undesirable pests and diseases. Um, there have also been some progress uh, registered within the Kaunafazo Yadihomo over the period uh, which I think some uh, members of the uh, portfolio committee may be familiar with. Over the period, uh, the last period, more than 7,000 um, uh, farmers uh, participated uh, in, uh, in the program and, um, and we can only uh, expect that uh, things will improve uh, going forward. Um, we have also, uh, Chairperson, developed um, uh, some uh, apps that um, I'm going to uh, uh, just uh, move very quickly through that assist uh, and dis disseminate knowledge uh, for, our, um, for our farmers uh, and those that are uh, in the sector uh, to assist them to farm better, uh, to learn uh, better production technologies uh, and to, uh, to produce for the market where, where these um, uh, uh, production levels can be achieved. Um, these are the slides that I mentioned, Chair. I'm not going to, to stay on them. Uh, I'm just going to uh, run through to outcome six, uh, which is more uh, an internal facing outcome uh, to a large extent because it talks to uh, areas where you um, um, uh, can improve the efficiency of, of the organization in delivering on its objectives and looks at um, 
uh, infrastructure, IP management, uh, human capital, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and over the period, uh, we, um, we can report that uh, we filed in different territories uh, 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 about 20 uh, intellectual property applications. Um, and we have also collected uh, royalty amount uh, uh, in excess of 35 million, uh, which is a good thing for the ARC. Uh, we continue to work uh, with uh, different partners to uh, to generate um, uh, viable uh, intellectual property and, and protect it uh, to make sure that we uh, protect its value for the benefit of the country and, and the agricultural sector in particular. I'm not going to spend time on uh, some of these apps, uh, chairperson, uh, that have been developed uh, um, okay. by our intellectual, uh, by our ICT uh, division. I'm just going to uh, skip through um, to talk about uh, one important one that I can just mention, uh, which we believe is going to be very valuable uh, also in terms of uh, how we contribute to uh, the biosecurity um, um, uh, hub, the national biosecurity hub that was launched uh, yesterday uh, with some of these technologies. Uh, one of those that has been developed enables farmers to participate um, and, uh, uh, in online discussions and be able to have some kind of a warning system. And it can easily be downloaded chairperson from, uh, from Google Play Score. I will skip the others and talk very briefly on human capital let's, management. Let's hold it there, Mr. McKinsey. Yes, Chair. Let's hold it there. We'll rely on the fact that members have gone through the, the presentation to the reports because we might run out of time that it's important that members must have enough time to ask questions and for clarities and yeah. have their inputs. I think- Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. If the CFO wants to jump in and take two minutes to allow members to ask questions on the finance part, uh, you can come through CFO. Uh, thank you, CEO. So there's only four slides on finance. Uh, one on each of the elements of the financial statements, we're looking at the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash position of the ARC. And then we've got uh, the, a very crucial slide on the audit outcome. So in terms of revenue, um, our parliamentary grant uh, had gone up from 980 odd million to one, uh, over a billion. Uh, however, the ARC still uh, was la lagging behind in terms of external revenue. Um, although you see that, uh, you know, it, it seems like a flat line that we had external revenue of 365 million last year. It was against a budget of 487 million. And uh, uh, that just goes to show that the, 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 the external revenue uh, is, is not meeting the targets we're setting for ourselves, which means that we are still overly reliant on the parliamentary grant. Um, and that is something of concern to, 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 to the uh, senior management of the ARC. Um, we have kept our operating expenses and, and uh, employee costs in check, uh, but that comes at a cost because we are not doing uh, all the competency assessments. And uh, uh, as a result, we are losing some uh, critical skills um, in, in, in some of the core areas. So, so we are going through the exercises as we speak uh, to ensure that uh, senior researchers and scientists are, uh, are remunerated at the correct skills. At, at, at scales, sorry. So in terms of the of the income statement, we did uh, at the end of the day because we kept a, a, a cap on on expenditure, uh, uh, report an operating surplus of 198 million and a net surplus of 168 million, taking into consideration other non um, uh, uh, disclosable items in the operating expense of, of the in, of the income statement. On the next slide, we look at the solvency situation of the ARC. Um, so in terms of the balance sheet, we've got total assets of uh, uh, just under 3 billion rand uh, and uh, liabilities non uh, current and current uh, totaling about 700 million which gives us a healthy net asset position of 2.2 billion um, and that translates into the surplus that we uh, realized last year so the net asset position went from just over 2 billion to over 2.2 billion for the year uh, the next slide uh, you will see the note on this one here that says that the cash uh, that we are holding, 480 million of it is uh, relating to a uh, conditional grant uh, with regards to CAPEX for the foot and mouth disease facility, 
uh, which uh, has been behind schedule for the last couple of years. We are at a point now where we expect accelerated expenditure for the 2022-23 year uh, going forward. Uh, as a result of that uh, uh, delay of the FMD facility uh, build, uh, means that our cash position for the end of the year, which you will see on the next slide, uh, was sitting at over uh, over 770 million. Uh, we were just a tad under 800 million on the cash position. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, CEO. Yeah, there we go. One up. Uh, that just shows the net cash position. So you'll see the closing cash balance uh, went up from 500 million uh, to just uh, over uh, 770 million. Um, and, and, and that just shows the capex number is also very low, uh, given the fact that a lot of our facilities uh, are aging. Uh, we, I did a tour with the CEO of all the Victoria campuses in the last month, and we're getting a constant uh, uh, claim from uh, the, the campus heads that uh, uh, other capex, apart from the FMD facility, uh, are not being spent, and we are intending to accelerate some of that as well uh, in the coming year. On the last slide, we're looking at the audit results. Um, and uh, as the CEO mentioned at the starting, uh, and, and I think the uh, deputy chair as well, that for a sixth year running, we've got uh, 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 an, a qualified audit opinion. There were three areas of qualification, the major one being property, plant, and equipment. And the major issue that the Auditor General had here was around certain portions of land, which the ARC uses, which were still registered in the and in, in the Department of Public Works, uh, uh, with the Department of Public Works, the transfers haven't been done. Uh, and this is obviously has been from the inception of the, of the ARC. Um, uh, so that was the major finding around property, plant and equipment to say that, you know, what we, we, what we put in our fixed assets register uh, were pieces of land that still belonged to the Department of Public Works. We're trying to regularize that. We did get uh, written confirmation from the department that uh, they acknowledge that it is our properties and, and for the use of the Agricultural Research Council. But we intend uh, just formalizing it. Uh, it is a bureaucratic process uh, with the department, but we are going through all the steps to try and ensure that that is uh, concluded before the end of the year. Other than that, on the property, plant and equipment, there were some issues around uh, some of the assets not being uh, tagged and, 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 and uh, not being able to be found by the Auditor General's um, office. We have embarked on a process of doing 100% verification of uh, our PPE. We enlisted the uh, assistance of an outside company to do that. That task was completed uh, at the end of last month. We are only doing all the financial reconciliations and the journal entries required to ensure that we have a, uh, um, a complete and verifiable uh, uh, fixed assets register. Uh, the second issue was around irregular expenditure. Uh, two issues around irregular expenditure. One was um, we were recording irregular expenditure on the purchase order amount where uh, irregular expenditure was discovered. And in some instances, that did not tie into the invoice amounts, which were in some cases lower. And the AG said that, you know, we were uh, incorrectly there, uh, recording irregular expenditure. Uh, so we are looking at our, the, the whole population of, of all the instances of irregular expenditure that was uh, recorded. And the second issue around the irregular expenditure was um, uh, a matter of interpretation as to who could condone it. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the ARC Act, the uh, accounting authority is the council, and uh, the CEO could not condone any irregular expenditure, and that was the, the issue that the AG picked up, uh, which we will also resolve uh, by the end of this month in terms of our audit improvement plan. Uh, the third issue went around contingent liabilities. So we did actually correctly disclose the contingent liability on, on one or two outstanding uh, legal matters, but the legal costs associated with it, we could not justify to the Auditor General how we arrived at those numbers. Uh, so this was not the, uh, a very material amount. It was about a 1.5 million rand um, uh, discrepancy that the AG uh, picked up uh, when they looked at the, the notes to the, to the financial statements. So it's not on the face of the balance sheet. It's a continuing liability note issue that the AG picked up. Uh, and this will be the easiest of the three to to sort of rectify. That also we've put the target date at the end of October. Uh, and just to uh, you know to satisfy all the colleagues around the table that we are paying a lot of attention to it. Um, the, the, the council onto under an audit improvement plan from management, which we have submitted to them, it has been approved, and we are tracking implementation of that to ensure we, we can get a, a, a clean audit come March uh, 2023. Thank you, CEO. Okay.
Thank you. Honorable members, <laughs> honorable members, thank you. Honorable members, here's the presentation. Can I now give two members to interact with this presentation? Uh, and just taken a lot of time. Honorable Sapper. Is Honorable Sapper still on the on the platform? No, she's not chairperson. Okay. Honorable Mpabamu. Thank you, Chairperson. You'll allow me not to put on my uh, video. Um, Chairperson, so, yes, my video. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Chairperson, um, my concern was around the qualified uh, report with material findings, um, and especially with um, non-compliance with legislation. I'd just like the uh, entity to maybe give us a bit more information in terms of uh, why was, was there uh, non-compliance with legislation as that seems to be really a, a thing of negligence rather than anything else. So I would like a, a better, um, uh, I would like a better explanation there. In terms of the qualification areas that increase from one to four, um, I am satisfied with the answer that they've given us. Um, and uh, we look forward to the next year where hopefully, or the end of this year, where hopefully all of these will be um, rectified. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes quickly. Um, chairperson, I think out of, oh yes, on the training of, um, they said the top 20 customers, they overachieved in terms of support to emerging farmers. I would just like to understand, is the ARC giving us certificates or in fact, it's not even about certificates. Are they, are they um, you know, sitting, making the farmers sit down and write some, some form of test in terms of their training so that when they give out the certificates, we know that there is a test behind the certificate and not just giving out certificates to say that uh, the people have, have been there, have, have, have conducted the training. Um, in terms of the staff complement, I see that they have a staff complement of 1969 against and approved of 2260. Are there any plans to actually fill these posts? And if so, by when do they think the, the, um, the uh, uh, post will be completed? And that is basically all from me, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nerep Mbabama. Nerep Masipa. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I just want to really emphasize the point that we need to really um, get enough time to indulge and engage the departments. Um, yeah, I think we, we really cannot afford to run this like we're running a funeral program. Uh, we, we definitely need time and the department, I mean, the institution, obviously, also, they want to also elaborate a little bit in terms of what they're doing. Chair, uh, my first uh, point of obviously that I just want to really get some clarity. I noted that um, obviously the CEO is new. Um, uh, the previous CEO contract ended July 2021 and the CFO resigned 28 February. And then we had obviously the um, uh, general executive. In, what is that? I think impact and uh, uh, I can't even read my own writing. But anyway, resign uh, January 2022. The HR marketing and legal services. There's been an acting some um, person there. Crop science. Uh, GE has been um, acting GE from 1st August to the 3rd um, December. Pua, uh, Dr. Fred Cortin has been acting, acting everywhere. Um, the question that I have got, I don't think that with this uh, particular executive management team we have been uh, given a picture of the current situation in terms of the senior management team 
if all positions are now really fully uh, occupied by permanent employees, if uh, um, the, the CEO can, and the chair can really um, update us in that regard. The other point, Chair, that the, <laughs> the ARC is raising is that their biggest risk is the inability of the ARC to meet its external revenue budget due to failure to create sufficient demand for its research and development um, professional services. So I just want to hear, you know, in terms of um, what, uh, what caused this kind, these problems of uh, inability to create the sufficient demand and what is that that they are doing to really address this particular problem. Uh, the ARC also indicates that they have got a commercialized um, uh, commercialization strategy. Uh, there are obviously, you know, the issue of farms in the hands of ARC, uh, which I will talk to when it comes to the audit uh, uh, findings. But uh, I think the question is, uh, can they share with us this commercialization strategy as to through which elements are they really going to ensure that this commercialization strategy assists the, this uh, ARC to, to become uh, more viable? Uh, as we know that uh, fiscus um, is not enough really to sustain it uh, much longer. Um, I really want to say we welcome the progress that has been made with regards to FMD facility. And uh, we are hoping that uh, we will see uh, some uh, good uh, attraction uh, happening. Uh, ARC talks about uh, concluding about 77% uh, of their research and development, uh, 400 and which constitute of 479. Um, science, um, uh, a scientific research uh, publication. What I am interested uh, in particular personally is the development of the post-harvest pre-treatment strategies for the management of stone fruit. I would really um, uh, request that if they can share with myself, obviously, we are in the Western Cape, um, we are 70% deciduous fruit industry. I would like to really uh, request the ARC to please share with me if there are colleagues that are interested as well, they can share, but myself in particular, I am interested in this particular study. Chair, earlier during the presentation of the OBP, I did pose a question with regards to the 49,890 vaccines that, are, that were produced by ARC uh, for OBP which are blood vaccines. And this question was not answered by OBP with regards to they, uh, I mean, what I, the question I asked was that the ARC is able to produce 49,890 blood vaccines. And obviously uh, the question was, uh, what is the quantity that OBP is able to produce on, a, on the blood vaccine side? I must also just um, reiterate this chair, if OBP is still on the platform, is that the freeze dryer talks to the bacteria vaccines, not the blood vaccine. So the freeze dryer's challenge um, uh, has been affecting obviously the bacteria vaccine. But the, the issues that we were finding or the concerns that were raised by the farmers were really more related to the blood vaccine. I haven't had any issue that was raised with regards to the uh, uh, blood vaccine. So. Maybe the question now back to ARC is that uh, what revenue is being generated out of these vaccines uh, in terms of their sales between themselves and OBP? Are they making any money? I know they, they have probably the royalty, but is there revenue that they are making out of these uh, vaccines? And if they can share that, uh, you know, the amount that they are making out of those uh, vaccines. Um, the audit opinion, obviously this has been coming, you know, for a number of years and we've been talking about it. And Chair, I can directly link this audit opinion, obviously with the staffing at uh, ARC, at senior management level. Uh, while I'm linking this to the um, uh, senior management level, the accounting and stuff, you know, that we don't have uh, the, uh, uh, the senior management uh, the positions filled. But I think it is very important, Chair, that the ARC share with us the 
report that they have produced and um, handed it over to the council that pertains to the properties, uh, sorry, not let me not say property, the land that is owned by the uh, by ARC as such. Because I, I, I'm asking this question and I think I asked yesterday to the Auditor General, uh, they said they did a sample of uh, properties in terms of valuation. Because I, I do think that there is a problem with regards to the land that is owned by ARC in terms of one, the valuation, uh, record keeping of this land, and obviously there are invasion and vandalisms that are taking place on this particular uh, properties that are owned by ARC. And I think that's the area that the ARC for me, uh, they need to really uh, call, uh, 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 area that they need to look at. Uh, they talk about the ARC indicate that there's a moratorium on vacancies and obviously the potential impact on the organization. Can you uh, please, uh, CEO, just clarify the potential impact in terms of this moratorium of the vacancies? I know that you, you did highlight that you are really focusing on ensuring that you you hitting high level uh, areas in terms of hiring the scientists and so forth. But uh, in terms of these vacancies that you're talking about, which ones are those and what impact are, the, are those impact? And how are you going to, to really address this particular impacts that you are talking about? ARC manage the animals recording and so forth. So yeah, I think this is very important with regards to um, the uh, what we are getting here, because one of the things that we are struggling here in this country is database of in the census of animals um uh, let me not say animals but uh, cattle and um, uh, college sheep and so forth that are owned by the rural communities uh, you rec you reckon here that arc manages the national animal recordings and improvement schemes and national animal database on behalf of the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. Can you assist us in terms of giving us the exact number in terms of what is the uh, number of livestock in the rural community, in the hands of the rural community or the black farmers and the states in the commercial uh, uh, farmers? Um, there is obviously one of your um, uh, area of, um, target is uh, producing new vaccine. If you can share with us as to how many vaccines you have managed to um, introduce in the previous years. Yeah, uh, that's it uh, for now, uh, Chair. I think I will uh, leave the rest for my colleagues uh, to pose further questions. Uh, the question, obviously, the big one is relating to the um, uh, the issue of the audit finding, because if I look at the land valuation according to your, your uh, report, the land valuation for last year was 651 and for this year 651 million. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, probably an area that uh, the ARC needs to zoom in and address it as urgently as possible. Thanks very much. Honorable Matthias, tell me Honorable Nubu. Is Honorable Matthias on the platform? He is on the platform, Jay. Honorable Matthias, over to you. Well, thanks, Honorable Chair. Look, uh, uh, as I indicated earlier, Honorable Chair, that I was traveling. I missed a lot, a, a, a greater part of the presentation. Uh, may I for a moment uh, hold back and listen to other members' inputs, and then at some point I'll come and make some contribution. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome, Honorable Matthias. Honorable Chuete. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> Actually, Honorable Nobo you left uh, nothing for us to say. You mentioned, uh, you 
questioned almost everything <laughs> that is there to question. Only a few questions that are left. Um, Chairperson, um, I'm really much uh, concerned about the audit, audit opinion of non-compliance with legislation. Uh, I'm very much concerned about that. Also, Chair, in the same breath, I find a big comfort uh, from the the, 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 the the remedial plan, I would say that the CFO presented to attend to this. Uh, Mr. McGinn, we will monitor that. We will monitor that you comply with the legislation and we will take you into account of this plan that you presented to us. Hence, I'm saying, Chair, I find a bit of comfort with that part of it. The, I would like to know, Chair, who ARC's training has been training students. Ingaba, do you have a placement strategy for those students trained by a ARC? And also, Chair, just one issue that has not been presented here. Can we get an update? What, how far? In fact, can we get an update on the status of EFMD facility, the current status of it? Um, I'm covered, Chair, about the concern that Honorable Nogo raised of um, an element of non stability. In, in management when, on the issue of e, 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 e posts that are not uh, permanently filled. Uh, I will park there for now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. So Honorable so this, presentation, this presentation must be removed, Chair. We're done and uh, we read the thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, let me congratulate you the, for being a chairperson once in your life, uh, leadership. Uh, hello, am I audible? You are audible. Uh, uh, proceed. Proceed. Yes. Yes. Chair, from the presentation of the ARC that I managed to read, that's where they are speaking of skills audit for land reform beneficiaries. I am not actually sure. I want to ask the ARC, what is the importance of that skills audit of land reform beneficiaries? Uh, and also to say, why are they not doing this skills audit prior to allocation of farms? So that uh, they are able to advise the department, especially in terms of allocating some of those farms or uh, something like that. The other thing, Chair, they mentioned mobile laboratories. Uh, I want to find out from the ARC, the mobile laboratories that they have, how many do they have? What are they servicing in this uh, current financial, the, 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 this report that they are reporting for? Uh, how has those mobile uh, laboratories assisted our farmers? Is there a breakdown that they're able to provide to us as the committee to say, this is the work that was done by mobile laboratories uh, that the ARC do actually have. Now, the other thing, Chair, is that uh, ARC used to implement a program called uh, Livestock Production and Development Program, where AIC would uh, sell cows uh, at very good uh, genetics that they will sell to emerging farmers for the emerging farmers to <coughs> sorry, sorry chair, for the emerging farmers to improve their livestock uh, which was actually part of the animal improvement livestock program that was implemented before i just want to know from the arc why are they no longer doing that because that program used to be very beneficial to farmers that find themselves in the communal spaces uh, where they get very good uh, genetics from ARC at a very, very good price. I want to know why have they discontinued that program 
is the possibility of them bringing back that program? What is it that they will need in order for that program to actually be resuscitated uh, to be in operation chair? And I'm raising this chair, looking at what was said by the AG where the, the ARC will find a, a qualified opinion on property, plant and equipment to say, do they have a record also of all the stock that is at, that ARC has in their different facilities? Do they know how many cows, how many bulls, how many whatever uh, livestock, if they have uh, goats or sheep that they are using for their own research? Do they know how many do they have in all their stations? And uh, some they, are they selling some of them? What revenue has that generated for the ARC chair? <clears throat> now, the other issue chair that I want to raise uh, with ARC is with regard to, hey, chair, I'm, I'm, I'm not fine, man. my flu is a bit, uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Outcome number five uh, of en enhanced resilience in agriculture where they speak of climate resilient solutions. And I wanted to say this, looking at the current climatic conditions where farmers are seriously affected, especially livestock farmers with regard to fell fires that continue to destroy grazing land. I want to find out from the ARC, have they not done some form of research on what is it that could be done for farmers to mitigate against the uh, the what these uh, wildfires that continue to destroy grazing land is there anything that <clears throat> is there anything that they are able to advise around that chair the last issue chair is uh, on the program uh, of kaunafatso yadi khomu where arc said they've assisted 7096 smallholder farmers uh, i want to know what programs were those smallholder farmers taken through? And our shame, they must not tell us of auctions, saying they ran an auction amounting to this amount and that because auction, you get stock that is already in the market. Our interest is that as part of the animal improvement program, the Kaunafato Yadi Komu program, how has the ARC contributed to assisting our people to improve their genetics. We took an oversight to the ARC <clears throat> in, a, in Pretoria chair, where they've got good facilities there. They can harvest semen themselves. They can store semen in some semen straws. Are they, have they not thought of getting some of those good genetics? They harvest the bulls. They have semen banks in their centers where farmers can go and access semen banks at a very reasonable price because you see white farmers going to an auction to buy a bull for one million and uh, they go harvest that bull where one kick of a bull would make about six to 70 straws of semen. Why is the ARC not looking into programs like that where through artificial insemination on small stock and large stock, they are able to contribute towards improving the genetics of our uh, uh, of, 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 of the livestock of our farmers. The last one, Chair, I'm not sure if it's on the ARC or on the NAMEC. There's one that they were speaking of a pilot program on the potato, planting of potato. You must not have several <laughs> last ones, Montredi. You must not have yeah, several no, last ones. Co continue. Yeah, you are a proper Chair. No, sorry, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the ARC or uh, it was a uh, NAMEC. But uh, on the pilot program on the planting of potatoes, how far are they? If it is the ARC, if it is not, they'll indicate the question will go then to NAMAC because I'm not really sure where was that thing located. With that, thank you very much, Chair. We uh, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, I've got a few things uh, to make a follow up on or to add uh, on what the Honorable Mbabama was talking about with regard to the issue of training. Uh, you know, as South Africa, we, we are talking about transforming education and training landscape. Now, the, 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 the ARC, they're talking about them training young people 
uh, in in the in 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 their in their in their company. I just wanted to check as to whether the developing quality learning and programs in, in collaboration, are they developing quality learning training programs in collaboration with any sitters that are there in the country? Is there a contact of learning in, in a sense of a analyst, analysis who learners are and the implications of learning programs? On the issue of education, is there any plan uh, that is there to make sure that they support those learners post-training. Uh, also, Chairperson, with regard to those training that they are doing, is the training those is the, tra the is those training accredited with any CETA for allowing those students who are go who are being given the training to can see greener pastures in other companies with a. Uh, Get, having those certificates from uh, from the from the, from the inti, the entity uh, chairperson they they, they 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 can help i'm just checking on my notes here some of them they get lost i just wanted also to check on the issue of uh, 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 CRC, arc taking into consideration the issue of uh, recognition of prayer learning on those that are getting training on their side, so that uh, we understand that there's the, the adults, there are some people, are, 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 there are adults that are learning. There, is there any fundamental components of the qualification uh, in, in that regards? Thank you. I think those are just few things that I wanted to add on the uh, member, on the issue of uh, what Honorable Mbaba has raised. Uh, she did put it well. I was just adding to just get some some more information. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Master. Honorable Priya. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, let me maybe start from the bottom going upwards um, and, and allude to what Honorable Masipa has said, notwithstanding the instability at executive management level, uh, the qualified audit opinion on the same issues of the past five years is quite a matter of concern and really needs attention. Um, and I'm hoping that we not see it as the ARC alluded to in March 2023 um, at that, at that um, audit. Um, but the ARC should explain what it is going to do about their regular expenditure worth 323 million rand, um, for which there was no consequence management. Um, if they can also then provide details of the irrecoverable debt um, of 19 million rand, that's that's a lot. And um, if they can maybe also, Chairperson, speaking to that, um, in cases where transgressions were caused by people that have since left the organization or the entity, um, is there a possibility that they can actually apply consequence management? Um, and can they recoup the monies? Um, we're relevant, of course, in such cases, if they can maybe speak to that, Chairperson. Um, then in terms of, if we go backwards, um, in terms of the, act, uh, the apps that they have developed, um, I think that is very interesting work. And I would like to know how, how that will be included in the Biodiversity Hub. They've, they've briefly alluded that they will be working to, with that, but I think we need to get concrete how they will be working with that and um, how they have marketed these apps. Um, and specifically, and I remember um, as I'm an iPhone user, um, it has come up continuously. Um, I want to find out if their apps are compliant with all, all make it, um, with all cell phone manufacturers, or if it is just those that have Android systems, um, if we can find that out. Then chairperson moving on, um, in terms of, and, and I hate to sound like a broken record, um, but it feels to me as if the entities, if OBP and ARC and, and um, Honorable Stain always used to mention this, um, we need to have a rethink of how these how these entities work because it feels to me as ARC presented that what they are doing and what OBP are doing is they are doing exactly the same. They're doing exactly the same research. Um, and the only problem is that they're working in silos and they're not seeing it. So, so I really need to, you know, I really need to get clarity. What is that? 
you know, what is the working conditions? Are they from the ARC side working with OBP? Is there a connectedness in terms of sharing of information or are we just, you know, going on on our own little Miss Whippy? Um, then, um, I think some, one of the other members did mention it, but farmers supported. Once again, we are saying as with OBP, farmers have been supported, yet we don't know how they were supported, what are the details thereof, and I would like to know, um, you know, what are the details and how are we measuring this? How do we say they are, how they are supported? What is the measurement of this? Do we sit them in a hall and give them a reading and then explain to it? So I would really like to know, I don't think I got that answer from the OBP. I would like to find out from OBP, how are they measuring farmers supported and what is the program of, of assisting them? Then chairperson, maybe, um, and I would like to, um, I think it was the deputy chairperson in his introductory remarks said, the private sector is encroaching in our space. And I almost wanted to say exactly, that's exactly what is happening, because it feels to me as if we've got this disjointedness, the private sector is not communicating with ARC, we aren't having this communication, and as he also initiated, and that is my fear, Chairperson, we are forcing um, the department to work with the ARC, and we're saying that this is the research arm and it should be perfect, but it doesn't help um, that we say this and we try and ensure that farmers and clients use the ARC, but the ARC is behind in terms of development, in terms of research, in terms of technology, as opposed to the private sector. And I would like to know how we are going to address that, how we are going to address the private sector encroaching on this space, and how are we going to ensure, and please excuse my Afrikaans once again, I think my English words are finished, Chairperson. Who can ons verseker that that ons toon aangevende lichaam bly. How will we ensure that the ARC is saying a state of the art, um, you know, council, we aren't just lagging behind all of a sudden and linking to that chairperson, and this will really be my last question, is when we were um, at oversight or on oversight at ARC, um, there was made mention that we have a lot of retiring researchers. I think if I remember briefly, um, about five of the more senior researchers are retiring within the next 12 months, which is a matter of great concern, which will not assist this encroaching private sector on the ARC and the ARC's terrain. How are we ensuring skills transfer? How are we ensuring that institutional knowledge is not going to be lost? And how are how is the ARC from its side? I remember us seeing a lot of interns, but as we all know, interns are temporary. How are we as or how is ARC ensuring that we are retaining youth? that we're getting youth in, we're retaining knowledge, and we're ensuring that when these um, scientists actually retire at the end of the year or within the next two years, we don't sit with a knowledge gap. Chairperson, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Priet. I've noticed that you have changed background. I don't see animals behind you. Uh, Honorable Masazi. Honorable Masatsi, is she on the platform? She tendered an apology, Chair. Oh, is it? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, let me take it back to, to you, Mr. Mapinga, to respond to the questions that have been put to you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Let uh, me just start the Deputy Chairperson just to respond to some of the issues that were okay. directed to myself. And All right. I'll, I'll respond to some of the issues that I can respond to that relates to the country and then uh, the CEO will come in. A chairperson, members have raised uh, the issue of non-compliance with legislation uh, as one of uh, the findings by the AG. And I think in, in short, the three areas that led to the qualification in overall, they are grouped together and then the AG will make a, a pronouncement that, that the qualification was because of non-compliance with legislation. So. There's no other specific issue except those issues that led to the qualification. So I think that is important for the, for the members to... Okay, then the second issue, the issue of the acting of in regard to management positions, I think it's about uh, the CEO will be able to respond to that. I think this council 
when the previous CEO left the organization, we initiated a process of appointing a new CEO, which we did. He has, he has started, and then he also you know, appointed the CFO. So the process that he is engaging in now is to look at the organization and decide what type of a structure will he be able to, to work with to do his job. So, you know, council has given him the space to decide on the team that the type of structure and then appoint a team that will work with him to, to execute his functions. So that matter is still with the CEO. I think, you know, council have done their job. The commercialization strategy uh, that has been raised by members, I think it will be shared with the, with the portfolio committee. But the most you know, important thing that we are looking at is to try and commercialize our IP by creating an agency that will be responsible for actually uh, ensuring that in, in, we can bring in venture capital and ensure that in, you know, our research is being taken out there and then is able to be to be operationalized in a way by the, you know, the practical outcomes will be able to come out and then we can then be paid for the IP. So it's a process that in, in, we are currently engaging with. First, we'll want to, to brief the executive authority around the issue of that, you know, the creation of the agency because, you know, national treasury have to give a go ahead, you know, ahead to, to ourselves. So we are busy with that. And then on the issue of the FMD facility chairperson, we have uh, you know, appointed the, the professional services, all the consultants that are supposed to assist us. Uh, you know, it took some time to finalize their contracts. It, it took about three months because we're trying to avoid some of uh, the, the pitfalls that uh, I think the OBP has had. Uh, they've already explained that in, they're engaged in, in the cancellation of the contract. So we try to ensure that those contracts that will be signing with our service providers the professional service providers, the engineers, the electrical engineers, the architectures, the process engineers, it's about six companies, actually about five or six companies that they've been appointed, they're watertight and to ensure that they do what they're supposed to do. And in relation to the issue of the private sector, you know, encroaching on our space, I think we, uh, you know, the ARC for many years have actually you know, the stakeholders, uh, the, the growers, um, the farmers and the associations have been actually moving away from the ARC due to the issue of the working relationship between themselves and the hierarchy of the ARC. So this council is working very hard to, to manage the stakeholder relations to ensure that in, we again put the ARC, you know, in front of the stakeholders as a collaborative institutions and institutions that is able to still provide the service that our our growers, our farmers, our, our you know our associations are looking for. So in essence, there's a lot of work that has been done, and also the issue of uh, the investment in the new technologies is something that we're looking at to ensure that in, in, we attract also the, the best skills that are available in the industry. And um, the CEO can can come in and and answer some of the, the remaining questions. Thanks, Chair. Oh, over to you, CEO. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Chair of the Portfolio Committee. Um, <clears throat> they, they, we have a number of questions and I'm going to request my colleagues uh, who are on the call to take some of uh, the specific ones. Uh, for instance, we have questions around uh, blood vaccines, the animal recording scheme, um, and uh, also just vaccines that have been introduced over the years, um, including access to genetic material um, um, for uh, developing farmers in general, uh, emerging farmers in general, as well as within the KYD. So I'm going to first ask uh, uh, if Dr. Magadela, you can tackle those questions and then, um, uh, and then I'm going to ask the CFO to just come in uh, again to talk about uh, the audit improvement plan, uh, which uh, I believe we have uh, shared, but maybe there is a little bit more that we can add in that regard, uh, particularly um, in the area of property. And then if there are any other 
uh, elements that are left, I'm going to come at the end because there is some uh, information that I will talk to around capacity development, how we work with the agricultural sector, et cetera. So let's start with you, Dr. Magadu. Dr. Mokal, hello, over to you. Yes, yes, um, Chairperson of the committee and uh, um, the honorable members, thank you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, we've got several questions about um, livestock. Um, someone asked how many um, blood vaccines um were supplied to OBP and um I can say that um normally we supply in the region of about 65 um thousand doses to OBP. How do we arrive at the figure? Normally we sit down with our OBP colleagues and then they tell us what their needs are uh, in terms of the blood vaccines that we use for um, um, controlling um, heart water, red water and cold sickness. Uh, normally we get together, we agree on a figure and then we supply um, those vaccines to our OPP colleagues. Um, certainly, OPP colleagues and ourselves do sit down to talk about all sorts of things together. We talk about um, FMD issues. We talk about um, how we can assist each other in terms of um, research backstop or research support and all of that, there is usually a, a, a no overlap of duties. We produce the blood vaccines and hand them over to the OVP and then OVP uh, process them further and, and, and bottles them and all of that. So there's usually no overlap of responsibilities in that regard. And um, as I said, we produced in the region of about 65,000 uh, doses last year, and we collected nearly 4 million um, rands from OBP for those vaccines. Um, someone, I think it was Honorable Masipa, asked how many um, blood vaccine doses have we handed over to the OBP thus far? Um, we've handed over to them um, 21,840 doses of blood vaccines this year. That happened mostly in the in the first quarter. Um, oh, okay. Then the, 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 the is the issue of um, the ARC uh, having stopped to um, provide genetic material um, to farmers. That has not stopped. Uh, we still provide genetic material to smallholder farmers, uh, but what happens is that it depends on the funding that we get. Uh, because um, um, the honorable members will appreciate that uh, these things do cost and um, um, we provide what we can provide even very good technologies em embryo transfers and and all of those things we do provide not just artificial insemination but it depends on the amount of money that we have and then in, in, in collaboration with uh, um, um, the provincial departments of agriculture, we work out a program, we've got to agree on the breed that's got to be supplied uh, to the smallholder farmer to bring up um, the, 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 the way 
the animals look, that is to improve uh, the genetic makeup of the livestock in the villages. But once again, this is also um, something that we don't always get in agreement about. Some farmers, some farmers are going to swear by a um, a particular breed, and another lot of farmers swear by another particular breed. But um, um, usually, when farmers do come to us and 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 um, tell us they need, we do we do assist in whatever manner that we can. And then there was a question of what is it that kind of what you are the homo. Uh, does for the farmers. Uh, each and every farmer that we um, reach out to or that we claim um, to be um, um, a member of the kind of what's the homo scheme is conductable. Uh, obviously, we, we've got some limitations in terms of uh, what we can provide publicly um, um, by way of their uh, um, um, identity details but certainly each and every one of them. And all of these things are audited, uh, not only by our internal audit people, but they are audited by the um, external audit. So there is no thumb sucking here at all. I can, I can guarantee the honorable members that each and every one of these farmers that we claim to have reached out to, we, we do reach out to. In as far as what we do, uh, for the farmers um, under uh, uh, the auspices of our KYT program, um, we don't really have what is called a, a one size uh, fits all um, 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 service um, offerings arrangement. Each and every farmer um, has got uh, their own needs. Normally we go uh, in there and have some bit of uh, um, 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 discussion and engagement with the farmer to know exactly what it is that they want. And then we try to provide um, the, 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 the services that will talk to the needs. For an instance, we're gonna get to a particular household and then we find out that they are keeping uh, more oxen than what we call productive animals. And then we talk on what the composition of the head should be for the animals to build up. And then we also help the farmers uh, um, to um, know what to feed the animals, uh, what to vaccinate, with and when to vaccinate, and all of those things. And we also uh, um, help the farmers to know when it is that they are supposed to uh, allow the bulls to get to the cows or the other way around, all such things we talk about. We um, assist them in terms of what, um, how, how can they improve the chances of getting their cattle marketed and, 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 and the cattle attracting uh, the highest prices. So usually there is some, anima, some farmers want to know how to um, castrate animals. Some farmers want to know how to brand animals uh, and all of that. So it normally differs from farmer to hum, farmer, um, but uh, pretty much we, we have a, a, a whole suite of, of, of services that we can provide uh, um, 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 to the farmers. And then usually it's not a, 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 a um, um, an arrangement where we just go there once, we form a relationship with the farmers and then we, we come back to them every now and then to make sure that uh, things are still going according to our okay, and I beg your pardon. And you that. And you that. Okay. Okay, okay, both up. Please continue. And, uh, and the farmers, the farmers uh, um, then when there is a problem that comes up, um, not always reported, but we get calls from farmers about all sorts of problems that they have. And then we send somebody out to assist. Uh, they don't have to follow our strict program, but our doors are wide open. And our telephone lines um, um, are always operational. 
including mine, including the CEOs. They are go to the ARC website. My telephone number is there. I get pharma, calls from farmers uh, 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 every day of the week, uh, any time of the night. And sometimes people that want to take dogs overseas because um, the rabies certificates have not come true and all of that. So normally we don't work in eight to five uh, um, um, arrangement. We we take we take queries and requests from farmers twenty four seven, and um, um, not just me. All of us do that. Um, let me see the current status. Or oh, I think I think the, the vice chairperson of the board has already um, referred to that one. Uh, uh, we're asked if we we we, we know um, what livestock we've got where and all of that. I can guarantee it. We we know what livestock we have where. Uh, we have um, 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 a pretty good record system, and then we also sell livestock from um, um, at auctions. And then remember, our livestock has got has got. Uh, um, uh, brands that are registered, and then we also have to make sure that if there's an animal that is born, it is it is recorded. If, it, if there's an animal that dies, it is recorded. So our livestock re record keeping is usually pretty good. Um, then the, another member asked about uh, um, what can be done to stop fell fires. Not a very easy question to ask to answer, but usually what happens with with fell fires is that something that we do as well. Uh, we make what is called power uh, um, 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 this thing fire breaks uh, without fail at the end of winter, about Ju July, August. We need to make sure that there are fire breaks. One way we make sure that uh, it doesn't matter where a, a fire starts but chances of it causing uh, a tremendous amount of damage on our land is reduced. But sometimes uh, fires do jump fire breaks. They don't always do that. Uh, any other way, it's very, very difficult to stop people throwing cigarette butts out of the windows. And then another way to do it was to try and keep the grasses down uh, next to the roads and, 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 uh, and next to the farms and all of that. But um, uh, I'm not sure if we are conducting, I don't think at least in animal sciences, we're not conducting any any research that tries to stop uh, uh, the, these, these incidents of, of, of fell fires. I, we're not doing that, but what we do uh, once again is to make sure that we have fire breaks uh, to make sure that the chances of, of fire reaching our uh, grazing spaces uh, are reduced. And um, training. Uh, um, uh, I think it was Honorable Masipa asking how 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 many how many um um cattle we have in the country. Uh, um, we have in the region of 14 million um, um, cattle in the region, the bulk of which um, uh, are, are, beef, are beef cattle, probably uh, about 12 million would be beef cattle, uh, and, then, and then the rest being dairy cattle. And then in terms of their distribution between, between, um, between um, smallholder farmers and commercial farmers, uh, uh, I often say it's very close to 50-50. Um, some people will tell you that 60% of the cattle are in the hands of, of the commercial sector and 40% are in the, of the, uh, in the hands of the smallholder farmers. I think it's a little better than that. For me, it's, uh, it's more like a, a 50 Five, uh, 45 situation, they are closer than 60, 60, 40, in my opinion. So I think, I think, I think um, we, we're looking at 
at uh, um, somewhere about seven, seven and a half million in the in the hands of the commercial sector, and then close to about um, seven million in the whole in the in the hands of the on, of the um, uh, a smallholder sector. Again, it's it's extremely difficult to have accurate uh, uh, livestock numbers. Now that now the idea of having dipping tanks and regular dippings is no longer um, 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 practiced religiously, but the numbers are sitting around 14 million, somewhere around there. Um, then there's something about 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 uh, uh, um, land reform beneficiaries and skills audit. I'm not really sure if I'm the right person to 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 handle it. Um, CEO, I think I have addressed um, the questions that I have jotted down. I came from the honourable members. If there's uh, anything that has fallen through the cracks, I'm more than happy to um, to address it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Dr. Magadlela. CFO, can you take a minute uh, to touch on a couple of uh, questions you have picked? Uh, thank you, CEO. Uh, I think on the on the initial question around the non-compliance of legislation, uh, the deputy chair did. Uh, allude to it to say that uh, in the conclusion of the AG's report in the last uh, sentences, they make the comment that uh, uh, the qualification is based on that. So I think it goes to basically PFMA when it talks about, you know, you've got to keep uh, complete records uh, and, 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 and the like. So it, it wasn't specifically to any one of the findings, but it was just it was an overall statement made by the, by the AG. With regards to the, the particular questions asked, um, on the land and buildings, we, we normally record land at historical uh, cost. And that's why the amount of 615 million in the 2021 financial year hasn't shifted. And there was no acquisition or disposal of land parcels during the year uh, under review. Uh, that was one of the questions being raised to say, why was there no movement in, 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 in uh, the, the land portion uh, on, on the disclosure of our property, plant and equipment. Uh, with regards to, uh, 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 what the external service provider is doing. They're doing a verification process. Um, they haven't been asked to do a valuation. That was done a couple of years back. Uh, but if we can have completeness in the in the fixed assets register, we can always assign a value to it. But since, uh, you know, the uh, council will not be disposing of land, uh, we don't want to incur cost in valuing that land unless we want to uh, talk about uh, either, uh, you know, renting it out at commercial value or disposing of land because uh, valuation, land valuation is, is a bit of a costly exercise. Uh, there was uh, other questions around uh, consequence management for the irregular expenditure and the quantum of the irregular expenditure that was raised. The 320 million um, uh, committee members should just bear in mind that that was an accumulation of all uh, irregular expenditure not condoned from the 2016 financial year onwards. So it is not as though all that, all that irregular expenditure um, was uh, was a result of transactions that occurred in 2021, 22 financial year only. Uh, because until the point when irregular expenditure is condoned, uh, it is regarded as irregular expenditure. And that is why the quantum looks uh, such a big amount because it's accumulated over the last six financial years. With regards to consequence management, uh, finance works closely with, uh, with internal audit when uh, an instance of irregular expenditure is, is, is detected. And uh, then an assessment is made to see whether that resulted in financial loss or not. Um, in, in many instances, uh, you know, officials sometimes don't get three quotations, but get two quotations, and, and then they go for the, the cheapest one. So uh, the, the, the council did get value for money. We do that assessment first uh, to see whether value for money was received. And if, if that's the case, then obviously um, the consequence management will mean that the uh, the, the, the official will have to go through a disciplinary for, for reprimand and, and the like. In instances where officials have already resigned and no uh, criminal uh, activity you know, was, 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 was detected, then obviously we, we do not take it further because uh, if, if there is a criminal element to it, we've obviously got to report it to the law enforcement agencies and, and continue with, with consequence management post the exit of the person from the, from the organization. But in instances where 
there was no, there was no uh, uh, where, where there was value for money. In that instance, then uh, basically there's no further uh, consequence management if someone has left the organization. Uh, so just bear in mind that the 320 million is, is built up over many years. With regards to the all outstanding debt, uh, a large portion of it uh, was actually with, with our, our shareholder department and a, a, a bit of that has been resolved. Uh, at our latest meeting with the DG of the department some three weeks ago, we resolved that uh, myself together with the CFO uh, at Delred will, uh, will uh, uh, endeavor to, 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 to you know, find an amicable solution because there are instances where the department is saying that we cannot prove uh, the delivery had taken place. So we are busy looking at that there. Um, so of the, of the 20 million that's sitting in, in long, uh, all outstanding debt, um, the bulk of it is uh, on two or three different accounts uh, with either the, uh, the uh, national department uh, and in one instance uh, for two provincial departments. And some of that debt has been collected uh, subsequent to, to the year end. Uh, 19 million is, is obviously a material number and we want to resolve the issue as soon as possible. Uh, CEO, I think that's what uh, the, the, the issues were raised around the property uh, valuation, consequence management, irregular expenditure, and bad debts. Thank you very much, CFO, and uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, and thank you, uh, Deputy Chairperson. I think uh, from your contribution and uh, Dr. McArdell and CFO, a number of questions um, have been covered, and I will try and just uh, quickly close the gaps. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, acknowledge uh, the concerns raised by the members around uh, the uh, negative audit outcomes. And <clears throat> indeed, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, audit improvement plan that is in place, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, giving it um, <clears throat> uh, sufficient attention in order to turn it around so that we can have an improved uh, uh, audit outcome at the end of the current period. Uh, and um, I can share with the members of this committee that that's also um, um, being taken quite seriously by the council, uh, where we have been asked uh, to go beyond uh, the monthly reporting, which is accompanied by uh, assurance by internal audit, but to have an interim report every second week uh, that, that demonstrates how we are progressing in terms of implementing uh, the audit improvement plan. The other thing I would like to share with the members of the committee, um, and, and it came from a number of the uh, uh, members, uh, and I think uh, Honorable Masipa and Honorable Mbapama talked about it as well, uh, around the concerns around uh, what would seem to be um, uh, instability at management level. And I think Deputy Chair touched on it to say the CEO uh, is now expected to uh, to uh, develop uh, a structure or that shows how uh, the organization uh, should uh, function to achieve its objective. What I would like to share also is that uh, we have just completed a very important exercise for the ARC, uh, the institutional review process, which is conducted once every five years. It's a legislated process, and it looks at a number of things. And for uh, what we've just done, um, it, it considered the mandate of the ARC, the science part of the ARC, whether it's delivering on that, and of course the governance issues. And we have a set of recommendations, including how we can um, uh, structure the organization in order to be more efficient, in order to be uh, effective in delivering its mandate. And we are taking some of those recommendations and working around them in order to develop a, a structure that's going to assist us uh, to deliver on the objectives. I think um, uh, very briefly on the other uh, questions that were raised, um, I noted Honorable Marshall and Mbabama uh, around capacity development and pharma training. And uh, I think one of the questions was whether uh, we work with any of the accreditation bodies. Indeed, we work closely with Accrecita and some of our training programs are accredited by um, Accrecita. Um, what I can also share is that we, we have um, uh, two levels uh, of, uh, of uh, two levels of uh, recognizing training or um, certificates um, where we, we pro provide uh, certificates of attendance, but we also uh, have a competency uh, related kind of uh, certification where 
members uh, or participants rather would have to demonstrate uh, that um, they have the sufficient competence in terms of the material uh, that was being shared with them. I think Honorable Muntwedi was asking if we are doing all this work in terms of the skills audit with the department, et cetera, why is it not done uh, prior to allocation, which is a, a very good point. And we believe that's where uh, this is going. At this stage, uh, we were uh, brought in uh, and we are collaborating with our colleagues at NAMC uh, to, to conduct this work, but we ex expect that it's going to feed uh, into um, into a, a process that allows a prior uh, exercise to be taken before allocation. Uh, because I think this was one of the key recommendations also from the exercise that was done by the Presidential Land Reform, uh, um, Land Reform Advisory Panel. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, Honorable Brett, uh, you uh, talked about uh, raised a concern about uh, retiring um, you know, senior professionals. And, and, and that is indeed a very valid concern. Um, and that's why um, you know, we, we think uh, there is a strong uh, case for strengthening our succession planning at the ARC. Um, at the end of uh, somebody's long career that's been built over many decades with networks, with, uh, uh, at a professional level and, and everything that comes with it, uh, and we know, for instance, in other countries that people would actually own laboratories and people would be going for the individual, not even the institution. And even grants and funding would actually follow an individual. Uh, it, it is very important that this is something that we think about long before we get to the retirement age. And therefore we have to build in each and every one of our critical roles, a very clear plan for succession because at the end of 12 uh, or 12 months before somebody retires, uh, you can't say I'm going to bring in young people to work with them uh, because that's too late at that stage. They will never get to a level. And, and, and not uh, that we expect that somebody would, um, you know, would uh, also become, um, you know, or get to the level of a, a senior world-renowned scientist uh, uh, within, um, within even a period of four or five years because uh, that's something that takes time. But we have to begin to create that environment so that they can build the momentum uh, during that, uh, that period. I think Honorable Brett also talked about our involvement in the biosecurity hub. Uh, this is um, a very much a, a coordination exercise as you can imagine. Um, uh, and and for, for me, it is where the concept of One Health has become very appropriate. Uh, in other words, recognizing that uh, plant, animal, uh, human health, and, and their environment uh, is indeed uh, something that should be considered together rather than uh, separately. And biosecurity is indeed a collaborative effort. And, <clears throat> and that's why uh, we think as the ARC, uh, we are really uh, uniquely positioned uh, to contribute through our national uh, uh, public goods assets program uh, with all our national collections uh, which puts us in a unique position to contribute to the biosecurity hub uh, because it, it allows us to, uh, you know, to uh, provide all the information that has been collected over many, many years uh, to understanding uh, the, the threats of pests and diseases and assist others uh, who do not have uh, the, the collections or access to the, to the collections um, uh, that, that we have. So we think that this is going to be uh, an excellent opportunity to use some of the funding that is being made available uh, by both the uh, Department of Science and Innovation and, and Agriculture uh, in order to support uh, these kind of initiatives. Um, just uh, to conclude, Chairperson, I can uh, indicate that we have noted uh, the request uh, by Honorable Masipa on, uh, of a copy of the study um, uh, on uh, stone fruit, uh, and as well as a request uh, to have a view on some of the uh, ARC property portfolio uh, by the committee. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks a lot, Mr. Honorable Members. Uh, ARC, you will forgive us for wherever we refer to you as Mr. 
whereas I know that there are a lot of doctors in that institution. Thank you very much. Honorable members, I think we have covered now, we are done with ARC. Any other questions that may not be fully uh, answered now may be raised in a way that they can be uh, answered in a written form because we definitely need to proceed. With your permission, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair and all your personnel. Let us now proceed to Namak. National Cultural Marketing Council, can you come in? Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. My name is Angelo Peterson. I'm the uh, Chairperson of the National Agricultural Marketing Council. And with me is my Deputy Chairperson, Ms. Dandeka Nachangase. And I've also got the CEO, Sampiwe Natongweni, with his team in attendance. Thank you for the opportunity to present our annual report to you and the performance over the past year. We came in as a new council last year and we found a very unsettled organization at the time with an outgoing uh, CEO and board and staff leaving with numerous legacy issues that we as the new board had to deal with. So certainly a very tumultuous time at that stage. Um, I'm happy to report that the new board has settled in very well. The board uh, shows good skills. It is diverse in terms of both uh, race and gender with a very good uh, balance in terms of augmenting capabilities. Um, obviously, uh, the role of the council is to provide oversight and guide management in terms of executing the strategy of, of council. Um, the role of council briefly, um, as you would um, um, understand, is to make sure um, that the agricultural uh, uh, marketing um, is uh, focused on uh, statutory levies. It is to provide uh, the minister with advice in terms of agricultural policy. And as such, we obviously uh, conduct uh, research. Uh, we also do or undertake specific uh, projects at the request of the minister or our department in terms of um, making sure that uh, uh, we inform the minister so that appropriate agricultural policy can be made, in, particularly in the current global uh, environment. Uh, so chair, this stage, uh, I'm going to hand over to the CEO um, to obviously do his uh, presentation, and uh, we will obviously take any questions thereafter. Over to you, Sampiwe. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and honorable members. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair Pesson. Uh, the honorable chair of the portfolio committee and the honorable members, um, and the other entities, uh, the leadership uh, that is represented here, uh, DG as well as colleagues. Um, I have just requested uh, for some rights to share the, the presentation. I see that I'm not, I've not been locate, allocated the rights yet. However, I can, I can proceed in the interest of time. I think the honorable members have the presentation uh, with, with them and they have had a chance to, to go through it. Uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, I, I don't take too much time, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, probably 15 minutes uh, of my 20 minutes that I'm allocated. Um, I what, think the, the Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. I'm just asking the time to release ARC. They are asking to be released. They are released. Thank you. Let's proceed. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, another option uh, could be that uh, one of the secretary Sorry, chair. colleagues. Sorry, yes. Chair. Yes. Can we ask Mr. Making to relinquish the host rights before he leaves the platform? 
and give it to Albertina. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr. Mukinga, are you there? Mukinga. But he's still on the platform. Mr. Mukinga? Maybe, can you, can you call him to do that? Because yes, I'm right. still on the platform, Chair. I'm, I'm going to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about that. You can proceed, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I think the presentation, uh, as soon as I get the rights to share, I will share it, but I will go through it uh, from my uh, screen here, uh, just in the interest of time. Um, Chair, I, will, uh, I, I have the uh, CFO with me who will do the, uh, who will cover the financials towards the end. I'll, I'll do most of the presentation. Perhaps I, I will start with a summary, uh, Chairperson, in terms of the outcomes uh, of of the, the financial year's uh, performance. Uh, we received an unqualified audit on both financials as well as uh, performance information. In terms of financials, uh, the unqualified finding, uh, unqualified audit had findings. Um, and in terms of the performance information, there were no findings. So we had a clean audit there, uh, which chair we, we, we appreciate as, a, as an improvement from the past financial year. And therefore, we are we are indeed making progress towards making sure that uh, our governance uh, is uh, is uh, is proper uh, as we move forward. Once again, we we thank the the support and the oversight of of the council uh, in this regard. Um, maybe just to uh, uh, take one minute to to say, in terms of our mandate, I think it's important to to give the context that uh, the marketing of agricultural products act gives us uh, a mandate to advise the minister uh, on, on, on issues of agricultural marketing, specifically uh, to basically take care of, of the minister's interests uh, with regards to the regulatory functions uh, within the sector, such as uh, the, um, the promulgation of statutory measures, which include uh, collection of levies, which get uh, used towards the investment in, in essential services within the sector, such as research and development, consumer uh, education, um, uh, market development, and so on. But then there is also a specific requirement that 20% of that funding needs to go to transformation. And so our role is to, is to monitor that, that, that funding and that expenditure uh, is used uh, within those guidelines. Um, and, and as NAMC, we set those guidelines that the industries uh, that collect levies should follow. We also uh, take care uh, from the regulatory point of view of the affairs uh, or monitor the affairs of the agricultural industry trusts, which are entities that were created when the assets of the former control boards were, were wound uh, down uh, and they were transferred into trusts. And we monitor the affairs of those trusts on behalf of the minister and, and to make sure that uh, the proceeds of those trusts are used towards uh, transformation uh, within the sector. And then thirdly, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, as the, as the Chair has mentioned, we play a very big role in, uh, in, in, in uh, conducting markets and economic research, uh, which uh, gets used uh, in terms of advising the Minister on, uh, on, on agricultural markets, both local and, and international. Uh, just the last point I want to make around the mandate is that the, I think the key word is, is advisory, uh, Chair. And um, we are very limited in terms of practical implementation of projects as we do not have a dedicated budget uh, for, for such. It's only in cases when the minister asks us specifically uh, to undertake uh, certain special projects uh, on her behalf, which are within our mandate uh, in terms of agricultural marketing. Um, and usually there are funds that are allocated specifically for those. Then ex the example that uh, the honorable members may be, may be familiar with is the National Red Meat Development Program which basically affords uh, uh, opportunities for communal livestock farmers to commercialize their heads. And, and uh, this program has done very well. Uh, and uh, in spite of some challenges that we have experienced recently, we, there is, the future is that it will be integrated uh, with some of the programs within the livestock sector, for example, from the ARC and the other entities uh, into a consolidated program 
which will be um, part of the implementation of the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. Just want to check whether the, the rights have been allocated. Yeah, uh, let me just put up the presentation. Albertin? Uh, the Honorable Chair, is, is the presentation uh, visible? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, moving on from the mandate, uh, those are our, our council members currently. Um, it's, it's supposed to be 10 members, but there's currently a vacancy which uh, uh, our shareholder department is working to, to fill. Let me, let me get right into the outcomes or into the performance uh, entity over the financial year. In terms of the overall achievement of targets, uh, uh, in terms of uh, program one, two, and three, uh, program one and two, we have had challenges in terms of achieving all our targets. Um, and uh, I will explain now in terms of what are some of the, the constraints that we have faced. Otherwise, all our targets have been met and in some cases they have been uh, exceeded. Let me go program by program. In terms of program one, uh, most of our targets have been met and uh, in some cases uh, uh, exceeded. For example, in terms of procurement from local suppliers, uh, we had a target of 70. And we were able to, to make sure that 95% of all our procurement comes from local suppliers. Uh, we, we had challenges in terms of procuring from uh, women uh, suppliers as well as uh, youth and, and, and persons with disabilities. And uh, uh, this is a, a challenge we, we, we keep uh, running up against where we, um, when we have to procure services, we, we struggle to, to locate these businesses from designated groups. However, uh, we are uh, doing our best to ensure that we, uh, we, we up our outreach activities to these designated groups. In terms of uh, the... The slides are not moving. Are you moving up? The slides are not moving, Chairperson. They're, they're standing on, on the first, uh, first slide of the presentation. They're not moving on the screen. Okay, let me see if I can quickly fix that. I think you need um, to put it on presentation mode. Is it on presentation mode now? No. You've got to make it bigger if I'm not mistaken. Yes, let, me, let me quickly reshare. You just get out and then reshare. Window. Just one second, uh, share. That should that should solve the problem now. Uh, the niche mode is it? Uh, are the slides moving now? At least, yes. at least, I hope they are moving. Um, I'm going to move a bit quick. Um, as I indicated, we we had an unqualified audit, and and all of our other uh, targets under Program One have been uh, have been met, except in in the case of the issue with the designated uh, groups. Uh, I've already covered this slide in terms of the explanation around the the variances. Uh, in terms of uh, achieving the targets under program one. Let me move on to our HR uh, uh, outlook from the past financial year. We've had quite a number of uh, uh, new appointments. Uh, notable of those is the CFO uh, who started uh, around September last year. Um, and uh, in terms of our turnover rate, we are currently sitting at uh, employee turnover rate at 14%. Uh, we, we are trying to manage this uh, to make sure that it doesn't climb. In terms of training and development, we uh, spent an amount of 2.5 million over the past uh, year uh, on, on training, uh, bursaries, uh, internship and graduate placement. We are uh, getting funding from AgriCita to be able to implement some of these training programs internally. In terms of employee wellness, we, uh, especially in, in the face of COVID, we have been able to put a structure in place or structures in place to ensure that we adhere to the regulations applicable under COVID. And 
and uh, we're able to minimize uh, the percentage of, of employees that were uh, affected uh, by COVID, um, uh, only at, at, at 2%. Let me move on to program two, uh, which is uh, has to do with the creation of uh, enabling and marketing policy in the statutory environment in line with our mandate. We were able to achieve all of our targets except uh, the one case that I had indicated earlier, where um, we had estimated that uh, at the beginning of the financial year, we will be able to receive uh, uh, 30 applications for statutory uh, levies or measures. And this is based on, on an average from the past financial years. However, this year happened to be a different year and, and we were not able to receive enough applications as, as, as uh, originally uh, anticipated. However, uh, this is really not under our control and going forward, the, the crafting of this target has been slightly changed so that we, uh, we are able to uh, report on something that we have full control of. Uh, in terms of the rest of our targets, we have managed to, to meet them. Um, part of uh, uh, th this program is the, the, the monitoring of statutory measures, as I indicated earlier. We currently have about uh, 20 um, entities that collect levies. Um, and uh, we have reported a figure of uh, uh, 808 million uh, from the collection of the levies from the past financial year. This figure has gone up from 735 from the last year, from the, from the previous year, which is a 10% increase. Um, this is important in the sense that the, the, the port that goes into uh, supporting um, services that makes the sector competitive, such as research and development and so on, it means that that port is increasing. Uh, but also the port that goes into supporting transformation is also uh, increasing. As I indicated earlier, 20% of this figure must go towards supporting transformation projects. So it's, it, it was uh, encouraging to see the increase there. In terms of agricultural trusts, uh, there's 11 trusts uh, currently, and those are the, the total asset values. Once again, that value has increased from, from the prior financial year, from 2.2 billion to 2.4, which is about uh, roughly 9% increase. Uh, once again, the, the proceeds from these, uh, from the trust, just the interest part of it uh, gets used towards funding uh, uh, services within the, the industries or within the sector, but also uh, it, it, a big part of it goes towards transformation. Those are some of the transformation activities that we were able to uh, summarize it, uh, coming from the different trusts. Uh, I'm not going to go into, into that, but it's mostly training and also enterprise development activities. And then from the research side, we continue to produce uh, regular reports that uh, uh, for, the, for the information of the minister uh, to assist in policy making. We, uh, for example, we're able to cover topics such as the impact of, the, of, the, um, of COVID but also some of the shocks that we've experienced within the economy uh, brought about by, uh, for example, the riots as well as the flooding. But uh, recently, the, the issue of the, uh, the war, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. So these are some of the topical issues that we cover in these publications uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, policy advisory. This is all our, our research activities. Uh, do and then let me jump to program three here we basically uh, the focus is on supporting especially uh, emerging farmers to access markets as i indicated earlier uh, the budget for for this activity is very limited um, however we do we, are, we, we still manage to, to set targets uh, for each financial year at this stage we are only able to to support 80 farmers every year uh, to access markets uh, this activity we do in partnership with, uh, with other stakeholders, central uh, being the provincial departments of agriculture, uh, who uh, assist in making sure that when markets are identified and, and the quantity and quality requirements have been, uh, have been supplied to, to, the, to the farmers, that the, the provincial departments help to, to make sure that those uh, quality and quantity 
uh, requirements are met together with uh, the private sector uh, partners. Uh, 80 was the target the, the, this past financial year. We were able to, to exceed that target and, and we were able to support 141 farmers. Honorable Chair, we have details of, of those with, uh, in terms of the location, the location and the, the, the gender uh, and, uh, and age distribution and so on, and the various markets that were supplied. And, and those details appear in the, in, the, in the detailed annual report. I'm not gonna go through those, those are the details. Uh, Chair, uh, in the interest of time, I would like to ask uh, the CFO to just take us through the financials. Ms. Montato. Okay, thanks. Thanks, CEO. Uh, with regard to the financials, I'll just take the members through the performance in terms of the, the past financial year as compared to the previous financial year. Uh, with regard to, to the post essay, NMC SA Schedule 3A public entity, we are fully dependent on the grant. We do get some uh, revenue from our interest and from other projects that uh, we normally uh, handle as, as a principal and some of its agents. However, the income, the grant for, for the previous financial year was 47.3 million. We can see that there was just about a 0.2% drop from the previous financial year, which was 47.4. And to the interest from our bank, because we, we didn't really have enough revenue as compared with the previous financial year, there was also about 2% decrease as compared to previous financial year. The other one is the sponsorship received. This was say the project, so that we, funds that we received from the project. And we do receive also the management fee from those projects. There was a huge a, a, a decrease a, from 27.3 to 4.9 million in the current financial year that we are reporting on. It's mainly because in the previous financial year, there were new projects that we, we came with the, with the funding of about 20 million, which didn't really happen in the current financial year. So that, that's more on the revenue side. And with regard to the expenditure also, Overall, there was a decline because of the reasons that I've just mentioned, because we didn't really have a much, reven much revenue as compared with the previous financial year. And uh, the, the, the surplus uh, for, for the year also dropped drastically. Uh, we, we had a surplus of 24,000 in the current financial year, as opposed to 2.3 million in the, in the previous financial year. However, that is good because it shows that we've managed to spend what we, we, we budgeted to spend during the year. And uh, on the financial position, which is the balance sheet, we can see that uh, also our assets uh, decreased. This is mainly for uh, depreciation as we didn't really acquire a lot of, of assets in the, in the new financial year. The non-current assets likely remained the same uh, as compared with the previous financial year. Though there were movements, but they were very minimal. The, our liability, which is mainly majority of our current liability is the, the deferred income that I've just alluded to with regard to the projects that we handle also decreased uh, from uh, 52 million to 42.4 million. And um, the main item that has, it's something that we are working on is the fruitless, wasteful and irregular expenditure. We've also seen a decline from the previous financial year. We only had a 6 million a irregular expenditure in the current financial year as compared to 30.2 million. The overall irregular expenditure, I mean, both irregular and fruitless and wasteful is 160. 161.9 million, uh, which is what we are working on currently to try and uh, get this condoned and uh, consequence management addressed. Overall, as the CEO mentioned, we've received unqualified audit with findings and clean report on predetermined objective. You can move to the next slide. 
uh, this this slides just compare to, just uh, compares our performance with regard to how we uh, how we did when compared comparing with the budget. So overall, we, as we can, as I've already reported that uh, we we only got a surplus of twenty four thousand. Overall, our spending went well during the year, as you can see with the movement between the actual and, and the budget. I'll move from this slide for, for the sake of time. Uh, those are the, the, the reasons mainly for, 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 for spending on the income and sponsorship received. I've already alluded to this one, that the variance of 2.9 is related to the amount that we've received and to utilize for sponsorship projects as well as the management fee. With regard to the interest is, is mainly from the interested bank. Like I've already mentioned that we didn't really receive much of a, 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 a income from projects and to the, the grant also remained the same. So we only received a slight increase of 1.2 million. On the personnel expenditure, we had a, an unfavorable variance of 5.7 million. This was mainly with regard to the salaries for interns, which uh, cause we get the grant from the agricita. We don't really put a budget for that until the, all the contractual obligations have been finalized. And uh, the admin expenses, we've got a favorable balance, mainly due to some savings because of uh, as a result of COVID, we know that uh, some of our staff are work, uh, working from home. And uh, operating expenses also, it shows the unfavorable balance. This is mainly due to we had to move offices, uh, uh, but within the same building. Thank you. We can move to the next slide. So this is uh, also, uh, just the detail of what I have presented on with regard to our financial position. I won't really go through the details, the, the reasons that I've already alluded to are covered. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson and Honorable Members. Thank you, CFO. Just in conclusion, uh, I think going forward, uh, most of the work that we'll be doing uh, will be aligned with the agriculture and agroprocessing master plan uh, in two ways. Uh, the first way is that, or the first uh, way that we're involved is that we, we have been uh, given a, uh, we have signed an SLA with the department to assist in the uh, monitoring of the implementation of this plan and also to put a monitoring and evaluation uh, framework for, for the implementation of this, of this uh, plan. And secondly, uh, we obviously will be uh, contributing in terms of our regular programs to make sure that uh, our programs are aligned with the objectives of the, of, the, of the master plan. And key to this will be collaborations as the CEO of the ARC mentioned, uh, some of the projects that we're collaborating on. Uh, uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. We, we will uh, be happy to take questions, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Honorable members, here's the presentation. Let me give the chance for members to interact with this presentation. And let's start. Is Honorable Chape, is she back? Yes, Chair, thanks. I just came running. Let me catch my breath. Okay. okay. I just joined. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, can I give someone for, 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 for a minute? Can I go to Honorable Babama while you are still taking your breath, Honorable Clapper? I think that's what she said, Chair. Okay, carry on. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to commend the NAMC um, as compared to other entities, it is really a pleasure to listen to them. They seem to have um, got on quite well with, their, with the work that they are supposed to be doing. Um, and I see that they got an unqualified opinion with findings, which is uh, the findings are basically the same as last year. So, um, and um, I am satisfied with the explanations that have been given. 
And then there are just two things that I would like to query. And I think it's more ignorance on my side than anything else. Um, that's pro, under program two, sponsorship received and other income. Uh, the CFO uh, showed us that there was a drastic decrease um, from an income of 27 million last year to 4.9 million. And she said it is projects and management fees from those projects. Apparently they had a lot of new projects last year. I would just like her to explain a bit more about that. Um, I don't quite understand why you would have a lot of projects in the previous year and not in this year. Maybe it's just me and, and not having a background, uh, uh, you know, a detailed background on the kind of work that you do. So I just needed to explain, or maybe the CEO can explain, why have a lot of projects that bring in so much income in one year and not, you know, uh, uh, not do the same again for next year so that you get the income. Uh, I think there's something that I'm missing there, if you can just explain that to me. And then in terms of uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditure and irregular expenditure, I did go out for a, a, a loo break. And I think I must have missed any explanation that the CEO gave us in terms of uh, consequence management. Um, I'm not sure if he gave us uh, the, the detail in terms of any consequence management that has been done in terms of um, any people concerned, staff members concerned around that. Uh, Chair, as I said, it was a pleasure listening to this presentation and I only have those two questions. Thank you. I hope Metlap has caught her breath. Let me give you another <laughs> few minutes. Honorable Masipa. <laughs> Thank you, Chile. I thought I was going to be allowed to also take a breath. <laughs> you want a Chair, breath also? Thank you. I want that, Emerson. No, I'm fine. I'm fine, Chair. Chair, I must say, really, um, uh, thank you to the uh, presenters. Um, but also, I must really commend the annual report. It's very, really nice to, to read, uh, well uh, put together. Um, and also a compliment to them for achieving unqualified uh, audit as well. Chair, the uh, NMC obviously, you know, has got agricultural trust and um, uh, fulfill also statutory uh, role in terms of really ensuring that um, um, the sector is um, compliant um, with regards to marketing of the agricultural products. One of, uh, I think APEC, obviously, I don't know if he's going to present, but APEC play that role. Um, and they obviously oversee APEC. So the, the concern that I'm having, uh, Chair, is the situation with regards to the markets, Jubek market, Pretoria market, and uh, obviously, you know, some of the issues that are being raised by some of the smallholder farmers in terms of accessing um, those markets and uh, some of the red tapes and some of the issues that they are really finding in those markets. Uh, the question really is um, to the NAMC, um, are they getting uh, closer to those issues? Um, are they doing something about these uh, issues that are being raised at the market? Um, uh, I don't have really a specific one that I can give now, but the issue is that there are some scrupulous activities that are happening at the market. Um, and uh, obviously they need to be taken care of. And that's the first uh, point. The second one is obviously on the issues of funds being collected and uh, uh, they have increased their funding uh, with 9% in terms of collecting the levy. Now, uh, if I look at the, uh, the annual report, obviously Citrus and others, you know, play quite a significant role in terms of the contribution of these levies. Uh, what is the uh, anticipation in terms of this year having had so much disruption with regards to the export of products um, as a result of war in Ukraine and uh, obviously the issue of the ports that
that affected farmers or exporters, you know, to export uh, uh, the their products. So I think the question is, uh, what does what are the estimates in terms of the collection of these levies from the industry going forward in this coming year? You also indicated that the trust, um, in terms of uh, the this agricultural trust values in terms of assets is about 2.4 billion. What are these assets? Are these biological assets or are these uh, buildings? Um, can you assist in terms of explaining these assets? The other point that I just want some clarity on is with regards to a statutory levy. You, you talk about the 100 and, uh, 47 million that was obviously collected from for, for levy. Oh, sorry, let me just rephrase this. So in terms of your um, statutory levy, you, you need 20% before you provide the um, commodity group with the levy. 20% must be um, towards the transformation. I think really key the question is around this twenty uh, percent. You talk about statutory measures survey. Approximately twenty one percent was spent on transformation. Do you uh, survey or do you have a contractual obligation between yourself and the commodity group in terms of the spending? Is is that supposed to be surveyed to ensure that it has really been spent, or is it an obligatory that the commodity group needs to um, uh, ensure that the 20% is spent on transformation. I just want to uh, just get clarity here. Why do you need to do survey? Is it uh, just choosing a few sample and then just checking if they have uh, done exactly what uh, was needed? Uh, on the master plan, as the minister has contracted you or has requested you to conduct a master plan, for the uh, agriculture. The question really is with regards to your uh, indication that you will be putting an implementation plan. What is the progress with regards to this implementation plan of this master plan? And uh, also in the last engagement with ourselves, you did uh, indicate that there is a budget prioritization uh, uh, that is going to support this implementation plan. We haven't really seen that budget reprioritization. Can you just maybe um, give us an indication as to where the progress is with regards to budget prioritization? Um, one uh, more point is with regards to levy expenditure. I note that you spent 38% on research and 21% obviously on transformation and 8.7% on export promotion. Isn't it maybe high time that we relook at this because you know with the challenges that we are facing and you know uh, uh, you colleagues that citrus is uh, expected to increase by more than 30% and we do not have capacity as a country to consume all the citrus uh, in South Africa. So the question is, don't you think that it's high time that we probably, you know, you assist in terms of increasing this budget to support the export promotion, especially around the citrus, as you know that Europe is making it very difficult for us. And obviously we've got black spot as well, uh, that obviously make the matters worse. Uh, that's uh, the last one. I note the, Cirrus abattoir, 2.1 million. Can you um, just maybe uh, assist in explaining uh, what is this uh, Cirrus abattoir, it's 2 million about? I know that there is um, a project of Cirrus abattoir that the uh, department really spent money, uh, which became wasteful expenditure. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, on the, the very last, last, last one. Uh, with regards to fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Uh, there was obviously, you know, concern with regards to some of these uh, things in the previous year. Can you just update us with regards to those irregular expenditures that were not condoned by uh, National Treasury as to 
what really happened um, in in terms of this. Are they? Uh, is that? Uh, I think it's about 80 million. Is it part of this 155 irregular? I mean, sort of fruitless and wasteful expenditure. But thanks, Chair. That's all from my side. Thank you, Honorable Nuku. And uh, Honorable Sape, if you are ready, can you come in now? Thank you, Chair. Chair, let me join my colleagues also in uh, commending and appreciating the improvement uh, within this entity. We also, Chair, would like to note and comment remarkably so the reduction of irregular expenditure from 32 million to 6 million. I think NAMAC is, in the, is on the right track in this regard. Chair, I will have um, just about three issues maybe. One is uh, on program two, the entity could not um, achieve the target. And uh, there is an indication there on the presentation that uh, it is difficult to predict in advance the number of applications to be received in an annual basis. They targeted 30 and uh, received only 25 late. They are not even spread aco uh, across the quarters. What is the entity going to do with this um, target moving forward based on the challenge that they have indicated here? Is it a realistic uh, kind of a, a target and how are they gonna do moving forward on this one? The other issue chair that I have noticed is the they are shortcoming in terms of procurement from designated groups, your youth, women, people living with disabilities. Can they just clarify what are the challenges of uh, NAMAC in this regard? Because I think this is a cross-cutting kind of uh, target, a, an issue that needs to be implemented what is it that is difficult for them, making it difficult to procure from designated groups? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Club. Honorable Mintwedi? Are you still around? Honorable Mintwedi? Doesn't seem to be here. Honorable Marshal. Uh, I'm here, Chairperson. Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, I will also follow what my colleagues have, uh, have said that uh, we commend the good work for this NTT. Uh, Chair, I will also indeed uh, wanted to understand just one or two things here. Uh, yes, we have been informed that uh, NAMAC, his own mandate is, 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 is to make sure that they report to the minister. And have, have they ever informed, I just wanted to know when they report to the minister, have they ever informed the minister about the smallholder farmers that are from rural areas who are not being recognized at the market level due to their quality products? And there, is there any assistance to those smallholders farmers which is given by them uh, from this entity? According to my, my analysis, uh, honorable chairperson, most of those uh, uh, smallholder farmers, like cooperatives, SMMEs, are struggling to enter the market due to quality uh, management system in those uh, areas of work, where you find that they, 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 they don't have correct policies to follow when they do their work. They don't even have uh, correct policies to deal with some of the things that they must take to market. They can't even manage to, to, to get the SABS uh, 
qualification because they don't have a system that we we think they they can get. I think if these people in rural areas with those uh, uh, in those small farms. If they are assisted, the, the economy of our country can go up because we can see all of us that South Africa is in, in trouble with, with, with regard to the issue of employment. And these people, they can make a lot of employment in rural areas. How do they assist them as they advise the minister with regard to this issue? How do they deal with it? pertaining to the, the, the struggling of those uh, 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 smallholder farmers. And lastly, Chair, I had in one of the slides, though I didn't mark the slide number, they said they've assisted 141, uh, which are supported. And they also mentioned that they have already, there is a list that they can give it to us. Can we, uh, Chairperson ask, ask them to submit this uh, list uh, within week, seven working days so that as the portfolio committee, we could have time to go and do oversight when we decide to go and do oversight outside there to see their work as they presented to us. Yes, indeed, we commend you, you have done a good work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Marshall. Honorable Priet. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I think my colleagues did a sufficient job, so I would just have um, just four points that I would like to make. Um, the first one is, and I think Honorable Masipa spoke to it with regard to our citrus industry. Um, I think it is very important that NAMA can maybe say, um, in terms of the issues we have experienced with exports, in terms of marketing of our, our citrus, um, are they involved? How are they involved? And how do they envision or see their involvement going forward? Um, in terms of that. Then in terms of farmer support, um, I think we have quite gotten an understanding of how they do support, but I want to find out, is it a one-time occurrence um, or do they long-term assist with market access or is it in terms of, and, and this might be my ignorance as well, or would that then be, would it just open the door for them to then have these farmers to have contracts um, with these specific markets if we can just get clarity on that. Thirdly, Chairperson, in terms of, of NAMAC mentioned that they, um, they write reports for the department to advise on policy matters um, and that they mentioned COVID-19, they mentioned the floods in KZN. Um, do they take other departments in the work other departments do into account? And is their focus specifically on agriculture or what is the, the um, um, how, how would we put it? I hope you understand. Um, what is the, the, at the end, the end goal of these reports? What do they take into account and do they focus just on specific aspects, the economy or agriculture, or is it a broader policy, policy framework in terms of that? Um, and then lastly, chairperson, and also specifically taking into account other departments, I'm thinking of DTI, for example, doing a lot on, you know, on the economy, um, a lot of our training institutions as well, who have done a lot of work, environmental affairs that have done a lot on climate change. So if we can just get clarity on that. And then lastly, Chairperson, um, in terms of, um, they spoke of research and development that they also do. And I would like to find out um, in terms in terms of that support and that research and development, what is their relationship with OBP and ARC in terms of that? Do they work together? Um, what is what is that what what does that look like? And chairperson, I will just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Priet. Uh, is Honorable Matthias back? If not, Honorable Members, I think there's one left from the members to have their questions and input. Can I now give over to Namak? Over to you, Thank Chair. You. Over to you, Chair. Yeah, I'm going to ask the CEO and the CFO to answer um, and clarify the questions, and then I will close off. Thank you. Sampiwe, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I will ask the CFO to just get ready to answer the, the questions around uh, the sponsorship received and, and the movement from last year to this year, and also the issue of uh, the irregular fruitless and wasteful expenditure, the 
the progress on consequence management. And, and also, I think there was an, another, the issue around what, what, what process are we following around the condonement and, and why was, uh, why, why did we previously not get the irregular expenditure condoned? What were the reasons and what are we doing about it going forward? Uh, just want to check uh, the other one. I think, I think that those were the finance uh, and, and audit related questions with uh, which the CFO will handle. But let me uh, just uh, go through the list of questions uh, that have been put forward and then uh, CFO will, will cover the finance questions. From Honorable Babama, um, the, the, the question around, I think CFO will cover the issue around sponsorship and any regular expenditure and Honorable Masipa around the issue of trusts and statutory measures and, and the fact that we we play a regulatory role there on behalf of the minister and uh, you raised the, the issue around APEC being the body that uh, uh, plays in the fresh produce market space. Yes, that's indeed true. That, that That's the main body that plays in that space as regulated by, uh, by the, uh, the APEC Act. Um, in terms of our specific role, um, that we are playing in that space. We have had uh, some engagements with APEC as well as some of the, uh, the, lead, uh, the leadership of the, the markets, given the fact that the, the challenges that uh, these markets uh, are going through are, are very well known and um, there has been a concern around uh, uh, the deterioration of infrastructure, for example, and, and those issues. However, we, we do not really have a direct mandate in that, in that space. However, our, our role has purely been only from, a, a, again, an advisory point of view. We, we, we had a study that, was, that we undertook uh, internally to look at uh, the status of these markets, issues of management control, issues of uh, transformation and the participation, especially of black agents, as well as uh, access for smallholder farmers. And that report uh, has been discussed with uh, the the leadership of uh, uh, specifically the Joburg market, uh, the biggest market uh, in, in the country. And, uh, and secondly, we've also engaged with uh, APEC in terms of making sure that uh, as they regulate the, the affairs of the, of the agents, that there is space created for, for black agents to also participate, which was one of the findings of, of the study, that there's very little participation from, uh, for, for black agents, uh, which could uh, if, 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 so, if sorted out, could open also an opportunity for emerging farmers uh, to, to participate and, and have access to those markets. So in, in a nutshell, uh, Honorable Masipa, we, we have a very limited role because we, it, it's not directly within our, uh, our mandate. Uh, in terms of the increase in, in levy collection and, and the fact that, uh, that there have been challenges uh, uh, this year and, and what are we anticipating in terms of the collection rate going forward, I think, um, we do, although we would not have the, the figures, um, specifically because we didn't undertake a specific uh, uh, forecasting exercise, however, we do anticipate that there may be uh, the revenues or the collection may be put under pressure due to the challenges that Honorable uh, Masipa has, has indicated with all the global uh, factors that, that uh, global economic situation that we, we, we are going through in terms of uh, uh, which affect the, the cost of production for farmers and so on. Um, because the collection is based on the revenue uh, at, the, at the point of sale, if the revenue is not or is under pressure, then it means the levies uh, collected will also be under pressure. So we anticipate that there may be uh, uh, challenges there. However, we, we, we do not know to what extent that would be. The, the trusts, what, 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 are, what are these trusts? Uh, well, it's various uh, categories of, 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 uh, of assets uh, uh, that these trusts hold. Um, there's, uh, there's property, and, and, but most of the, of, the, of the assets are in the form of uh, investments that, are, uh, that are, uh, have been taken up with the, with the with financial markets. Um, so, uh, but a lot of these other trusts also have buildings, uh, warehouses, and, and so on from the previous control boards. Um, uh, but the majority of the of the value uh, is, is is from 
investments in, in, uh, in financial markets. 21 20% uh, spent on transformation, is it obligatory? And, and, and what, what, how do we uh, monitor that? Uh, yes, it is, it is obligatory in the sense that we have agreed with the, with the trust, uh, sorry, with the, with the bodies that collect levies, that uh, we will put uh, guidelines in place for them uh, to make sure that the, the expenditure goes into certain categories, and, and one of those being the 20% that needs to go to transformation. So uh, it has been uh, accepted widely uh, by all of the, these bodies that uh, it's an obligation. And that, that, that puts forward also as a condition for, uh, as part of, as one of the conditions when they apply, that upfront they commit to spend 20% of whatever they collect on transformation. Uh, so that, that's basically how we, we handle that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that obligation with them. In terms of the master plan, uh, what is the progress on the implementation plan and also the, the issue of budget reprioritization. Um, at Chapesson, we, we are now making very big strides uh, as the as, as NMC uh, following uh, some a series of uh, engagements with the DG's office. Uh, and, and we have now been given a very clear direction uh, and the mandate to, to carry on uh, putting together the implementation plan. We, we now have come up with a roadmap uh, that will see us uh, presenting a plan to the EXCO of, the, of Dalrad in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, we anticipate that uh, by the time that the next financial year starts, there will be a comprehensive implementation plan as well as a, a, a budget. And I think uh, if DG is, 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 is on, the, on the platform, he can also expand on especially the issue of the budgeting for the master plan. Uh, uh, DG, if you don't mind, uh, through your chair, uh, if you could expand on, on that one. Um, in terms of uh, an opportunity to look at increasing the budget for export promotion uh, because of the, 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 the challenges in terms of uh, global market access, indeed, uh, th that we agree with, with, with that. However, I think th the space is quite limited in terms of the, the levies, uh, the, the levy uh, income. Um, the, 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 in terms of our guidelines, we, we, we have a certain percentage that, that needs to go towards that. However, um, we, the industries, when they apply, they also put up front what they, they, would, they would put forward for, for export promotion. Uh, but because of the, the, the limited port within the levy system, one can only do, you know, do, do very little. I think what has been discussed uh, uh, recently with in the process of the crafting of the master plan is that there needs to be a more deliberate effort in, in matching the government funding uh, to support uh, these kind of activities such as export promotion and matching that with the private sector funding, some of which come from the, from the levy, uh, levy collection. So the approach in the implementation of the master plan is that there will be a much more uh, closer collaboration and uh, between and coordination of the funding between private sector and and, and, and government in, in, in that respect. That also includes issues of transformation, uh, that, that there should be better collaboration, just to, to increase that, 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 that pie. The Ceres Abattoir, this is a very old uh, project. Uh, I think the balance that is being reflected there is, uh, is, is what we've been trying to uh, engage with the department which had, had funded this project uh, to basically say that this is a balance after the, uh, the specific activities that we were assigned in this project have been completed, which was basically to ensure that uh, the, the abattoir uh, is able to uh, secure markets for, for the throughput. And, and, and I think uh, to also put together an institutional, institutional arrangement and we have since exited that program and, and I understand that there, there have now been uh, challenges recently there. However, this is just the balance from the, the work that we did uh, for the department, which was very specific at the time. Uh, program two, the, the target not having been achieved, uh, Honorable uh, Kape, uh, with regards to statutory measures and what's, what's the way forward. Uh, because, uh, we have found that, uh, and it has become obvious that we can never really control 
what applications are being received um, from the industries, even though we do have figures for, from the first, past few years in terms of the average. We, we have decided that rather than tracking the number of applications, we will uh, refocus that target to look at uh, whether all the applications received have been processed successfully, ending up in, in the promulgation of, of a levy or a statutory measure. And, and that's how we have, uh, we have changed that target slightly in order to make sure that it is uh, achievable and we are in full control of it. I will ask uh, CFO just to deal with the question around the designated groups. Uh, uh, Chairperson, and then Honorable Marshall, reg regarding the, the issue of uh, smallholders not accessing market due to quality uh, issues, it is a very big uh, challenge, uh, Chair, and, and I had indicated earlier that uh, the budget that we have is very limited to be able to, to cover the whole spectrum uh, and, and to be able to make significant inroads uh, towards this challenge. That's why we, our approach is to work in partnership with uh, stakeholders uh, to ensure that those that uh, we are able to assist uh, are able to uh, get access into sustainable markets. They're able to uh, be in a position to meet those requirements and that their contracts that they sign with the buyers uh, are long-term contracts. And I think this also deals with the question that Honorable Briad had or around whether this is just a once-off or, or these contracts are sustainable or long-term. So that's the approach that, that we are taking. Uh, however, we are not the only ones responsible for this big uh, mandate of, uh, of linking smallholder farmers to markets. The, the provincial departments are doing work around there. And when we do find opportunities to collaborate, we, we do that. Um, the, have we, and, and this is an issue that the minister is aware of in terms of, as we engage with her on a regular basis. We will indeed be able to provide the list of farmers uh, who, who we, have, uh, we have supported this year in terms of market access. We will uh, send the report as uh, it has been requested. Uh, it's got all the details. Um, I, I, I think there was a question, a few, a few questions from Honorable Briet. Uh, in terms of, I think you mentioned specifically the citrus industry and the challenges that they are going through. Um, I, I had uh, intensive uh, engagements with the CEO of CGA, um, especially during the heat of the, of the issue and the dispute with Spain. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that issue, uh, he shared with me that they're dealing with it uh, under the, uh, the WTO rules, and, 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 and I believe there's been some progress made on that. However, we're not really directly involved uh, in that, but uh, in terms of our advisory uh, responsibility to the shareholder, we take note of those issues and we, we raise them with the minister uh, when, whenever uh, there's an issue that minister has to uh, take note of. However, I think the, there are structures in place to deal with, with, with these kind of challenges. And I think the CGA, for example, has followed those, those processes. Uh, in terms of market access, I think I've uh, answered the question of whether it's a once-off or it's, it's a sustainable uh, support. The end goal of research projects. Um, yeah, I think uh, we, we, the end goal of the research projects is that we, we take te the technical reports themselves and distill them and, and, and take out key policy messages. And, and these are, are shared with the minister on a, on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, for example, one of the reports that we produce uh, is, is that on a monthly basis is the supply and demand estimates uh, within the grain industry. The end goal there is to ensure that uh, we, we are still having enough supplies and, 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 and enough stock of the various grains uh, on a monthly basis. So we monitor it on a monthly basis and we send the report to the minister. That's just an example of, of how some of these reports, they don't just uh, remain uh, in the shelf. Uh, they, they, they get uh, converted into policy advice uh, uh, to, uh, to the minister. Uh, and, and lastly, a chair from my side, before I give over to the CFO, is the relationship with the ARC and OBP. Of course, the, the different entities have different uh, uh, and specific mandates. 
Um, there are areas of overlap uh, in some cases. For example, in the case of ARC and OPP, we um, are in the process of uh, uh, finalizing a, uh, a, a, an SLA with the department, uh, which is uh, going to culminate in a joint project uh, in, in the livestock sector, which is basically an, an amalgamation of the national red meat project that we have been managing in the past together with the Ghana Fatsu at home that ARC is doing, then the OBP will, will come in on the, on the issues of vaccines to support uh, th this program. Again, uh, th this is uh, what the master plan advocates for, which is collaboration between the various entities on, 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 on projects to make sure that the, uh, the resources are used in a, uh, in a coordinated manner and, and there's a much better outcomes uh, and impact. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. And I would like to ask uh, CFO just to respond to those uh, other questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, CEO, and uh, honourable members. Uh, the question with regard to the decline on uh, the, the the funds from projects, it's mainly because in the previous financial year, the we, we, we received about uh, 20 million for, for, for NMC to, to manage this, the master plan project. So that was the once off fee that we received and that covers the, 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 the project for the duration of the project. However, I think other details are in the, in the contract itself. So that made, I mean, we didn't receive those funds in the financial year that we are reporting. Hence, there is that huge a, a decline in, a, in the sponsorship projects. And the other thing, yes, we do have other smaller projects that uh, we do get funds uh, almost each and every year, like from Agricita for, for the cassava projects. So those ones we do receive as and when they, they are request as a contract with those, uh, with those uh, organizations. So that's mainly the reason for, 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 for the decline. There will be a year that we will get more funds a year where we don't, but it doesn't mean that maybe we are not really working on the project. The funds are there, they are uh, sitting in a bank account, if, for example, with the master plan because the project is still ongoing. And uh, with regard to the question on, on irregular expenditure regarding a, a consequence management, Yes, the uh, Treasury didn't uh, uh, approve our request to condone this, and uh, they requested uh, us to work on the consequence management. Uh, because of the volume, I've already reported that currently uh, uh, irregular and uh, fruitless, it's combined, it's sitting at 161 million. We have got the, the we have a service provider who's currently assisting us in looking at that because to, for us to get to, to the consequence, we have to do the determination test and identify whether there was a, 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 a no value for money and all other requirements as per irregular expenditure framework. So that's the project that uh, the, the consultant is currently working on. We do believe that uh, before the end of the financial year that we are in now, we would have uh, 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 solved this and also uh, written to treasury where we need condonement. But currently the project is underway and uh, we, they, are, they will be presenting the progress report also to the council. And um, with regard to yeah, the process of condonement, I, I have covered that. What are we doing? The plan basically, yes, we, we are trying to ensure that uh, we follow the framework that the people are identified, but uh, it, it's a legacy issue also. And most of the, the, the personnel are also, they have left the organization. However, I think for now we will wait for the outcome of the report that the service provider is assisting us. And uh, once that's done, where there is a need for, for, for organization to take uh, other steps that will be done. And we are hoping that uh, we, we will not have this happening again. And uh, with regard to, 
the decline in, 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 pro, in procurement from other designated groups. This one is it's mainly um, our budget on uh, operational, it's, it's very small and so hence our procurement also. So for the procurement that we undertook during the year, we didn't really get a, a lot of, a, of suppliers or service provider from those particular groups. Yes, there were a, a percentage that we have achieved, but with regard to what we have said to achieve as an institution, we didn't meet. And it's mainly because, uh, yeah, it's whatever that we procured for during the year, we couldn't find uh, some of the, the services we require from those designated groups. That's, that's the only reason. However, I think as the CEO mentioned, we, we've really achieved in trying to procure from, from the local suppliers. Thank you. Thank you, CFO. Um, I'm going to give back to our chairperson to conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simpiwe, and to the CFO. Uh, honorable chairperson and members, um, we are steadily making progress at the NMC. Um, and in terms of the um, findings, we've already worked that into our audit plan for this year uh, to make sure that uh, the issues that we need to address um, are addressed in a, a way that they won't uh, reoccur. Um, and as council, we, we are focused on that. Um, just um, a comment on, on export promotion. Obviously, the NAMC works with industry bodies that's funded through the levy system. And those industry bodies are also responsible to a large extent uh, for driving export promotion and market access for their particular commodities with the Department of Agriculture. Um, but where uh, I think we need to look at better collab collaboration is between the Department of Trade and Industry um, and the industry bodies um, to better fund pavilions, um, you know, for um, our growers to go to particularly uh, black emerging growers in terms of uh, fruit logistica, et cetera. Um, I think that's, that's an area that uh, we need to look at uh, collaborating. Um, thank you very much for the, for the feedback members. Um, obviously we will make focus, remain focused on, on ensuring that, that, we improve, that we improve on our performance. Thank you, honorable chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable members, here we are now. We have uh, uh, lost a lot of time. I would like to suggest that uh, we take a few minutes break from now until 14 hours when Honorable Sapa will have will be a chair, but let me hear from members because we only have this time now bef before 14 hours. Is that okay? How many do we have to do, Chair? Ngonyama Trust and what? Chairperson? Hello. Chair is already on break. Yeah, I see but, that. <laughs> I, I, I know we haven't done Ngonyama Trust. Then that there are four. It's King Ngonyama Trust Link. PPECB oh, oh. OVG Savak. Oh, OK. OK, yeah. thanks. So I think, think the break is fine. Okay. All right, two or three. Okay. Hello. 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 Hello.
break for now. And as we come back at 14 hours, that time, Honorable Sapo will be chairing. Is that okay with you, Honorable Members? And I say, and I also ask that. Uh,
our session for the day. We continuing with the briefing on the 2021-2022 annual reports. Let's uh, then invite at this point PPECB. Good afternoon, Chairperson and honorable members of the Portfolio Committee. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present our annual report. I'm going to call on our Chief Operations Officer, Cyril Julius, and our CFO, Johan Schwabs, to do the presentation for us. Um, Cyril is standing in for our C CEO, who's currently on leave. So over to you, Cyril. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Members of the Port Portfolio Committee, DJ Dalarat Exco, uh, CEOs and colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to account um, and give uh, also account how we used to apply our funds. <clears throat> um, just going to share the screen. <clears throat> Can anyone see? Everyone see? Yes, sir. Thank you. We see yes. it. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. So, Chairperson, this is our this is our board. Uh, Ten members. Um, half of them are finishing up. Um, next month in November, um, and part of that is also DJ, and also Mr. Clark Garrett, our current person, is also finishing up. So, and we would like to thank them for the support and direction they've given to PPCB over the past six years. So, there's currently a process underway within Dalarat to, to replace these five members that are, are finishing up. Our main uh, mandate is to, to export inspections uh, and calls and services to the industry on behalf of Dalarat. So this year we have inspected, for the year under review, we've inspected 172 million cartons of citrus, which is a 15% increase from the previous year. And as we have heard earlier in the day that uh, this figure will keep on increasing. And the categories that are, that are huge in growth is soft citrus and also lemons. Last year we had 43 interceptions of uh, citrus black spot in the EU. Uh, this year the tally is, is at 18 uh, as of this morning. Uh, FCM for squatting moth, uh, that was the big problem with the EU this year. It was last year 16, and the, the count for this year is at two. So, and we hope that it will stay at two. So, despite all the, the problems with the ports uh, last year, we, we, we managed to, to, to ship uh, 172 million cartons of citrus. Uh, table grapes uh, also had a difficult season last year, um, but um, 69 million cartons were, were inspected and exported, which was a 6%. Uh, increase on, on the previous year. Uh, it did, because of the longer supply chains last year, it did cause some uh, table grape uh, um, uh, quality problems in the markets, and we hope that uh, this year it will go better. And we hope that the strike that is currently on will be resolved as soon as possible so that uh, we have a, a normal season. Uh, palm fruit and stone fruit also showed some, some, some uh, growth, um, especially palm fruit, where we saw a 22% uh, increase last year. and uh, this year, we also see um, around a 15% increase, so good, good growth. Stone fruit also had a um, not so good season last year due to the perishable nature of this product. Uh, but despite that, they saw a 9% increase in, in exports as well. Avocados is, 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 uh, is currently boxing under its potential. We have uh, shipped in the past uh, in excess of 16 million cartons, but uh, every year there's uh, either some quality problems or Competition, especially Peru, uh, that pre prevent us from, from really realizing the potential for avocados. We had some very good maize exports. Uh, it was helped by good rains in the production areas. And also we saw that um, the war in Ukraine also assist us in uh, taking opportunities with regard to, to maize exports as well. Then where did the, the fruit go to? Uh, market tax is a very important issue uh, for, for all role players in the supply chain, including Daura, uh, which is responsible uh, for, for market, the opening markets uh, in the first place. Um, we, the UK and Europe we was 2% uh, more the previous years, but uh, we saw that that declined now to 38% in totality, 12% for UK and 36% for Europe. And that growth went into the Middle East, which increased by 1% to 15%. Uh, 
and also Asia increased with uh, 1% to, from 18 to 19%. And we really have to commend Dara here in assisting us with opening markets, especially uh, towards the Eastern markets uh, where the future of this food industry in South Africa lies. And then certification, also a core function of the PPCB. Um, we have processed 181,000 certificates and uh, these certificates is then used by our exporters and growers to obtain a, a, a phytosanitary certificate from Dawarat. And that was also 12% increase on, on the previous year. In terms of our cold chain services, uh, despite uh, the shortage of empty containers in the markets, um, we managed to inspect 400,000 um, containers, empty containers. Um, we rejected 5.3% of that, which is about 21,000 containers. And uh, we estimated that the, the, the value of, or the loss that the industry would have had if they exported in these containers was, is 1.1 billion rand. So that's a saving that the PPCD uh, had for the, for the industry in this regard. In terms of our food safety services, uh, we have a laboratory in Centurion. Um, the laboratory is, is currently not doing so, so well, but we managed to, to, to sample, uh, to test in excess of 19,000 samples. We are currently busy with the turnaround plant laboratory. And again, uh, DARAT is, 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 is providing good support in this regard. Our food safety audits, we have done 795 SA gap audits, um, and mostly they was growth there in the, in the rising farms, they assisted us with that figure. Then we have a, a small research and uh, development uh, unit within PPCB. This uh, unit was um, vacant for, for, for a year or so, and uh, we've now recapacitated it. And uh, currently we're busy with the OECD funded uh, project on, on climate change and the effect that it has on fruit and vegetable quality. And then we also uh, have a collaboration with the International Cool Chain Association uh, where we do research on exports via, via air freight as well. Um, project Titan is our electronic uh, inspection platform. Um, we have done uh, 20, uh, 280 million cartons on, on uh, Titan since in, in Septon. And currently our average figure that we did last year uh, was 88% um, uh, that we on, on, on grapes, palm citrus, avocados, and, and stone fruit. Um, and we've did that um, uh, at 881 activity points around the country. So grapes, we are, re, uh, we are nearly there. 98% of all grapes were inspected uh, on, uh, via Titan and not on pen and paper. Citrus, uh, 87%. And this year on the citrus season, we are already at 98% uh, in citrus as well. So good growth there as well. In terms of the financial performance, Chairperson, uh, I'm going to, to hand over to our CFO. I hope he is, is audible. He had some connection problems earlier. Johan? Yes, um, th thank you, Cyril, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> the financial year in for March 2020, that ended March 2022, was was good. It was very positive. And the main reason for that, and um, Mr. Julius referred to that, is, is a very good growth that we experienced in, in, our, in inspection and the export of products. You know, he mentioned the figures, citrus, all of them are doubled except double figures, except for stone, which is good as well, 9%. But if you look at my 52%, and that's the reason for, for the, the good net result of 35.4 million. Our income exceeded budget by 11% and last year by 15%. Um, and our total income is at 562 million. Our expenditure um, on budget, it's slightly lower um, than budget, 1%. And on 20, um, if you compare it against the previous financial year, it's 14% up. Um, and the reason for the 14% for the increase um, is because of Project Titan, our digit, our strategy that focuses on digitalization of, of the business. Um, if you look at the breakdown of expenditure, employee expenditure, 70, employee expenditure represents a major part 
of PPCB total expenditures it represents 71% or 375 million of our total expenditure. It was in line with budget and on 2021, it was 8%. And that is more or less, you know, the, the main part of that is the annual increase, but also um, capacitating um, mostly operations on on to 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 serve to service the the increase in in um, the product inspections. Operational expenditure, if you look compared against the budget, four percent below last year, um, and but 30 percent up on on on. Uh, 4% lower than budget and 30% up on, on 2021. Once again, the reason is the, 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 the big reason is the digitization of the PPCB. And we're looking there are two projects, uh, main products, it's Titan. Um, and Mr. Julius referred to that as our um, electronic inspection platform. The second one is our ERP system that we're busy implementing. Thank you. Next slide. We look at the different categories, income. The main part of the category in, in income, 64% is our inspections, APS services. 30% is our cold chain services. And then 4% is our food safety, which includes the laboratory and foods um, the audits, the certifications, and then 2% is other income and interests received, as well as um, some, you know, on the service level agreements that we have with the industry on providing them with information. Expanded the two categories, 71% of its employee expenses, and then 9% activity, activity relates to our people and inspectors in the field, assessors, and the expenses um, that they incur to deliver a service, direct expenses. 11% is ICT, and I made reference to that. We, we see an increase. Previously, it was, it was single digits. We're moving now into double digits, and it's mostly because of the digitization strategy that, we, that we're embarking on. And then administrative expenses is 9%. Thank you. Our financial position and cash flow, very healthy, um, mostly because of our financial end result, the, the net result. Um, that turned into um, our reserves um, and, and improved reserve, net financial assets, as well as positive cash flow, as well as into our bank accounts. Um, in terms of the position, our biggest risk item there is receivables, debtors, but very much under control. Um, we last year in 2021, we only um, incurred 46,000 um, bad debt, um, which is it's 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 comma it's comma percentage of income um, that we experience. So we have very good accounts receivable policies and processes in place um, and it sounds cash flow um, receipts um, very good cash flow the most of the expenses once again been allocated to to the payment of employees and then to suppliers and then also the purchase of assets last year we replaced um, tablets as well as as our ICT on computer equipment because of aging Thank you, Cyril. This is the external audit outcome. Um, the summary, we received an unqualified opinion and the overall assessment of, of financial viability is good. Um, two points that we are working on and we followed up and we've done our investigations. Um, it's the fruitless and wasteful expenditure of 32,200. And those, it, it refers to two cases of where employees resigned from the PPCB and they owed PPCB money. Um, subsequent to that, 
we we changed some of our policies the the rules around it's it's related to the recovery recoupment of cell phone expenditure um so we changed our policy and we changed our business processes around that to avoid similar th um, um events happening in future a regular expenditure is 1.37 million and those are it's it's seven cases um and all of that, I've referred to that. We've done a detailed investigation. Um, we've made recommendations in terms of consequence management. Um, <clears throat> but the three, the seven cases can be summarized in three major you know, categories. The first one is it's payments where it was outside um, contracts. Um, the contract expired. And because we're in a digitization drive and we want to do with away with, uh, with manual and paperwork and filing of that, three of those, um, the outdated contracts refer mostly to, to the contracts we had in place with a Metro file and ExecuMove. Um, and we also had, there was also a over expenditure on ITEC, it's a contract. Um, there is a contract in place, but we we um, made a payment, um, but we rectified that uh, a payment in error, but we rectified that. The second category is, refers to one supplier: it's hygiene services, and that as was purely a misunderstanding between a PPCB and the hygiene company, and according to us, we made an overpayment, um, but we did enter into a um, discussions with them um, and that was also rectified. Um, and then the third category is a, is a three quote process. We simply did not follow process there to get approval from the um, executive officer to deviate from the, from the three quote process, but it relates to safety issues, um, pre-printed stationery for the business, as well as learning material. Um, so that is a background to the irregular expenditure. In terms of the other issues, um, potential issued material statements not corrected as well as corrected, um, there was none. Um, contract awareness to persons in service of state, there was none. Um, and schedule of unadjusted and adjusted differences, there was none. Um, so overall, a good report, but we take... We take um, the matter of fruitless or wasteful expenditure and irregular expenditure series, and, and the board has tasked management team to look into these matters and prevent this from happening again. Thank you, Saru. I think that concludes my presentation on the financial results. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swibus. Um, if we then look at our the PPCB's performance indicators, um, we have a total of 14 indicators for the year under review. We have achieved one, did not achieve one, and that is the number of um, samples that were tested by our laboratory. Um, and the other 13, which we did achieve, which um, then uh, amounts to 93% achievement rate. Um, there's a few salient ones on, this, on the screen here. Um, uh, our uh, triple BGE spent in procurement, uh, our target was 80% and we achieved 89 uh, our um, agri -technology, uh, export technology program um, for students, uh, graduates, uh, our target was 45, and uh, we managed to, to despite some uh, people dropping out, we uh, 48 uh, got through that program. And then the small order farmers trained, uh, we dropped this target due to COVID as we didn't have access to farms. Um, so our target was 50, but we uh, achieved 302, and this target will be increased as, as we go forward uh, when the next opportunity arises to do that. Then our um, annual customer uh, satisfaction survey, we um, set a target of 80%, and uh, the PPCB achieved 90% uh, uh, customer satisfaction. And then um, our program where we um, certify uh, farmers as export ready. Um, we had a target of 20 and we achieved um, 89 similar situation uh, with the training of the smaller farmers and uh, this target will increase uh, will be increased as, as we go forward as well. Then um, an informal target, uh, the beneficiaries from our corporate social initiatives, 
2,623 uh, people benefited from, from these initiatives of the PPCB. Um, my last slide basically is about our challenges and the road ahead. Um, the logistical challenges that we had last year will continue this year as well, uh, but there was a shortage of, uh, of containers worldwide that also impacted on, on, uh, on South Africa and its exports. And then also the, um, the ports and uh, the efficiencies in the ports were also compromised. Uh, some improvements were made for this year and uh, Transnet is really showing now um, that they would like to, to improve the situation as well for, for this coming uh, this season, so this deciduous fruit season. Then the COVID, um, we managed to continue our work despite um, the COVID. Uh, our people are still on alert and uh, we saw also now the, the monkey monkeypox coming through as well, where we also still need to be, be on our alert. Then uh, data security, we received thousands of um, attacks on our firewall uh, every month. And we work tirelessly to, uh, to, to, to make sure that the sensitive data that we carry on our, on our, on our systems of our clients, that it is secure uh, at all times. Then the working environment, uh, people got used to, to, to working from home during, during the, the COVID period. And um, we are getting some people that, that can come back to work, we get them back, but uh, we're still working out how we're going to, to, to go forward with, uh, with a hybrid working environment within our offices around the country. Then the road ahead, Mr. Swibis mentioned the enterprise resource plan system that we're currently busy. Uh, the final implementation date for the ERP is in February next year. And uh, we are making, uh, pulling out all the stops so that we can achieve that date. And then we will continue to get more products and uh, more volumes onto our Titan inspection platform as well, so that we can, can go entirely paperless. Uh, data provision. Um, to make informed business decision, especially in terms of which markets that products should go to. Our clients are asking us for this information every day. And uh, we're working on to make sure that we provide accurate and, and real-time information to them as well. And then in terms of our inspection and cold chain procedures, we are working on uh, efficiencies so that we can um, especially have a positive impact on our, our increases that we give through to our farmers every year so that we uh, can keep that as, as low as possible. And then in terms of market access, we, um, uh, especially Fruit South Africa uh, and, and, and uh, the department, we the board took a decision that we should support them and uh, uh, we are continuously doing that as well. Then on the PPEC bill, we received uh, a notification from the department that we should maybe look at a new approach to this. Um, so that we can make inroads, and that is what we're currently doing. Uh, we're talking to the legal department in, in, in Dalarat to see how we can, we can speed up this process. And then I already talked about the board that um, five members needs to be replaced um, as, as from next month. Chairs and, and honorable members, that, that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Julius and your team. Colleagues, I will request that we pack um, PPECB and invite the presentation from OVG, Office of Value General, so that we take two entities at a time. Uh, thank you. Chair, uh, honorable members, honorable chair and honorable members of the portfolio committee. Uh, we are now <clears throat> ready to present the APR from the Office of the Value General. And with me, I'm with my colleagues from Office of the Value General who will be assisting with questions. Now I'm um, Introducing, introducing Mr. Tapelo Motwening, who's our acting COO, who will be taking us through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Motwening. We are on the platform. Members of the portfolio committee. Can I just, if my 
presentation is uh, visible and that I'm um, audible. I did have problems with the uh, connection. Yes, sir, you are visible. The presentation is also visible. You are audible. Chair, are you able to hear me? Very loud and clear. You can continue, sir. That demo training continue. We can hear you. Your presentation is there also. Um, we are presenting to our 2021-2022 annual report. And uh, we'll look at the overview of um, the performance report for 2022 financial year. Sub programs at the sub program of uh, administration. Then we'll look at the outcome timeline and we'll also look at the in terms of the mandate, it's um, necessary just to brief everybody what the mandate is uh, in, in terms of section 1A of the, whenever a property is identified for purposes of land reform, that property must be valued by the Office of the Valuer General for purposes of the value to the prescribed. In terms of section 12.1B, whenever a property has been identified, or disposal by a and for other than that mentioned in paragraph A may at the request by the office and also value the value uh, the subject property for land reform purposes in terms of section 12.1a of the PVA and quantify and or consider the following factors. These factors, um, members of the portfolio committee are derived from section 25.3 of the South African constitution. And uh, they are historical value pertaining to acquisition benefits on the property, the purpose of acquisition, direct state investment and subsidies on the property, the market value of the property, and as well as the current use of the, of the property. In terms of the split and percentage types of valuations that were conducted by the OVG during the 21-22 period, we say that 53.1% of all valuations are valuations that we did in terms of section 12.1A of the Property Valuation Act. 21.71% um, are valuations that we did in terms of the same 12.1A However, in this instance, this, these were the ones that were where we were determining historical market value in the main for the restitution program where they may be uh, foreseeing a settlement in line with a, a standard settlement offer or financial compensation. 25.19% uh, of all valuations were done in terms of the PVA section 12.1B and in the main, it's the property management unit of the department where property is, is, is being valued for purposes of, of leasing. In terms of split in the country, um, you will see that the majority of the work that we did in the last financial year came from Bumalanga at 27%, followed by KZN at 23%, uh, I think the next one would be the Northwest province at 10%, Eastern Cape at 9%, 5% in Northern Cape, 3% uh, in the Free State and 1% was, was done in the, in the Western Cape. Basically, these percentages only refer to the, the number of valuations that we have received. So it's a, it's a percentage split that we do not have control over. 
it's based on what the, the clients uh, are requesting us to do and where the properties are located as per their own requests. Percentage in terms of land use for valued properties, 73% of the properties that we valued uh, were for agricultural purposes. The land use was uh, agricultural, 17% was non-agricultural, and 10% of the time it was mixed, mixed use. Uh, number set at lungs, we did 403 uh, valuation certificates that were issued in all nine provinces. We did, we did work even though we are based in Pretoria. Uh, the total number of land portions that we valued were 493. And in terms of performance, we did all valuations that we had agreed to do with the clients in line with the uh, the indicators that I will explain in later slides. Some of the values uh, determined during the 2021-2022 period at that lands as well. Um, 140 million rand was the total sum value determined in line with section 12.1b of the, of the Property Valuation Act. Those that we did in terms of 12.1a for historical market value was 12 million rent. And the ones that we did uh, in line with um, section 121A of the Property Valuation Act was 1.3 billion rent. In total, we did 654 uh, hectares of land that were 654,548 hectares of land that were valued by the OVG. These numbers do not imply that this would be what um, was acquired, but simply what was valued and submitted to the clients for them to take it further in terms of how they conclude transactions. There were some key projects that we did at, in the OVG during the past financial year. One of them was the um, DITS transition project uh, this was intended on enabling the OVG to fully execute its own uh, SCM finance, as well as HCM um, uh, processes, independent from the support of the, of the Office of the Chief Registrar of Deeds. As uh, members of the committee would know, since inception, we have been supported by, by Deeds. Uh, in terms of the status, we have now managed to take over SCM finance and HCM processes from DITS. Uh, work is underway to finalize data migration from the OCRD uh, systems to the OVG's own ERP. Uh, the OVG has started to execute its processes independently of the, of the, of the DITS team. We will be uh, developing our own uh, interim financial statements and uh, we will be doing it from our, our own uh, IRP, ERP rather. Uh, the um, ICT enablement program is one of the big programs that we are running at the OVG and the status is that we have managed to complete the implementation of the land infrastructure services and the OVG website work is underway to finalize internet connectivity, radio link firewall, and UTM. In terms of the ERP project, uh, the status is that all the modules have been implemented and work is underway to implement outstanding requirements and to address some of the teething problems that are normal in, in so far as a new uh, ERP project as of consent. And uh, the process of addressing outstanding business requirements is also underway to ensure that all implemented uh, modules are, are complete. Uh, we are an evolving organization chair and we keep defining new ways of addressing our current challenges. And below are some of the key strategic focus areas in this financial year, uh, rather in the financial year that we are reporting on. Uh, we did uh, make some uh, minor changes in so far as valuation requests are concerned where we are moving away uh, steadily from uh, clients who are commission evaluations on our behalf to them submitting their requests to the OVG for the OVG to manage the hybrid between 
using private valuers as well as internal, internal capacity as we continue to, to grow it. Uh, the migration from uh, submission and tracking of valuations using emails to using the say CRM, uh, which provides a single and accessible platform for management of valuation is, uh, is part of our uh, digital transformation strategy. Uh, and uh, we, we are now at a point where we can say we are no longer using uh, archaic methods of, of tracking our work in so far as uh, evaluations are concerned. We are uh, introducing more and more analytics in, in, in the work that we are doing. We are still very basic in so far as that is concerned, but uh, we are making quite uh, steady progress. Um, continuous improvement in our business processes to ensure that all of our valuation certificates are delivered within the prescribed timeframes uh, and uh, our utility is, is improved. Uh, Chair, this, this uh, diagram or, or, or depiction shows what the OVG is striving to get at in so far as uh, digital transformation is concerned. You can see on the left-hand side, where we say data sources at the bottom, these are areas where we're getting all of our data, be it at the SAC PVP, which is the registrar of, uh, of all uh, professional valuers. As you would know, the uh, PVA demands that all valuations that are done by, by the OVG must be done by registered uh, valuers. That's where we get our, uh, our data from. We get data of sales from DITS office, uh, from the chief surveyor general, we, we get survey information from the department. We're getting information around their requirements. There are some third party data sets that we, that we utilize. Um, internally, we do have a, uh, spreadsheets that we still use as, 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 as a form of data source, as well as uh, hard copies that we, we are still utilizing. In the SES environment, we, we, we have created those data leaks that you, you see in so far as SAGE is concerned, as well as built-in data models and, and the master data that we are having in the, in the OVG. At the moment, we are doing past looking um, in so far as the data analysis is concerned, and we are doing basic analytics that are still uh, backward looking. However, what the, the environment that we are looking forward to, which is our future end state, is, is where we can be data driven in decision making, where we can use data to predict our, our behavior um, and, and, and even to, to, to guide it in so far as making decisions is concerned. That is where we, we want to be going as the, as the OVG. And so far as performance is concerned, Chair, the OVG planned to achieve 10 targets during the last financial year. We have achieved a total of eight and two of those targets were not achieved. So we are operating as, at 80% of the, of the targets that we had planned. In terms of sub-programs, uh, the sub-program administration we, we had the indicator on corruption and fraud prevention mechanisms. We have achieved that uh, specific target. And so far as valuations is concerned, Chair, uh, it is for the first time since our inception that we are now reporting 100% achievement on all of the three uh, indicators in the sub-program valuations, which is the core function of the OVG. The first one was, uh, percentage completion of valuation requests submitted by clients within the specified timelines. You will see that in 2020-2021, we had achieved 93% of that target. In 2021-2022, we are now achieving 100%. We, we, we have delivered on all of them in, in line with the specified timelines that we had agreed with, with clients. Uh, the indicator on the average number of working days that we take to issue evaluation certificate. In the last financial year, we were operating at 53 days against the target of 50 days. 
which means uh, we missed that target by three days. In this year, um, against the same 50 days, we have been able to do um, our valuations and conclude them within 34 days, which means an improvement against the target of, of 16 days. The backlog that uh, members of the committee will know had been a challenge for the OVG for quite a number of years, has now been eradicated. We had uh, performed at 68% last year. In this year that we are now reporting that we have cleared the backlog as uh, the, the backlog that had been refenced um, in, I think, three years before uh, before now. That, that's uh, at the time when we had refenced that particular backlog. Um, evaluations uh, sub-program on enhanced data management capability. We are using the valuations tracking system and it en uh, enables the OVG and its stakeholders to track progress that is being made on valuations and to provide the ability to gather and process property and valuations data uh, was implemented in the beginning of the, of the third quarter. Uh, in so far as operations is concerned, uh, its purpose is to ensure the efficient and effective functioning of the OVG. Um, the first indicator there was that we, we needed to produce 12 reports um, on the valuation performance. We were able to, to, to produce all of those reports. Chair, this is a mechanism for us to be able to, in, in real time, um, check what is happening with our performance. One of the things, one of the deficiencies that we had in earlier times was that we would find out quite late about um, our inability to meet, to meet our timelines, be it turnaround times or due dates that we had agreed with, with clients. The development of these reports has helped us to, to be able to track uh, within shorter periods of time allowing for quicker intervention. Uh, the second one was on compliance uh, projects. Um, we were able to, to achieve that indicator as well. The next one was on the planned project milestones. We did not achieve this target. We were only able to achieve 91% uh, out of a planned 100%. And the reason for that is, is, is because we we're still getting our project management systems uh, to be uh, up and running and for us to be able to perform better there. Uh, the next one was on the filling of posts. We had intended to fill 67 posts. We were only able to fill 64. It means we did not achieve this target and we missed it by three positions. Um, we Part of the reason was because two roles on, on, a, on specialists in, in internal audit had to be put on hold and we had to restart that, that process. And in one instance, a project management candidate uh, did not meet uh, candidates rather who applied did not meet the selection requirements and the re recruitment process had to be re restarted. Um, these, these are matters that are being resolved in this uh, new financial year. We had an, a target of achieving an ad, unqualified audit opinion. We have achieved an unqualified audit opinion without findings. Um, in terms of the outcome of the, of the audit, we, this is the journey that we have traveled since 2017, 2018. In this year, we are reporting a clean audit uh, in so far as our audit outcomes are concerned. Um, we are going to take the, the, the financial report now, Chair. Um, in terms of the management report, we did um, in K regular expenditure. Uh, the processes are underway to investigate the two transactions that led to this uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. There was a single transaction of 132 rand, uh, which was successfully recovered uh, from the responsible official. 
and we did not incur any unauthorized expenditure. Chair, at this point, I'm going to give over to Mr. Dukale, who is our SILA manager of finance to take us through the rest of the financial report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Mutoni. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and, and members. <clears throat> uh, looking at the uh, financial performance of, of the OVG. Chair, in the year under review, um, um, we had an allocation of 131 million or 131.8 million. Um, and other income, we had uh, 244,000. In total, the revenue was uh, 132 uh, million. Uh, it was split in two categories, uh, compensation of employees and goods and services. Um, in terms of uh, compensation of employees, Chair, we had a spend of 36.6 uh, million, uh, which amounts to 58% of the budgeted uh, of the budget allocation of 63.3 million. Uh, on goods and services, uh, we had a spend of 31.8 million, which uh, amounts to 46% of the budget allocation of 68.4 uh, million. In total, Chair, we had uh, 68.4 million spent, uh, which amounts to 52% of the uh, total allocation or budget allocation of 131.8 million, um, which uh, resulted in a total surplus of 63.6 uh, million. So if you look at uh, expenditure performance, uh, expenditure amounted to 68.4 million in the 2021-22 financial year. Uh, the expenditure reflects a 34% increase uh, from 44.9 million in the 2020-21 financial year. On, on revenue, the OVG realized total revenue of 131.8. In the current year, the allocation increased from 100 million in the 2020-21 financial year. The increase is attributable to the reprioritization of that was effected in the sector in order to free up resources to fund the national COVID-19 response in the 2020-21 financial year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, team from the OVG. Um, colleagues, I think we can now interact with uh, both presentations. I'm going to call you and you deal with both to say on PPECB, this will be the questions. Coming to OVG, these are the questions so that we save each other's time. Honorable Kappa. No. Are you on Honorable Kappa? You do me so? Let's then go to Honorable Mbamama. I think he's struggling. His mic is on, but we can hear a word. Honorable Mbamama. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I will start with the PPECB. And uh, it's my pleasure to commend them, um, especially the um, managing team and the board on a very satisfactory um, report. 
it was a really great pleasure for me to listen to it. And I have no questions whatsoever for the PPECB. And I would like to come to the OVG and congratulate them on their unqualified audit report with no findings. Uh, congratulate them on uh, achievement on their core function, which is 100% of the evaluations done. Uh, congratulate them on their turnaround times um, at, on a target of 50. They did it in 34 days, which is exceptionally good. And of course, um, with the background, with the backlog eradicated, that's also great. And um, I and no unauthorized expenditure. So, Chair, I really have no questions for these two organizations, except to say I wish the others in, you know, the other uh, entities could take a leaf out of these two organizations. Thank you ever so much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Honorable Mbavama. Honorable Matias. Let's check Honorable Kappa if he's ready now. We'll go back to Honorable Matthias. Honorable Kappa, you'll have to change your gadgets. Your mic is still open, it's on, but there's no sound. Honorable Trader. Honorable Masipa, can you come in? Let me give you the platform. Thank you, Chair. It looks like my colleagues uh, decided to spend the uh, afternoon session. Chair, I've got uh, two questions uh, to PPECB. Um, they did mention the issue of the shipping um, that they had to uh, stop the uh, exporting of some of the fruits due to challenges with the, with the ships um, uh, as such. So I think the question for me is that um, this I have been hearing that um, there has been delays because ship were not properly, you know, fitted in uh, to export and PPECB had uh, to make some findings and ask for, for, for them to address those issues. So the question is, um, is this attributable to the uh, load shedding or what is it that caused this ship uh, to be not compliant? Um, I know of uh, one of the farmer who exported to the US the product to the value of um, 700,000 uh, arrived there and they had to destroy them because uh, it was citrus because uh, they were fraught if I have to use the Africans weight. But also before the, the, um, the ship left here, uh, there were problems because PPECB uh, made findings and uh, they asked uh, them to attend uh, the ship to attend to those findings. And then obviously then it meant that they delayed a little bit, which took about another two days before they could really um, take the produce out of the country. But when it arrived there, the receiver that site had to dump them because the fruits were, uh, the citrus were uh, rotten. The second one is, um, it relates obviously to the question that I asked earlier to NAMC. This really primarily relates to the, uh, obviously the, the values and the amount of exporting that is taking place as a result of obviously the Russian war in, in, in Ukraine and uh, the issue of the uh, EU bringing in the false courtly moth um, item on the agenda. 
In terms of the the question, really primarily is that what what is this? Uh, uh, how has this affected the amount of tons or the amount of inspections that PPECB had to do? And also um, linked to that is uh, what are the values? Because as uh, NAMC said that there are levies is uh, on a, uh, what do you call uh, they collecting at point of sale so if they collect at point of sale obviously it looks like you know where's the point of okay maybe the question is where will be the point of sale is the point of sale when the goods arrived overseas or is it here uh, uh, when they live here at a certain value that is attached to the sale that has taken place just to to get an understanding in terms of the collection of the levy vis a vis, you know, the performance of the sector. Uh, as to what are the, the values um, in terms of the rent values that they are seeing and the volume of the uh, tons that are being exported at the moment. Those are my, my two questions, Chair. Thanks very much. I hope I'm, I'm clear. Thank you, Honorable Masipa. Honorable Marshall. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, thank you very much. Chair, I will also follow suit on what the member Boma, Honorable Mbegoma have said that uh, this is one of the organizations that we all uh, are proud of. Uh, their presentation was one of the best also, uh, a presentation that you could listen without even need uh, sleeping, you know because they were talking a, 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 a sense in their presentation. But now I just want to have a slight uh, question for me to understand. It's on slide eight, uh, which talks about uh, the issue of evaluation. Uh, I know that uh, it might not be able for them to answer, but I think they must just try to help me to understand because in, in, in some of their slides, they're saying uh, this organization is made to believe that this is an organization which is one of those that is defining new ways of uh, including, uh, including other, 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 other people from, uh, yeah, the, the, no. Uh, you addressing addressing the, the 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 current challenges that they have below, uh, like when we say uh, in free state, for example, the percentage that they are talking about evaluation in free state they are not satisfactory, including uh, 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 northwest, northern Cape. In, in Houghton, but most, mostly for those that are very, very, very low. How are they going to be able to talk to the department to let them be aware that in those provinces, we don't have a written a, a inputs or written requests for them to go and do the work. How can they be able to help us uh, as, as, the, as the committee and help the department to to understand that these areas like Northern Cape, Western Cape, Northern Cape and Free State are taken on board because we're in Free State. Uh, Chairperson, you we were in Free State on a, on, on a site visit. We could see that there is a need for, uh, for, the, for evaluation of uh, uh, some of the farms that, uh, um, for uh, uh, farm dwellers, where you find that there is a, the big, the big problems, uh, the, the farm dwellers they are kicked out of the, the the same places. So we need to help one another here between ourselves and the department to make sure that we address this type of issues in those in those provinces. As much as I'm saying, I congratulate you. Uh, getting an authorized expenditure. We are happy about your organization, but this is the only one slide that is bothering me, Chairperson. We need assistance. I know it's the department maybe that must answer, 
that question, but I think even you yourself, you can still help us on how to, the way as saying you are finding a new ways of helping each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Marshal, Honorable Breath. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, firstly, I would like to um, also just comment and, and congratulate the PPECB um, once again on an outstanding audit and, and a presentation. Um, and then I would uh, have no questions for them. And then I would like to move to the OVG and say that to congratulate them as well. I think we see, um, we see a betterment, we see an improvement, um, and, and that is really commendable. Chairperson, maybe? Um, maybe just let me talk to the um, the backlog and just to provide extra cl cl clarity, um, is that just with regard to the old order claims um, that the black backlog has been addressed or is it the totality of their backlogs that they have experienced and will they stay up to date um, now with, um, with, uh, uh, evalu with valuations? And then also in terms of that, maybe just to, to link to that, is um, what is the current capacity of the OVG itself in terms of valuers? Because I remember there was quite a challenge. And how many external valuers are they still using? And and they should please just correct me if I'm wrong, because I remember that there was speak of a moratorium on employing people. But I remember in our last, I think it was the last BRRR session we had, they said they have, um, the OVG actually has, um, has uh, uh, approval to go ahead and to appoint valuers. And um, if we can just, uh, you know, provide, they can provide clarity on that as to how is that process going um, and what is the time frame, and are we looking at employing more valuers um, uh, in terms of that and what is the time frame for um, being completely self-reliant and not being reliant on, on external valuers. And then maybe just the last question, Chairperson, what is the cost of this digitization? Um, I see all the pretty plans and it's a bit spook awesome for me. It's a bit fluffy. Um, and I would just like to know what is the cost in terms of that? And is that taken into account within the budget? Um, and will they actually manage and be able to maintain that? Chairperson, and I will leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Honorable Britt. Can I check Honorable Qatar for the last time? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're audible, sir. Okay, thank you, Chair. Now, uh, was I didn't have any question, Chair, except that also I wanted to appreciate the presentation of the two reports. I'm satisfied. I have no question at the moment, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kappa. Honorable Matthias. Nothing. Um, I think from my side, my colleagues has represented me on commending the two um, entities. Thanks, PPECB, as always. Your report is outstanding. And OVG for getting that clean audit. Just want to find out, as Honorable Briet has asked, have you how have you addressed issues of capacity within OVG? And what are the reasons for low performance in Western Cape Free State and Northern Cape? That will be all. Can we have PPCB followed by OVG? Uh, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, um, the two questions is basically from Honorable Nopu. Um, and the first has got to do with um, the shipping. So, yeah, the PPCB uh, approves vessels um, that are carrying fruit uh, directly into the hold of the vessels. And uh, that is also the case where fruit is shipped to the United States of America. Uh, it happens from time to time that we do have to, to, to reject these vessels. And uh, it is mostly technical in nature where the, the cooling unit of the vessel is not functioning correctly. And uh, the temperatures in the, in the holes um, at which the product is being carried must be recorded uh, on a daily basis, even hourly. And these uh, recordings must be shown to the USA when they dock. And then sometimes these printers, they malfunction. And that is also one of the reasons why we then have to, to reject the vessels. And then other times these vessels come here, they carried maybe uh, motor vehicles and then there's breakages of uh, you know headlights and there's glass found. 
Uh, and then in those cases where it's dirty and not unsuitable, we also have to reject these vessels. In terms of the, the consignment that arrived rotten, uh, these things also happen sometimes where um, the cold chain is broken on the other side, but what we were not, unfortunately, not informed um, about uh, something like this. So, uh, so this is, in this case, the exporter didn't make contact with the PPCB. Um, but from our side, we definitely make sure that these vessels are fit for purpose and that they can um, carry the product. And the same goes for the containers carrying product as well. Then <clears throat> the second question was around the situation in the Ukraine, uh, how it affected inspections. Um, as we could see from the figures, um, the inspections, are, um, the shipping actually increased um, year on year. And the war in the Ukraine, um, surprisingly, the Russian ex uh, importers still took our fruit. And even this year, last year, the, the exports to Russia was around 7%. And uh, this year, it, uh, for this citrus season, it was still at 7%. So um, the war didn't have that much, surprisingly, didn't have a, a, a influence on, on our export volumes to Russia. And then there was a question around the, the point of sale. There are different scenarios how exporters negotiate uh, with, the, with the producers. But I think the main point is that what is being back, given back to the farmer, um, you know, on the farm. And that is determined what, what happens in the supply chain as well. If the supply chain is, is made longer by delays on this side, either on the other side or in import markets, like in Europe, where we saw last year, there was also some inefficiency in the ports, then the containers stand around for longer times and then the quality suffers and then the price uh, gets lowered and then the, the farmer uh, get a reduced income. And the farmer at the end of the day pays everyone in the supply chain, including the PPCB. So yeah, I, I hope that um, that answers the questions. Thank you. Thank you, PPCB. OVG. Thank you. Um, we will start with the explanation around the question that comes from Honorable Maha. Uh, the performance of the OVG is, is and, and I'm saying performance in terms of numbers, is really determined on, on, on the supply side of that comes from the clients. So the, 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 the clients come to us and say, go and do an evaluation in this province on the following properties. We, we have no control as to which properties clients ask us to value. But some of the insights that we can draw from these numbers is what is on the books of the commission and the department itself. So you would see much higher demand for our services in provinces, for instance, where you still have higher old order um, claims that are still outstanding. So a province that has still got to dispose of a number of land claims will have a higher requirement for valuation services from the, from the OVG. When you look at a province where, like the free state, where there is a lower number of outstanding claims, if any, you will also find that there will be a very low demand for valuation services. That, that is the first thing. In the main, it's, it's, a, it's a function of the remaining land claims for on the side of the of the commission the other function that um, the, the other variable is is the choices that the department is making in terms of land acquisition in terms of their own land acquisition strategy where they are acquiring more land from the land rest, the redistribution and tenor reform uh, branch when they are acquiring more land they will require more valuations from our side. And, and that, that is really how the split will work. The split is not dependent on anything that we do. It's dependent on what the, 
the clients are, do, are doing in terms of their lender acquisition strategy, as well as the remaining uh, land claims. In so far as um, all other claims from uh, Honorable Briet, um, the, the old other claims uh, backlog is, is not a matter that we can deal with. What we were dealing with when it comes to backlog was a backlog in so far as concluding valuations that were already requested by the client. So as we started in 1996, 2016, we, we got an overwhelming number of requests from clients. As um, members of the committee would remember, we kept on missing timelines, we kept on missing turnaround times, and in the process, we were building up a backlog that we eventually ring fenced and, and had a, a differentiated strategy to deal with that particular backlog. So the, the backlog that we are referring to is only as regards to uh, valuations that we, that we had not been able to finish on time. Um, in terms of the use of external valuers, we are still using quite a number of uh, external valuers. We do have a panel of external valuers. I don't have the number in front of me right now, but there is an existing panel with the valuers that are based in all of the nine different provinces and we do use them. So we do have a hybrid model in the OVG where we do send out valuers or employed by ourselves, <coughs> sorry. And uh, there are valuers that we use from, from the private sector as well. Um, and, and that hybrid is, is going to continue in the foreseeable future uh, because the OVG is not able on its own. Uh, in terms of its own capacity to handle everything that has got to do, that has got to be to be valued. Uh, the number of valuers that we have internally, um, it's, it's about 25. I don't know, Chair, that we have lost about four recently, and we are trying to, to, to recruit more to fill those posts. So how it worked was, and, and this is now coming to Honorable, Honorable British question about uh, employing uh, valuers. Um, if you remember in, in February of 2019, um, we, were, we were given um, um, an opportunity or, or later in, in, in that year, I don't remember the date exactly, but uh, Minister Dibiza allowed us to recruit about 20 valuers to add on to the, the capacity that we, we had at that time. Uh, and we did that recruitment process and were able to, to fill those roles. Over and above that, she has given us an opportunity to fill roles on an ad hoc basis, on contract basis. So where we, we want to uh, tweak our capacity we are doing so using a uh, contract appointments of about three years until the matters around the, uh, uh, the future of the, of the OVT in terms of uh, doing actual valuations and playing a role in the, in the broader sector is, 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 is resolved. Uh, so we are able to, to have that type of flexibility using uh, permanent roles that were, were approved at that time and using additional capacity from the private sector, also using uh, contract appointments that we are able to do internally. Um, in, in so far as staying up to date with, uh, with uh, no backlogs, that, that is what we are striving for every day, that we should not have a, an indicator that talks to backlogs anymore. Um, and and that, that is what, why you don't see in our APP um, an indicator that talks to backlogs anymore. I'm talking about the APP of 2022, 2023. The cost of digitalization, um, 
Honorable Brit, I, I agree that we did not spend much time on the on the digitalization. And I guess the, the, the reason is because uh, we wanted to quickly go to the nub of the matters, the core function uh, and, and matters that are staying at, that are reflected in the APP. But we can go into a little bit of detail um, at another time. The, the cost so far, we are spending close to 10 million rand on the, on the ERP that uh, I've spoken to during our, our presentation. There are other smaller projects that we are doing. Uh, there is one on the enterprise architecture that we are at um, procurement stage on. We are foreseeing that uh, it, it's, a, it's a project that is going to give us even a far better uh, outlook on, on what our digital uh, uh, landscape is going to look like. And we would, we would probably use the outcome of that process to uh, paint a, a much more clearer uh, picture of our, of our digital journey. Uh, Chair, I think we, I have dealt with all of the questions. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, OVG. Colleagues, we're now moving on to inviting Ingonyama Transport. ITB, you have the platform. Chair? Yes, Honorable. Chair, while uh, ITB is loading, it was just a quick question, Chair, uh, to PEECB -E -E in terms of the effect of the strike on their work at the ports. Um, how, how is the strike uh, that is happening affecting them? Quickly, PPCB. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Fortunately, uh, it is now the end of the citrus season and uh, the, the grape season and stone season is starting to we finishing that. the end of the month. So uh, the impact at the moment is, is not so big. Uh, I hope I've answered the question. Can others mute? Sorry, Tate, Julius. Can others mute? You can clarify. Um, it is now the tail end of the season, and um, um, the the stone fruit and uh, table grape seasons uh, starting at the end towards the end of October. So it's it's basically a, a very quiet period at the moment. So the impact is not that huge. The the terminals uh, is open in the ports. But it, it's going, it's very slow, slow going at the moment. But um, the impact is at the moment is not that uh, big. And we hope that the impasse uh, between the unions and transit will be broken soon. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. ITB, you have the platform. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, this is Zay to Konta. I'm the deputy chairperson of the board. I first want to apologize for the chairperson that the chairperson of the board is, has got a death in the family, so he is not available. But uh, the CEO and the CFO are in the meeting. They will do the presentation, chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you, deputy chair. In that order, as delegated. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, my name is Vela Mgwengwe, the Head of Secretariat of Ingonyama Trust. Um, I will be leading the presentation. Um, can I have the next slide? Okay, in terms of the outline, Chair, this is the outline of the report as it stands. Um, but we are really gonna be focusing on part B and, 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 and part E. I'll just touch on part C and D um, in the context of the introduction. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of the outline, this is what uh, it will be the introduction, audited annual performance and audited annual financial statement. Thank you, Chair. Chair, when I'm a trust board, is a Schedule 3A entity in terms of the Public Finance Management Act. 
it is entirely funded uh, through voted funds and in the year under review, it was to the tune of 22 million. Um, no, please go back. <laughs> Um, in, 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 then in, in terms of governance, uh, the accounting authority is a board. It's supposed to comprise of nine members, but currently it has seven members. Um, and it is supported by a secretariat, um, which, which, which is what I'm heading as its head. In terms of the mandate of Fingonyama Trust Board, as it's provided for in the act. It is to administer the affairs of the trust and the trust land. Next slide. <clears throat> then since the Munyama Trust Board's um, purpose is to, is to administer the trust, then what it means is that if you have to look at what it has to do, you can't look any further than the mandate of the trust. So in terms of the in terms of the act, the, the trust is supposed to be managed for the benefit, material welfare, and social well-being of members of tribes and communities referred to in the second column of, in, of the schedule to the act, which are established in a district and uh, the residents of such a district. Uh, Ingonyama Trust Act will have a schedule that indicates the communities, but the, the beneficiary communities that Ingonyama Trust is supposed to serve. So um, it is to whose benefit uh, that Ingonyama Trust Board must ensure that the objectives of the trust are, are achieved. Next slide. Okay, in terms of performance information chair, you'll recall that when we came here last year in, in November, since we, we, we presented our financials, our annual report later, um, we had six indicators, we had achieved only two, and the four that we had not achieved, there was zero performance in all of them. So that was a state at the time. So in terms of the current financial year, we still have six indicators. We have achieved three, and there is still one where there is zero performance. The other, the other two, there will be performance, it's just that it is not at 100% as a consequence of which they have not been achieved. So with respect to indicator number one, it was relationship agreements uh, with, with, with TCs, government departments. In the main, this really relates to um, development, development agreements with municipalities in terms of which Ngonyama Trust makes land available for municipalities to to, 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 to build uh, houses for, 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 for South African citizens. So we had uh, a target of 10 and 10 was achieved. And the next one relates to the, to the capacitation of traditional councils with, and we had a target of 10, we achieved 11. Uh, the third was to achieve an unqualified audit. You'll recall that in the last financial year, in, in, not just last, in, in 2020, 2021, we achieved an unqualified audit for the first time. We were able to maintain that position, so we still have unqualified audit, uh, unqualified audit opinion as well. Um, then we had a, an indicator for policies to be developed. Out of five, we achieved only four. The one that we didn't achieve was the land tenor management policy. The issue really is capacity. Um, that we just do not have the technical expertise. And, and because of the structuring of the finances of this organization, we are also unable to outsource that which we can produce directly. So as a consequence, that was not achieved. Um, then the, the, the next one related to the number of land tenor rights. These are essentially leases chair. And there was a target of 1,000, only 390 was achieved. And the reason for that is that the bulk of the leases were residential leases. So the moment that there was, there was a high court judgment in June last year, we had to stop issuing residential leases and that impacted immediately on performance. Um, you'll 
recall that in the prior year, we had overachieved on this because there were more residential leases signed in that year. And now we have underperformance as a consequence of the court judgment on CASAC, which stopped us from continuing to sign residential leases. Um, then the last one, which is the one that I noted earlier, which relates to the number of human segments plans. Um, th this, this essentially are community-based special plans that are supposed to be developed. So um, there are issues with respect to consultations and also with the issues of conception within within the organization in terms of what, what these things should provide for as a consequence of which they end up not being achieved. So therefore there was zero performance there. That's where chair I stop with respect to uh, non-financial performance. Thank you. Mr. Villagas will come in on, 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 on financial performance. Thank you, chair. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, honorable chair, honorable members um, and colleagues. <clears throat> um, chair, I'm here to present the uh, audited financial statements uh, for the two entities being Nguanyama Trust Board and Nguanyama Trust. Uh, I will start with Nguanyama Trust Board Chair, which is a very simple set of financial statements, so we should be able to breeze through it quite, quite easily. Um, in terms of the audit opinion, um, as the CEO has mentioned, uh, we managed to maintain an unqualified audit opinion with, with findings um, in the past two consecutive audit cycles. Um, the, the biggest bone of, um, well, maybe not a bone of contention, but the, the biggest um, matter that is a finding that can't get us to a clean audit with regards to um, the board um, is irregular expenditure, which the Auditor General uh, has raised in relation to overspending um, of the budget, um, which also comes from uh, previous financial years and continues to be a challenge um, as there are still structuring issues within the organization and thus the financial modeling is not quite optimally representative of what um, it could be. Um, outside of that, there were other findings which were adjusted for that related to uh, classification issues, uh, specifically relating to audit fees that the Auditor General had um, had identified. And those were um, as a result of just um, previously the method in which expenses were, um, were presented in the financial statements. Uh, there was no real relationship between what the board was doing and what the trust was doing, and thus expenses would be uh, it would be interchangeably disclosed um, in either one of the two financial statements. We have managed to resolve the majority of those expense classification issues um, in the prior and in the current uh, year that is under um, under under review. Um, we, we present uh, the, the, the components of the financial statements, which uh, comprise of uh, the statement of financial position, uh, the statement of financial performance, which also summarizes the net asset position of the organization, and we also present um, the cash flows. With regards to the board's financial position, um, total assets currently sit at 566, with a notable difference um, of property, plant, and equipment, which was as a result of a donation. Um, that was given by the Department um, of 15 laptops uh, to enable staff at the ITV to uh, continue working. Um, with regards to liabilities, we sit with liabilities of 3.9 million um, in comparison to a 3.6 million in the prior year. And those liabilities actually are mainly comprised of um, are mainly comprised of um, leave pay, which is due to employees, uh, trade payables of about 400,000, and other accrued expenses um, of about 2 million. Um, in total, we are sitting in a net loss position, and members will realize that in the annual report, um, in one of the notes to the financial statements, we had made disclosures for considerations of going concern. Um, because the entity currently looks factually insolvent in terms of what the balance sheet or the statement of financial position is reflecting with the accumulated net um, liability position of 3.3 million um, in the current year, which increases from a 1.6 million um, in the prior year. 
in terms of the income statement or the statement of financial position. Um, the organization has mainly two sources of, of funding um, in terms of financial regulation 10. Um, the trust is allowed to advance some operating or administrative um, monies for uh, the management and operation of the board. Um, in the current year chair, um, that amounted to about 15.4 million, um, being the 5.4 million, which was limited to 10%. And because obviously um, there are financial difficulties in the organization, an additional 9.9 .9 million had to be advanced um, in the current year. It's, it, it must be noted, Chair, that um, we have made concerted efforts in reducing the amount of money that we uh, we utilize from the trust because uh, trust monies are essentially that. They're trust monies which are generated on behalf of Fiziz Zagazulu, which then ultimately requires to be fed back um, currently in in, in in a ratio of 75% um, to, the, to the total. Um, therefore, if the board then ends up expanding a little bit more than what it was meant to, that will obviously prejudice uh, beneficiary disbursements. Um, in, in the prior year, 19.2 million in addition to uh, the 10% of 4.9 million would have been expended. We have tried to control that and it has reduced by about 10 million where we have had to utilize about 9.9 .9 million um, in, in excess. Um, the department continues to uh, be the primary funder um, and, and provides the majority of the funds for the operations of, of, of the board. In the current year, 23.5 million um, was provided compared to a 22.1 million. Um, that results in the line of revenue, total revenue of 39 million in the current year compared to 46 million. In terms of expenditure, then our highest um, expenditure our highest expenditure relates to employee costs and there's obviously history with regards to this line item um, and with regards to whether should it really be within the board itself or the trust should be absorbing employees. Um, currently, the expenses for employee costs amount to 28.9 million, which is a slight reduction from the previous year. Um, then general expenses, which will um, include uh, board members' fees, it will include auditor general payments, it will include payments of cleaning services, security services, all come up to 11.9 million, which is also a reduction from the 14.8 million. In the current year, Chair, the entity then um, lands itself in a deficit of 1.6 million compared to a surplus of 1.2 million that would have been made in the prior year. This is essentially a cash flow statement which removes the effects of accrual accounting um, and ultimately shows that the organization received physical cash of 38.2 million uh, in comparison to a 46.7 million in the prior and ended up spending 39.9 million of the 38.2 million, meaning it spent um, into its reserve, which it actually didn't really have, uh, about 1.7 million additional. And this we attribute to just the misalignment that is happening in the organization with regards to organizational objectives, um, not being aligned to the legal mandate, which then um, is creating a slight misalignment, well, not a slight misalignment, but a misalignment uh, within um, within the resources that are used to or are employed to achieve those particular objectives. Um, then with regards to Ingonyama Trust Chair, um, in terms of the Auditor General's opinion, um, we have also managed to maintain what would be um, a, a, an improvement um, from the previous years, which would, would have been an, a disclaimer of opinion in the current year, well, in the, in the previous audit cycle, when we arrived, we managed to change that to qualified. Um, and in the current year, we remain at qualified. However, um, in the 2020-21 audit cycle, the qualification would have been based on investment um, properties, which the Auditor General had said some of the land um, met that particular definition. And there were discussions with the board and the board ultimately uh, resolved that they will then be willing to apply um, the principles of GRUP um, 16 with regards to um, the recognition of investment properties. So in the current year, then the qualification is essentially on one line item 
um, which has an impact on, on, on expenses and liabilities. And that line item is essentially uh, rates, which municipalities continue to bill on Ngonyama Trust Board, uh, on Ngonyama Trust Land, apologies, on Ngonyama Trust Land, um, and thus uh, get, gets invoiced to, to the trust. Um, what the Auditor General essentially is saying is um, not all of it is contingent and thus uh, should be recognized as a pure liability as opposed to it just being contingent and thus awaiting the possibility of occurrence of an outcome or a, a future uh, event. Um, the other um, issue that the AG has raised as a material issue um, is with regards to the creation of subsidiaries within the trust um, and the general governance around, around those, which we have also highlighted um, to the board um, and the board is currently deliberating. With regards to the financial statements of the trust chair, um, the statement of financial position reflects um, that the entity has um, these subsidiaries, or well, at least one subsidiary that would have uh, been opened in the prior years, which is Ngonyama Holdings, with an initial investment of 10 million that was made. Uh, the board then subsequently approved payments of about 31 million to that subsidiary um, or to that particular control sub entity, um, which then the Auditor General is raising issues in terms of uh, terms of that loan with regards to in their audit report. With regards to receivable from exchange transactions, this has been um, a, a, a problematic line item in that um, before or the gross figure before any impairment of that line item is actually 150 million. Because of the nature of the debtors of Ingonyama Trust and because of um, what I could call the lack of a comprehensive, comprehensive capacity when it, it has, comes to dealing with um, with these particular issues, especially with regards to uh, internal controls within the trust, uh, you find that a large number of, of debtors um, ends up not paying and thus the period for collection um, gets longer and longer and longer, non-collection gets longer and longer and longer. As a result, their likelihood of non-repayment um, becomes more and more realistic. What we have done um, is based on evidence, we have then gone and impaired about 124 million of that 150 that I speak of, which then takes us to the 25,7 million for receivables from exchange transactions. Um, investments in other relate to uh, investments with financial houses, such as investments with Sunlam and Invest Investec, which would essentially be done from the access cash reserves um, that the trust has. Uh, because the trust does deal with passive income in the form of rentals, it does generate uh, quite a, a little bit of cash flow, which is why then you see that cash and cash equivalents also is sitting at 130 million um, compared to 140 million from. Um, the prior year. Um, in terms of um, investment properties, now we bring that adjustment that we uh, would have had a discussion with the board with um, in terms of GRAP 16, and suddenly for the first time you see that we have 156 million in investment properties. That essentially relates to properties that um, are the, 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 the the determination of what happens to them is within the control of the accounting authority and, and, and therefore income earning potential uh, would benefit the accounting authority, meaning there's no TC uh, or community authority that is designated for that particular, particular area. Property, plant and equipment, um, the majority of that, partic of that line, about 98%, which is 2,9 um, million, is actually uh, land. And uh, chair and committee, you'll remember that um, in the prior year, one of the biggest things that we managed to resolve, which moved us from that negative outcome to a qualification was we managed to resolve with National Treasury and the Auditor General the recognition um, and the accounting for land within the Ingonyama Trust. Um, the trust also has heritage assets in the form of one property that um, that is gazetted as a heritage property uh, with 15,9 million. Um, we have spoken with to um, the 10 million with regards to investments in, in controlled um, subsidiaries or entities. Um, in terms of liabilities in the trust chair, um, the total of 38 million is essentially made up of 33 million, which is uh, unallocated receipts. So 
with the potential of, um, of, of having to be returned to uh, having to be returned to the people who paid should we not be able to identify. And that comprises the majority of that particular item with, with about 3.4 million of payables being uh, the VAT that is due to SARS that is paid on, 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 on leases. That then takes um, the trust into a total net asset position of about 3.3 million. Um, in terms of 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 of, of, of its financial position, um, in terms of the income statement or the statement of financial performance, chair um, main revenue generator, as I've said, is leases, um, which in the current year and are quite steady over years because the trend is the corporations that uh, on commercial leases that do tend to pay, continue paying, regardless of the effort that may be put in uh, or not put in in terms of collection because of capacity issues. Uh, other income refers or relates to a farm, um, farms that we actually have, which would pay certain fees, like when sugar sugar cane is sold, uh, there would be sugar cane in, in income, but the majority of that are servitudes, um, which then bring that other income. Dividend income relates to the investments that we would have with uh, financial institutions and some offshore investments that are made under that 44 million that we saw in the statement of financial position. Um, and the remainder of the interest relates to the excess uh, cash and cash equivalents, uh, short-term investments, and the other interest relates to interest on uh, overdue debtors. Um, in the current year, the majority of the expenses relating to uh, general expenses, Chair, would have been the disbursement to beneficiaries of about 7.9 million compared to an 8.8 .8 million in, in, in the prior year. And that particular line item sits under the 17.3 million that we see as general expenses. Um, the 5.4 million and the 9.9 .9 million are what you see in the income in the board as monies that would have been expended to assist the board um, in ensuring um, operation um, in terms of administration. Um, in the current year, the bottom line improves from a deficit of 37.9 million to a deficit of 4.6 million. This again is a cash flow statement which essentially removes the impact of, of, of accrual accounting. Um, quite different from what the board reflects. Here you can see that there's excessive um, or there's excess um, income or inflow um, of cash and obviously payments um, are at 21.4 million for operations. Um, in the current year, um, the entity also did buy a security and pay for a security system, uh, which is classified as purchases of property, plant and equipment for 479,000. Um, another notable cash outflow would be the loans to control subsidiaries or controlled entities, which the Auditor General did raise an issue with regards to uh, the terms surrounding uh, of 31 million. Um, ultimately, cash and cash equivalents then at the end of the year are 130 million uh, chair compared to 140 million that would have existed in the prior. I'm going to lie in the chair with regards to the financial presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Team ITB. We're going to pack you for some time as we move on to the South African Veterinary Council. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair. Good, good afternoon, Honorable Chair and members. I, I am Dr. Nandi Pandutane, the President of the South African Veterinary Council. With me is Mr. Mungesimene, the registrar for the council. I'm going to be presenting the annual report from the period of April 2021 to the 31st March of 2022. I was not the president during that time. Uh, but I was the council member during the time and our review. The presentation consists of the um, abbreviations, the council members, our vision and meeting, mission, the executive summary, reports on the committees, registration, 
registration statistics, balance sheet income statement, and the SAVC executive mem staff members. I wish to apologize for our finance director. He had to attend to a family matter, so we will summarize on the financials. Um, this is the council members for the period. Uh, we are supposed to have been 20, but we had some members that resigned and we also lost one member uh, and all those were replaced. So in total, we are having about 25 members, but that includes the members that resigned and the one that we lost through death. The vision of the South African Veterinary Council is to be a custodian of quality veterinary standards. And our mission through the act is to serve the interests of the people and protect the animals and the environment of South Africa through setting and monitoring of veterinary standards. We function through the Veterinary and Para-Veterinary Professions Act, Act 19 of 1982, and in line with that, and our objectives are to regulate the practicing of the veterinary and para-veterinary professions and registration of such professionals. It is also to determine the standard of tuition and training of the institutions that offer the qualifications, be it diplomas, degrees, certifications. It is to exercise control over the professional conduct of the persons that are practicing the professions and to determine the standards of professional conduct of the persons practicing the professions. And also to encourage and promote efficiency in and responsibility concerning the practicing of the professions. It is also to protect the interest of the professions and to maintain and enhance the prestige, status and dignity of the professions and to ensure integrity of the people that are practicing these professions. And last but not least, it is also to advise the minister concerning any matter that affects the veterinary or para-veterinary professions. We continued as the council to implement our strategic goals and we call it a one strategy. Namely, we focused on doubling the good stories through the communication with the registries. We ensured our registries the better experience of the council through relevant quality information and good stories sharing. We delivered an improved veterinary team value appreciation and we enabled a range of electronic capabilities. We successfully implemented our strategic goals through achieving the following key milestones. We improved the communication by ensuring that we had about 141 electronic messages via our email platform, the MailChimp, to our registries. We ensured that about 283 registries participated on the annual declaration platform to comply to confirm compliance with all the requirements of the profession. We ensured 318 CPD continued professional development provider events that were successfully accredited through the online CPT provider portal application process. Through our thought leadership, we presented webinars that were directly targeting areas of importance and critical areas. We presented uh, webinars on investigation on registration matters, the human library and so on. And we also touched on the POPIA Compliance Act. During the COVID, we ensured we kept within the COVID protocols. We reduced our working on site and we are mainly hybrid. But even during that time, we ensured that our registries were not affected, they were able to get serviced by the regulator. We continued on ensuring our international liaisons are maintained. We are still part of the World Veterinary Association and we renewed and signed mutual recognition agreement with the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and the Australasian Veterinary Board Council. This agreement acknowledged the ongoing partnership of, of the South African Veterinary Council with the international counterparts and ensure that our standards in South Africa, are, although customized for South Africa, also meet the stringent regulations of the global regulatory landscape. We 
ensured that guidelines for authorization for non-registered persons who wish to render veterinary and para-veterinary services for veterinarians and veterinary nurses and veterinary technologists were developed and for, sorry, were reviewed. And then for the animal health technicians, there were no guidelines prior. These were developed. Promulgation of a new para-veterinary profession of the veterinary physiotherapist was achieved in December. And then we're able to register 61 veterinary physiotherapists. And we authorized about 71 people that wish to work under this uh, para profession. Because of the promulgation, we elected one person to represent the veterinary physiotherapist as in the council. And the rules for this para veterinary profession, the veterinary physiotherapist was submitted to the minister for approval and publication in the government gazette. We conducted uh, council meetings as requested and mainly through hybrid, virtual and physical as we're trying to uh, adhere to the protocols of COVID. Uh, we could not invite any people to participate in the open council meetings because of the issues of COVID. And we could not even afford to accommodate people to observe virtually because we had security concerns then, which we have now attended to. For the council, there was a govern governance workshop which was held to ensure that the councillors are informed and they were then taken through to topics that were relevant for the council to function. We held an annual Indaba in September, which was also a hybrid event, but the focus was on transformation, inclusivity, and expanding access to the veterinary education and services and the SAVC affirmed its commitment to a transformed and resilient veterinary industry. We also developed electronic voting, which uh, uh, resulted in maximum participation of the, the registries to vote for the new council that came into effect in August, 2022. We reviewed the rules of the para veterinary professions, veterinary nurses, technologists, laboratory animal technologists, and animal health technicians, and these were aligned with the rules of the veterinary profession. The process has been completed, and these sets of rules have been submitted to the minister for approval and also for publication to the government gazette. We attended to the challenges of the issues of how we conduct our investigation that came from the registries and we consulted with other regulatory bodies um, that uh, how are they conducting their investigation to ensure that we are in line with what the expectations of the legal industry. We are about to conclude those consultations and be able to present new sets of regulations on how we conduct our investigation going forward. We had a needs analysis that was done on the, for the profession to ensure the veterinary and para-veterinary services are identified what is out there, what is needed in the country. And this study was sponsored by Health and Welfare Center and we are awaiting the approval by the council in our first council meeting for this year and we are going to be able then to, to work with this uh, research. As indicated earlier, we had changes on the council that affected the council. We had the election of the veterinary physiotherapist representative, and we had members that resigned and had to be replaced. And we had the death of the representative from the veterinary nurses, and that was also replaced. And in the management, we appointed a deputy director investigation as part of the strategy to improve on the issues of investigation. And then the report on committees, the committees of the council met as required. And uh, these are the committees, continuing professional development, accreditation, committee on education, the EXCO, finance audit and risk management, food safety and security committee, the heritage and transformation of the professions, the inspections committee, the investigation committee, the registration and authorization committee, the review committee, specialization committee, and the standards committee. 
about 6,629 veterinary and para-veterinary professions were, uh, were registered at the end of 31st March 2021, and about 832 persons were authorized to perform either veterinary or para-veterinary professional services where there was a need and it was able motivated. Our registry database, that 6,629 is, is as follows. We have about 52% being veterinarians, about 3% being veterinary specialists, 4% being the compulsory community service veterinarians. They, this includes the 2021 veterinarians that qualified last year, and about 11% being, being veterinary nurses, 5% being veterinary technologists, 23% being animal health technicians and 0.22 being laboratory animal technologists and 1% being veterinary physiotherapists. As indicated earlier, I'm going to summarize on the issues of finance uh, as we do not have our finance uh, director. Our um, outlook, financial outlook, firstly, we depend on the registries for our finances, for our revenue. And we had about 95% of our registries paying their annual maintenance and uh, registration fee. And of that money, we were able to use about 97% of it on our strategic goals. And the financial outlook of the institution is, very, is positive with uh, assets to the value of 35 million. We did have a depreciation, a decrease in the equipment and the property because we did not buy any new equipment and the ones that we have depreciated slightly. We had an increase in the investment where 10 million was further invested for a medium term fixed investment. Um, we also achieved a clean audit when it comes to the issues of, of audit. Um, the, CEO can assist where I have left off. But before that, this is the administration of the SAVC as led by Mr. Mongezimene. And that is all from my side. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Mongezimene can also come in if I have left anything. Thank you. Uh, to, to you, Chairperson, I, I, I'm covered on my side. I think the president has covered more or less everything. Uh, we will respond to the questions that will be posed, posed uh, pertaining to the annual report presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Sadak, colleagues. That was ITV and Sadak. Can we start with Honorable Kappa? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on ITB, I just have a few questions. One is the concern on the relation between the capacity of the building of capacity of the traditional councils which seems to have been done uh, well. And that now versus the capacity that is uh, referred to as uh, the cause of e shortcomings. Why is there, why is there this resources seemingly would be taken much to the traditional councils more than where there's supposed to be capacity building for performance. And I'm also concerned where the, the reason what that is given for non-achievement indicates somehow that it will never be achieved because there's no indication that because of APCT it was not achieved and therefore it can be achieved in the other way. I, hand, I only have those two for ITB. And for VETS, one, just a relation with ARC as researchers. 
as, as, as we know that also that ARC has told us and has shown us uh, mobile clinics. How do the Veterinary uh, Council and their personnel interact or work or cooperate with this? Do they also have any involvement in the training and designing of training? Lastly, what is the spread of the veterinary services, the personnel? Would they say to me that they have one uh, technician or one nurse or one in every district or in every local municipality or every ward? I just want to be sure that there's a effective spread or this thing of the, of the services deliver of the services to the people that are meant for. Because I don't want to believe that the Veterinary, Veterinary Services Council would be about them only. Only not about safeguarding the profession because that's, that's another trick. So it is also important that while they get organized and they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are structured, the services to the people are important. Just those clarities, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kappa. Honorable Mbagama. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will be corrected if I'm wrong, but I thought I heard the initial presenter on ITB saying that um, the the, the compliment for the, the staff compliment for the board, or should I say the board's compliment should be nine, but they only have seven. I would just like to find out what is the problem there? Have they resigned? Are they going to be replaced, etc. And then um, the CFO, I think it's Vilagazi, said that um, the Ingonyama Trust, now I'm not sure whether he was referring to the board or the trust or both, but he said that they got a qualified audit. And yet, and I stand uh, corrected by my colleagues here, I have in my notes that the Ingonyama Trust Board got an unqualified audit opinion with findings on compliance, the same as the previous year, uh, on misstatements on the financials, and also um, in terms of a lack of appropriate steps to prevent irregular expenditure. So I, I'm just, I, I don't know where he gets the qualified audit, uh, the, the qualified audit opinion from, or, or maybe he, I'm the one who's mistaken. If you can just clarify that, please. Um, and then the employee costs are actually quite high in, in Gonyama Trust. They've always been, but I'm sitting here wondering, uh, if the 28 million in employee costs justifies the entity, does the, the number of staff who are there, who actually generate this 28 million in terms of salaries, does it justify the size of the entity? I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. And, and maybe what, what, what the CFO needs to do is to just tell me uh, what are the approved posts and what is the staff complement at the moment? And what is the variance? Um, what I'd also like to, to understand, maybe they can send the information instead of just telling us, because we might not grasp it. And also tell us what designations are there, because I'm really interested in, in, in the hierarchy of the organization, because 28 million is quite a large sum chairperson. And I'm thinking, uh, I'd like to see the hierarchy. Um, maybe it's 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 what do they call it? What do they normally say? It's 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 there are more people on top than than at the bottom. It's top heavy. That's the word I'm I'm looking for. Maybe the organization is top heavy, you know, with executives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if we can have the approved posts, the staff complement at the moment, the variance, and then I would like to see the designations with com commensurate salaries. How much are they paying these people as well? Um, if they can just uh, acknowledge that and say that they will be sending it to us. And then um, provision. Oh, this is, sorry. 
oh, the impairment. I was just out of the room and I came back and I heard that something had been impaired resulting in um, receivables from exchange transactions of 25 million, I think it is. If the CFO can repeat what he said around that. So if he can please just repeat uh, the explanation around the 25722. And then general expenses of 17324, if you can just um, give us um, um, a breakdown of that figure. What is the 17324? Now, that is what I have on the Ingonyama Trust. Yes, that is all I have on Ingonyama Trust. And then SAVEC. Um, what I'd like to know from, from SAVEC is, under the problem with uh, foot and mouth, I'd like to understand the services that they give. You know, normally there's a ratio of, uh, let me make an example. You might find there's a ratio of policemen to certain people on the ground in terms of services. I'm just trying to find out if there is a similar prescribed ratio within CERVEC of the veterinary services as against the animals on the ground, because surely we should be having an idea, even if it's not exact, of the animals on the ground. And, and I'd like, is there, the question is, is there a prescribed ratio of services on the ground? How many doctors do they have? How many nurses do they have? And, 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 and what are they all doing? Is this enough to um, take care of the uh, foot and mouth disease, that, the problem with foot and mouth that we have? Thank you, Chair, that's all from me. Thank you, Honorable Mbabama. Honorable Matias. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chair. Well, I've got questions for Nguyenyam. Uh, <clears throat> Firstly, the questions relate to the land that Nguyenyama Trust has Nguenyama Transport has control or other ownership over. And these questions come directly from the constituency in, in, the, in case that uh, one, is that there is what is called Isimangali, so wet, wetland park authority in Kanyakudum Shabawalinga. And this is Mangali, so we are told that Mangali So Wetland Park Authority operates on the land that is owned by Ngonyama Trust. And this is Mangali So Port. Evicts our people, harass them, remove them from the ancestral villages and all sorts of things that they do to our people. The second point about that is people who live around Ufolozi River on the mouth of Ufolozi River are, similar, are in a similar way subjected to harassment and closure of water supply by Ismangaliso. The question is, does the Ngonyama Trust has authority over the, the, the areas that I've mentioned? If so, is the Ismangali so wetland park acting with consent and or permission of the Ngonyama Trust? I'll be interested to get answers to those questions. Now let me let me let me turn to the financial report. Uh, Honorable Chair, look, the, it is contained in the AG's report that the ITP did not follow supply chain prescripts in which some service providers 
brochured services without three written quotations. In some instances, quotations accepted from suppliers did not have declaration or disclosure of whether those who are providing such services are employed by the state or not. And in some cases, contracted service providers were approved without delegated authority by the ITB. If all, all of these are true, as are reported in the AG's report, isn't this a recipe for corruption? And if these are true, what corrective measures ITB intends to, to take? Secondly, with the trust, Honorable Chair, the qualification of property plans and equipment is reported as a recurring and repeating qualification. And if indeed this is a repeating qualification, the question is, should we expect that this trend will continue in the following year unabatedly? If it would not continue, what measures are in place to ensure that that doesn't repeat itself going forward? Thirdly, there is a subsidiary investment called Ingonyama Holdings which was formed in 2019. There are no financial statements for it. And the question is why? It was only accounted for on a cost basis in the financial statement of the trust. Is that in keeping with the prescripts of the financial, Public Financial Management Act? If not, what correct measures are going to be taken. Lastly, it is reported that ITB has exceeded its budget and overspent on employees and human, human, human costs or HR and in other general expenses in amount of about 17 million. This is a serious indictment. This is a serious indictment on ITB. And if it doesn't make a, a going concern that warrants that it must be attended to, what is the view and the take of the of ITB? What corrective measures have been planned to correct this pattern and trend going forward, Honorable Chair? Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Matthias. Honorable Pattern. Let's then move to Honorable Masipa. Um, he's at the airport chair. I'm not sure he'll be taking any okay. questions. He's driving to the Thanks. airport. Thanks, uh, Honorable Mbaba. Honorable Marshall. Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. I don't have many questions for ITB. The only thing that one will seek clarity on is the the High Court judgment that was that happened in June 2022, which was pro prohibiting the conclusion of the residential and agricultural business on the trust land, and this resulted in in, in such type of a lease application being put on hold. I just wanted to get what is their medication plan and what will be their targets. 
because they are, they've been reduced. I just wanted to get clarity on that chair. I think I'm fine. Thank you, Honorable Marshall. Honorable Briet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I um, have two questions for ITB and then I have a question for SAVAC. Um, so I'll start with ITB. Um, and I was just wondering if we can get detail from, uh, from ITB um, as to why the AGSA is unhappy with the transactions of the Ingonyama holdings and um, where did IH actually invest that 31 million that they reported on? Um, I think that's very pertinent. And I think Honorable Matias made mention of financial statements and all the details. So I would just like to add that to his, his set of questions. And then, Chairperson, I would also like ITB to clarify what is the role of Nguenya at Ngonyama Holdings and how did this come about? Because isn't it a conflict of interest to be both the board chairman and the chair of investment organ? I mean, that just doesn't sound right to me. So if they can clar clarify that, Chairperson, um, that, that would be, be appreciated. Um, then, Chairperson, to get to SAVAC, and I think Honorable Mbabama did touch briefly on our recent FMB outbreak. Um, and I would like to find out from SAVAC, um, in terms of, of the, the current FMD outbreak, um, what was their role? Did they have a role? Um, what part did they play in that? Um, did they assist the community or then the vets that that part, that um, assist the community? And what is the relationship between our private vets and our state vets, um, specifically with regard to FMD? FMD? Um, and then lastly, do they foresee themselves actually as having um, or, or a more active role that they need to or should be playing with FMD as we've seen it was um it, it was completely you know um um our vets were understaffed they didn't have the correct information there was a lot of frustration not only from the farmers but from the vets and I think a, a, a council like SAVAC um should have been instrumental in in providing that clarity um so chairperson thank you so much I would leave it at that thank you honorable Briant. This Honorable Chetebek, I see her on the platform. I don't know if she can hear us. Doesn't look like. Um, thank you. I think uh, my colleagues has uh, asked most of the questions. Probably as and when you respond, ITB. I would also want to find out why was. Uh, in Gonyama Holding not integrated into your financial statements. Do you agree with Auditor General that uh, this holding needs to be integrated into your financial statements? And uh, that will be all from myself. I have nothing for Savak. Can we start with ITV? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll start with the questions of Honorable Tap on the on the issue of capacity. Um, the Chair, the, the the way that the organisation has has developed is that a lot of the capacity that is here. Um, Maybe let me not say a lot, a lot, lot, but um, the capacity that is here, you'll, you, you'll find that it's generally people that came in at much, much lower levels that they then grew within the organization. But at the time that they were recruited, the, the organization was not looking for the type of competencies that are required for it to be efficient or to be effective. So as a result, the capacity that you need, the technical capacity that you need is not necessarily in the places where um, you, you, you have people. You have people in terms of physical bodies being there, but there is in the technical capacity to, to, to develop policy. So as a consequence, you end up with um, the, 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 the lack of performance. In terms of the concern that Konevitskapa was raising is that we don't seem to be 
suggesting a solution for this problem. Chair, at the present moment, we sit in a position where only the department can help us. We have approached the department because it does have the necessary capacity that it makes available some officials uh, on an interim basis just to come in, uh, facilitate policy development, and then walk, walk out. So, Chair, we, we, we're dealing with that still with the department. Uh, the, the last time we engaged, which is, which is quite recently, um, there was some meeting of minds that they will make the capacity available. Um, on the questions from Honorable Mbabama, uh, why the board is, ha is having seven members instead of nine. Chair, what had happened is um, at the time that the, P the term of office of the board expired in August 2020, minister then appointed an interim board. Uh, but at the time, because of the act requires that minister must consult with with Ngonyama, must consult with the premier, with the chairperson of the national house of the provincial house of traditional leaders. I I understand that there were certain consultations that occurred that resulted in the ninth member not being appointed. So when the minister appointed the interim board, um, instead of appointing eight to add to Ingonyama, only on only seven were appointed and and one person was not. Um, then last year in July, I joined in Gonyama Trust. I was part of the newly appointed interim members of the board. Then when I became the head of the secretariat, then I had to resign from the board. Then there was a vacancy of seven. But then you had situation in the royal family with, with the passing of Ngonyama and therefore affecting the consultation processes for the appointment of the board. There is a process in place right now that the minister has undertaken that she is still pursuing of getting uh, the board properly appointed in the sense that we still have what is called an interim board. So that would be my answer with respect to that chair. Uh, on the issue of the qualification, um, Mr. Vilagas is gonna deal with those issues, but briefly chair is that because of the listing of Ingonyama Trust Board as an entity, and the non-listing of Ingonyama Trust. So therefore what is required is for Ingonyama Trust Board to produce an annual performance plan on the basis of which it then produces an annual report. So what is before the portfolio committee is Ingonyama Trust Board annual report. But our financial regulations do provide that we should also um, submit the annual financial statements of Ingonyama Trust. So therefore what you have is a situation where Ingonyama Trust Board is not qualified, but Ingonyama Trust Financials are qualified. So that is where the confusion came that was then confusing Honorable Mbabama. I'll, I'll request that the, 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 the CFO, um, okay, maybe, maybe let me deal with the issue of the employee costs. The, the concern is that the employee costs are quite high. And this is what is causing that. Um, the separation of Ingonyama Trust from Ingonyama Trust Board, what it does is that it results in Ingonyama Trust Board only in its financials reflecting in the main what it receives from government as a grant. Because of that separation, the activities of Ingonyama Trust Board in managing the trust that result in it generating revenue for the trust are not reflected in the statements of Ingonyama Trust Board. What is therefore worrying members is that what you see in Ingonyama Trust Board are expenses. But because those expenses are, un, are not directly related to revenue, you therefore cannot tell that there is actually value because all you see is expenditure. But if these entities were one, once you start reading them together, you'll come to, you might come to different conclusions whether or not there is too much in terms of, 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 of employee costs. 
But what has then has happened because of that separation, what has happened then is that the board has also taken that view that there is so much that is spent in employee cost. And as a consequence of that, um, out of the 60 employees that you see in the, in, 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 in the annual report, we currently are sitting at 45 because uh, 10 contracts have been terminated and uh, three employees took a voluntary severance packages because the board is reducing capacity so as to deal with this apparent uh, huge expenditure in employee costs vis-a-vis the income of the board. So, 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 so that is what has happened and that is what is happening at the present moment as a consequence of the impression that um, there's too much expenses vis-a-vis -vis revenue, which is basically caused by the fact that the trust is separated from the board. Um, what are the approved, approved posts? I think that, as I've said, um, we, we've got the structure of Ingonyama Trust Board had 60 employees. Uh, at the beginning of this financial year, two left. We had 58. Now we have, we're sitting at 45. Uh, whether the, the, the organization is top heavy, no. This organization has got about four senior managers, really. And then the rest is, is, is lower level staff. It's the way that the organization developed. It developed so much with low level capacity that what you then have is a very huge gap between um, lower level and, and high level. What you find, you'll find a situation that you've got a level 14 that manages level seven, level eight, and, and there's nothing in between. So, 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 so those are some of the issues that have resulted in the way that the organization was structured and developed. Um, the issue around impairment, um, the CFO will deal with that. Uh, that issue of 25 million that Honorable Mbapama was asking about and the 17 million. With respect to the question from Honorable Matthias, uh, the land that is under the control of Smangali Soweit Land Park Authority. Uh, coincidentally, in, in, a, in a meeting that we had yesterday, the chairperson of the board raised this issue that Ismangaliswa Wetland Park Authority um, has gone on and evicted or sought to evict people that are residing on Ingonyama Trust land because the, that land somehow was included in the, in, in the area or under the jurisdiction of Ismangaliswa Wetland Park Authority. It's, a, it's an issue that uh, I understood um, he was dealing with. I know that at the time I was in the department, there were even some task teams that existed of a number of departments together with communities in this area to deal with issues, but that related to Smangali. So some of them related to those evictions and some of them related to the animals getting out of Smangali, so um, terrorizing communities surrounding the park. So, so at the present moment, I, we, I cannot provide a very direct answer in terms of what is happening. It's just a matter that arose and that the chairperson reflected uh, he, 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 he was dealing with. So um, that's uh, how far I can go with that question with respect uh, of, of Honorable Matthias. Um, the, the truth is that the ITB uh, would have authority for as long as the land belonged to it. Of course, with restrictions, if it has been proclaimed as part of the uh, office Mangali. So um, I believe that it's a matter that can be resolved between the between Ingonyama Trust Board and the Mangali Soil Trade Park Authority. But we I just don't have facts before me right now as I as I respond to the question. So it's a matter that we can explore further and provide further details to the committee. Um, the issues relating to the supply chain not, processes not being followed, the CFO is going to deal with that. Uh, so as the issue relating to the Ngonyama holdings, the CFO will deal with that. Um, Honorable Marshall, on the issue of the high court judgment and what is the mitigation plan, 
share the reality is that the ITTP is basically in transition right now. The fact is, it is reducing its capacity and it's redesigning its organizational structure. Depending on what comes out of that process, it's going to have an impact in terms of how it then deals with issues of performance, how it structures itself such that it is able to deliver on what it sets out to achieve. So, so it, that mitigation plan is going to come in the context of the processes that are going on right now within the organization. Um, as, as a result, I wouldn't want to offer a very clear answers to what is going to happen because <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it's that period of uncertainty where you're exploring a variety of things. Um, I think once the board has gone through that process and decisions have been made, we can then see how do we deal with issues of performance. Of course, against that which we would have targeted. Um, on a bread, um, the CFO is going to deal with issues relating to the IH. Uh, but it is true that um, the IH has got two directors, one of them being the chairperson of the board, the other being the former CEO of the ITB, Mr. Mkwanad. Um, they were, their appointment to the Ingonyama Holdings as directors, it's something that was approved by the board at the time. So that's how they got to be directors of Ikonyama Holdings. Um, the, the issue why it was not integrated, why its, its financials were not integrated into those of, of, of Ingonyama Trust, the, 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 the CFO is going to deal with that. Thank you, Chairperson. I think I've touched on basically everything except those that the CFO will deal with. Thank you. Chair, with Thank your you, permission. CFO. They, they, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, maybe let me start with Umam Umbaba Mutendia Kumsha, <laughs> and I speak fast. Um, I'm going to just try and, and, and re-explain the situation with, with receivables as reflected on Note 11. What I was trying to get across um, is, is the fact that total receivables, um, as reflected in, in the statement of financial position, um, at 25.7 million. However, that is the net amount, which means it is net of an impairment uh, that is has been made for uncollectability. Um, this impairment we review on an annual basis and obviously will increase or decrease depending on our assessment of whether we're likely to be able to recover those monies <clears throat> or not. Um, so in, in terms of the figures, what happens is the gross amount of, of, of receivables within the trust um, which is all lease income that would have been generated uh, through these agreements, all servitude income which would have been generated that not been collected per se, comes to 150 million. Um, and if you start looking at the aging that is disclosed on note number 11, it starts reflecting um, how old these debts are. And because of the policy that the trust has, which says uh, impair and consider for impairment anything that is above 120 days because of the scientific evidence that proves that we are likely or unlikely to actually recover those monies or it becomes increasingly difficult the longer the term of uncollectability is, um, then we merely... Um, impair everything that is 120 days and above, with obviously the exception of a few anomalies. So what would have happened is in the current year, uh, 142.8, um, 142 million, 142,000 million uh, would have would have uh, been sitting over 90 days. But there was a process with regards to telecoms that had already initiated with regards to. Um, a discussion of escalations, which were also sitting as uncollected amounts, um, which is why then you see us impairing only 100 or providing for impairment only 124 of the 140, 142 million, um, which then brings us down to uh, the 25.7 million from the gross of 150 million. So that's generally the story behind um, in, in impairments. Um, the CEO has clarified the issue of, of qualified versus unqualified. Um, there's two entities, essentially, one which is the board and one which is the trust. The trust remains qualified and the board um, is unqualified. 
um, in that respect. With regards to general expenses, um, the breakdown, I'd given a high level breakdown, which essentially uh, spoke to of that 17.3 million, about 7.9 million was disbursement to beneficiaries uh, for whatever reason. Some TCs would opt for bursaries for a few uh, children. Some TCs will opt for um, e events that are heritage events, et cetera. Um, but the total disbursement that would have been done out of those general expenses to beneficiaries was 7.9 million. Other items then include agricultural project expenses of 1,1 million, audit remuneration of 1,7. I'm just picking, Chair, the ones that are, um, are clearing the material. Consulting, professional, and legal fees, the majority of which is legal fees, are 2,7 million. Um, land tenure management uh, would be 2,2 million. Um, and then the remainder of the, of the payments are all, or the remainder of the expenses are all below. Um, below the 1 million mark. Um, all right, Chair, with regards to Honorable Matias's questions, um, I'm going to start with the one relating to PPE. Um, I heard property, plant, and equipment, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, Chair, the Honorable Matias was probably referring to um, something else because the issues on property, plant, and equipment were resolved in the prior year. Um, what the issue would have been was the entity seemingly was, was struggling. The trust was struggling to recognize um, and disclose uh, property, plant, and equipment, which was mainly land as it's a material component um, in line with um, GRAP 17. Uh, this would have required valuations. It would have required identification of the ex complete extent of all the properties that are available um, that are within the control of the organization. So when we arrived, um, because this had been such a contentious issue for a long time, we decided to, to have a discussion with the accountant general where we eventually lined on the correct accounting treatment, which was already affected last year. Um, and so it has been corrected. And unless the entity regresses back into accounting for, for, for land the way it has been done before, there shouldn't be issues as guidance has kind of authoritative guidance that is based on, 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 on an IGRAP, an interpretation of a, a GRAP standard has actually been issued and has been concurred uh, between ourselves, the Auditor General and, and National Treasury. What does continue to occur um, as a finding that comes through and carries the qualification, which is why today we are not sitting in an unqualified with finding position, is that expenditure relating to rates. Um, we had initiated a discussion with COCTA to be able to, to, to at least agree on the technical side of the recognition of, 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 of um, uh, these expenses. And COCTA and, and ourselves were on the same path and we had brought in um, the top three municipalities, which was Eteguini, I think um, Mandini and, uh, Mandini and uh, Newcastle. Um, to have a discussion. Um, however, without a broad approval on, on these processes, uh, you can only go so far as secretariat. Um, and so it, it starts requiring board um, involvement and a clear intention to actually resolve these as it affects and as impact of affecting a lot more stakeholders. We have identified that municipalities have been rating incorrectly and their rating is inconsistent with the definitions of a property and an owner in the Municipal Property Rates Act um, chair. Uh, with regards to um, the ITV has exceeded its budget on employee costs. Um, Honorable Matias says it's a serious indictment um, and it affects going concern. What is the view of the ITB on, on, on this? This is um, an issue again that probably continues and will continue until the structuring of the organization, which is what CEO was talking about, is actually fixed. Because of how the organization has developed over a period of time, there is a requirement and a need to go back to the drawing board in terms of maybe not clarifying because we believe it's quite clear, but in terms of um, 
understanding and, 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 and documenting organizational objectives that stem from the legal mandate. Because anything else that will be done if the, the, the starting point is not the legal mandate will ultimately show a disjunction or a, a misalignment between the employment of resources and the achievement of organizational objectives. Um, I can say these things like this, Chair, because I'm a seconded CFO uh, from the department. I was seconded with the intention, Minister, with the intention of um, of rectifying the financial uh, affairs within the trust. So the, 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 there is a need for the board to go back to the drawing board with regards to strategic structuring of the organization so that uh, what you put in is really, um, really speaks to what you what what you get out, and you can kind of have a marrying relationship um, between all of all 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 of those. So until those issues are, dis are, are discussed and finalized, there won't be really a change in how these financials um, look. With regards to the issues on SCM, yes, um, non-compliance with prescripts relating to procurement are always uh, indicative of failures in internal controls to an extent that they could even be indicative of fraud and, and, and corruption. Um, but the issue is in order to be able to address these issues which are emanating from capacity issues, because for example, if I could give um, an example, like CEO was saying, uh, within finance, it's myself on, 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 on the top as the CFO. There's no actual uh, SCM manager. And the next will be a senior um, a SCM administrator. So there's obviously a capacity issue that needs to be dealt with, but it needs to be dealt with within a systematic manner, which basically sees the understanding of the mandate, translating into organizational objectives, translating into resource needs, and then seeing those resources being employed for the achievement of those um, of, 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 of those objectives. Um, then with regards to Ngonyama holding chain, um, this one is a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a difficult one to answer. Um, and I, I, I think it, it might be better for board members, um, specifically Dr. Kunda, to respond uh, to, to, to these ones. Uh, the reason why I say that is the board and myself have very material differences when it comes to certain issues of governance within the entity, specifically relating to Ngonyama holding. Um, the question that Honorable Tlape asks and Honorable Bri it also delves on is why is there no consolidation? And we had requested um, financials because the year end is September for Ngonyama holding. So there would have been uh, financial statements for consolidation that would have been required in accordance with the financial reporting framework that is being employed for by the trust. However, um, what happens at Ngonyama holdings uh, is, is not, and I'm trying here, Chair, not to, to say something that will be contrary to what the board will say. But what happens is that information then does not uh, come through, which we then told the board about, um, and the AG actually reported on it. So we agree with the Auditor General in that there is a requirement for consolidation um, in accordance with um, Grab 32, if I'm not mistaken, or 31. Uh, however, that information is just simply not available. So we couldn't manufacture it to be able to create consolidated financial statements. And thus, um, they are actually recognized um, at, at cost. Um, the ITB, to clarify the role of the chairperson, which I think um, the CEO has spoken about, I think Dr. Kunda is in a better position um, as we would have not been there at the time which approvals to create this entity was uh, together with where the monies for Ngonyama Holdings were invested. Initially, the first investment of 10 million would have been paid to attorneys because Ngonyama Holding would have not had uh, any bank account, but that was before our time. Um, we would have found that information when we had to compile financial statements. Um, the subsequent payments of 31 million then would have been dispersed as loans, which then the AG is complaining about the fact that there's no terms to the to, to, to those loans, which speak to issues of, of, of governance within the entity um, that if I were to really respond to, we'll draw a direct line on the sand uh, between ourselves and the board, and I wouldn't want to do that in a, in a public forum chair. Um, I think I have answered or attempted to answer the majority of the questions. Uh, if I left anything out, Chair, um, I can be guided. And thank you very much, Chair.
maybe Chairperson, through you, maybe on the issue that the CFO is saying, maybe the board need to respond to um, about the directorship of Ingonyama Holdings. Um, Ingonyama Holding as a subsidiary of Ingonyama um, Trust Board or Ingonyama Trust, um, there is really nothing by if the directors of either the trust, the trust board are becoming representative of as a shareholder on to that subsidiary, it's something that you'll find in governance that it happens. So whilst I'm saying this, um, this decisions and all of this, they were made with the previous board that is before I joined the board in 2020. But in terms of this, that structure in itself, is not a problem. Perhaps there's something that can be looked at is whether should it have been a chairman of the board or it could have been any other, perhaps a member of the board. Um, I think that was the issue, whether there's conflict or not. Um, it being a subsidiary is not a conflict because it is to look after the interest of the shareholder in that, in that company. So on, the, on that level, Chairperson, I don't see a conflict. Thank you. Thank you, ITB. Honorable Chair. Yes, Dr. Matiasen. Well, the more the represent, representative of the Ngonyama Trust speaks, the more we get more we get confusion. The CAO just said that the material differences that he is in possession of uh, are different from the accounting material that are in perhaps in, 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 in possession of the Gonyama audits. I guess that the the holdings is subsidiary of the Ngonyama Trust. And whatever that happens there, the board should be seized with what is happening there. And the principles of accounting must be the same. I will ask that uh, we politely request that uh, the board and the ITB go back and look into these uh, conflicting accounting statements and uh, similar accounting principles. That's the first point. The second point is that this, the, the CFO says uh, he's in the way of any repeating uh, transgressions in relation to property plans and equipment. If we can all be patient to indulge one another, honorable chair. It is in the AGES report where it, it, it indicates that, and I would, I would ask, ask that uh, just as I propose that we deal with the previous question that I've raised, this must also be dealt in, in a similar way. But the, the AG, and in this case, I'll try to quote her, I'll quote her in verity. She says, quote unquote, I was unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence that management has properly accounted for land to the value of 1.8 billion due to the supporting information not submitted. The trust did not properly account for property, plants, and equipment in accordance with GRAP 17. Property, plants, and equipment. This was due to survey diagrams not submitted and inadequate controls in place to correctly value the properties. Consequently, I was not able to determine the full extent of the property, plant, and equipment 
of about 28.21 billion rand as shown in note 21 to the finance statement as it was in practical, in, in practicable to do so. So honorable chair, it is in that context that I said that this has got a serious indictment and will implore upon the board and the ITB and the Gwenyama Trust, please let's deal with these serious graphic irregularities and breaches, which really undermines the spirit and the letter of the prescripts and the legislation that governs public institutions more so when taxpayers' monies are involved. Can we, in the future, in the, in the written form, get proper answers as to what happened here and why are we getting conflicting reports in, in relation to what the AG has reported and what the CFO and the management of the board and the, and the Ngoenyama Trust are either aware of or are not aware of. We can't go on like this, Honorable Chair, and we are doing this restrained in how we, we address these matters for the respect we have for uh, Ngoenyama, uh, the king, not only the king of the Zulus, but our king as South Africans. And we employ on those who deal with day-to-day -day business of the Ngonyama Trust to pay particular attention to these issues so that we don't find ourselves having to be in this situation, having to ask these kind of questions, painful as they may be. Some of them may be seen to be direct, the sign of disrespect to Isilo Samabans. So we're appealing to our colleagues, please let's pay attention to our work and ensure that uh, the books and everything of the Ngonyama Trust are in order. Diabolela Star. Thank you, Honorable uh, Matthias. As and when Ngonyama takes those points, just to also highlight and remind the team that um, on our program, there's a meeting scheduled on the 18th of this month, the meeting with the minister, also to deal with issues of ITB and the master of the court as per the resolution of this committee. So I think we will get that clarity. And I agree with you, uh, Honorable Matthias, that the more they explain, the more confusing it, the more confusing it gets. So I would uh, also say, let's follow up on these matters also on that meeting of the 18th, because it's set just to deal with these issues when the minister has been invited. Probably she will be present with the ITB and we will be dedicating that time to be dealing with all these matters. If we agree, then we will move to Sadak. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, with regards to the questions that were posed by Honorable Tapa, the first one pertaining to the cooperation with the ARC and the mobile clinics. I must say that the SAVC as a regulator does not provide the service of the mobile clinics directly. Uh, be that as it may, we do register and approve that the registries that have mobile clinics, be it its government or any registry, can utilize those mobile clinics. So we don't offer that service directly. With regards to training, uh, also as a regulator, we do not provide training directly to the registries or to the members of public, but we do participate in some awareness campaigns, uh, working together with other relevant stakeholders. In as far as the training is concerned, we utilize a number of institutions that are providing training to the veterinarians and the para-veterinary professions. Uh, that we are regulating. Uh, 
Uh, for instance, we work with the University of Pretoria, with UNISA, with uh, TADI, uh, University of Northwest, TUT, and Equilibrium. They are the ones that are offering uh, training interventions. These are the uh, uh, tertiary institutions that we work with. But as the council, we regulate them, we set the standards of training and education. And then with regards to the issue of the spread of the services, uh, the information at our disposal is reflecting that there is a high concentration of veterinarians within the rural, sorry, within the urban areas. And there is a shortage in the rural areas. We have been working with a number of stakeholders to try to rectify the situation. For instance, the council has approved the rules that will allow the para-veterinary professionals like your animal health technicians to run their own practices now, not to operate under the vets. It is those rules are with the minister for approval. As soon as they are approved, the animal health technicians can be able to operate in the rural areas and the farms and stuff and be able to run their own practices uh, with a limited scope that is linked to their qualifications and their expertise, of course. So that's a groundbreaking change that the council has done to ensure that there is a even distribution of these services from the people that are in the rural areas can benefit as well. With regards to the question that was posed by Honorable Lemba Bama uh, regarding the, 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 the prescribed ratio, in terms of the international norm, the international norm is that there must be between 200 and 400 veterinarians per million of a country's population. But the picture here in South Africa is totally different. Here we have about between 60 to 70 vets per million. So that's a clear indication that we have a serious challenge when it comes to veterinarians and also other para veterinary professions that we are regulating as well. There are also some interventions that we have been making as council, for instance, there is a program that we are doing hand in glove with the health and welfare CETA, wherein the health and welfare CETA will be funding students that are going to be studying veterinary science and other uh, qualifications that are pertaining to the industries or the professions that we are regulating. And then in terms of uh, the question that was posed by Honorable Britt pertaining to the relationship between the state and the private vets, uh, there is that relationship. We are working together with the department, although we are also regulating the department, more especially the veterinary services of the department, but we do engage with the chief veterinary officer on a regular basis when, it's, when it comes to matters that are linked to the professions that we are regulating and issues including the facilities that they are owning as government. Uh, the president is going to deal with the issues that are pertaining to the foot and mouth disease and other disease control measures that we are involved in. But so far, I must say that we have been involved directly in all the stakeholder engagements like your animal health forum, the department and other stakeholders that are involved in this outbreak of foot and mouth disease. And these are the engagements that we have been having so far to ensure uh, that the people, more especially the people that are in the farms, uh, people that are in the rural areas are conscientized about uh, this outbreak, but uh, the president will add on this particular aspect. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Mangezi. Uh, the one area that you have not mentioned is the collaboration with food and agriculture organization also around the reskilling of the animal health technician to ensure that the unemployed graduates are able to work for own gain. So that initiative is being done with the SAVC and the training institutions that are offering the animal health qualification. Um, on the issues of disease control, the council is involved in the awareness. We were involved with the rabies control last year and this year in September, and we're also involved with the FMD. But there is room for improvement on how we engage with provinces, and we also engage with Dalrat. We have indicated on our first ESCO meeting that we held in, on the 5th of October that we need to approach the DG, Mr. Ramasodi, to also meet with the 
team chief veterinary officer uh, at national and, and arrange a meeting with the provisional chief veterinary program so that we can sit down as, as SABC, as the regulating body and, and the provinces to chat whether the veterinary strategy that is the national document is being applied and to look at the numbers of the personnel within the state veterinary services, the vets and the paravets, to see what can we do and to also involve the institutions that are offering these qualifications to check the output of those as clearly there is a scarcity of the skill as Umongezi has indicated that we are not meeting the international standards of how many vets per the a million population. Uh, we are not directly having an active role because we are constrained because we are the regulator, but we are working and willing to engage with all the stakeholders. And we are also working with the associations to achieve the issue of um, well-maintained animal health industry in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I see the hand of Adele. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Chair and uh, Honorable Members. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I am Adele Howard, the Senior Manager from the Auditor General responsible for the audit of Ngoniyama Trust Board and Ngoniyama Trust. I would just like to clarify um, it was said that uh, property plans and equipment was a qualification. In that briefing document, we had included um, previous qualifications of previous years. So the one improvement at uh, Ingunyama Trust this year is that they are not qualified on property plans and equipment. So that briefing document included explanatory notes and was dealing with previous years. So for the current year, the only qualifications were on the municipal property rates, the contingent liabilities, and uh, the non-consolidation of, of the Ngunyama holdings. Um, so I hope that clarifies that all the issues on, on the land in terms of being accounted for correctly in the financial statements have been addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Adela. That was very helpful. Honorable members and the team, uh, Elia, so that uh, Deputy Minister Kappa was with us. I don't see her on the platform. It has been a long day. Dr. Ramasud, your last word before we adjourn the meeting. I see there are no principals here. You are the one. Did you? The engagements. I have noted the request that uh, in engagements, the chair would like uh, Minister Didiza to appear together with the ITB on a lot of issues um, that were raised. I've also noted the, um, the request that came from the portfolio committee on some work that the department has got to do with the ARC, the NMC, and also with the OBP. And um, we will also uh, get closer to the processes as aligned we thank you very much, Chair, and the honorable members of this uh, Portfolio Committee on Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development uh, for the time taken and the guidance given over the last two days. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, DG. Thanks, honorable members. Thanks, the leadership of our entities that participated today. This meeting stands adjourned. Bye bye, colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to all who shared. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tatu Kappa and uh, Metlape. Thanks, colleagues. Thanks, Mamba Mama. Bye. 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 Bye, -bye Chair. Thank you.
zero, five, nine, fifty, and the seven. This water will be going on a monthly basis. Hello, Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for staying with the nine name. Okay. Okay. Um, since you are on TSCBA, is the view for city rain? Mm -hmm. Also, on TSCB access 420, mm -hmm. you're supposed to pay 150. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, uh, but your decoders have, have insurance with them. My decoders don't have? Let me see. Okay, the one that is on access. It has it has insurance mm -hmm. also it is R function. Mm -hmm. Meaning the one that is on the one that is on access is hundred and twenty mm -hmm. plus hundred and twenty of the access plus the insurance. Okay, which means it's uh, two hundred and forty. Okay. And then the insurance is how much? Sorry, is insurance is how much? Check it out for you. Okay. It's thirty five friends, ma'am. Thirty five friends. Yes. Okay. No, I and think. Then, hey. And then, and then, the interview for thirty friends. 